Hello, hello, hello. You are very welcome to the Overlap Rugby Podcast. I am Dara. This here is Shane. Hello. Two brothers talking all things rugby from the point of view of Leinster and Ireland. We have a big show this week. That's 113. Right. We've got the last sort of weekend of the uh, of, of the pulsating November series that has been. Um, and yeah, we're going to have a, a, a packed show running through last week's and this week's great tests. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, we're going to start by looking back on last weekend as well, briefly briefly reviewing uh, those games, including Ireland's superb victory over uh, the All Blacks. Um, also the box running rampant in Murrayfield and rumbling on. Um, Fiji nearly getting the dub in Cardiff despite being down to 13 and 14 men. Um, as well as Spain reigniting their World Cup campaign. We had great test over in Portugal. There was a lot of really good stuff, stunning yeah. rugby this weekend that we're yeah. going to look back on. Yeah, we're going to dig into all that and then we're going to go in-depth looking at all the upcoming games this weekend, which will include the World Cup final replay. That's your headline grabber between England and the Springboks um, in Twickenham, which obviously takes on a whole new significance in South Africa in light of all this Razzie business that's yeah. been going on. I think there'll be well geared up for that one so that'll definitely be a fun game we're also going to talk France All Blacks um, huge game feels yep. like for the for the men in black and also a great opportunity for the French yep. um, Wales taking on Australia in a battle of the uh, of the <laughs> the, 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 the ones the, who have had a slightly disappointing the struggle campaign. bus um, uh, <laughs> yes, riders um, indeed and then Georgia Fiji in a clash of the tier two titans as well. So we're going to look ahead to all of those games and everything that's going on in in, in rugby this weekend. Absolutely, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, as well as that, we're going to touch on the Stellenbosch series, which we were mentioning last week. That's going to wrap up this weekend. We're also going to mention the women's internationals, which are ongoing. There've been some good ones last weekend. There are some other good games coming up this weekend. And then we will we'll wrap up the show with the rugby news of the week. There's no club rugby at all this week, so we'll just go straight to the news of the week. Yeah, that's right, and that's some big news. Obviously, this week we're going to touch on obviously that whole um, uh, situation with about Razi Erasmus. We're going to discuss that at, at length there at the end of the show, and we're also going to talk about um, the World Rugby Awards. Yes, um, there were lots sure of nominees can. announced for that as well. Um, so you can catch that at the end of the show um, if you do enjoy the show if you if you are keen to listen to what we're saying please be sure to like the video um, uh, share it with your, your rugby loving friends mm -hmm. um, and do leave comments down below as well um, we definitely do appreciate them and if you haven't already uh, subscribe to the channel absolutely absolutely that's it uh, yeah but without any more ado I suppose we're going to get right into it and we're going to start with our review segment where we look back on all the action from the Autumn Nation series this weekend just gone and uh yeah, it was it was an awesome weekend of footy. We're gonna just work through in chronological order, but uh, some great games. I suppose we'll start in Italy, which I think technically was was the first game. But we're gonna start with it. But uh, Italy sixteen, uh, Argentina thirty seven. Um, yeah, it was it was an interesting game in that like it, it was billed as kind of the battle of the wooden spooners, and you could see the golf in class between Argentina. Well, for the rugby championship and Italy of the Six Nations yeah. for me it was actually it was quite reminiscent of England's game against Italy in the Autumn Nations Cup last year in that uh, Argentina just kicked the leather off the ball and got just rewards but yeah. it felt like there was probably more out there for them than 37 points uh, if they were able to string a few things together they did leave some chances out there still uh, they did show some good hands actually Pablo Matera um, starting at 6 slotting into 8 lovely try assist off the left hand but the, the guy does have skills all of them do have great footballing skills and their yeah. instincts are great in, in broken field and um, some of the tries were, were really well taken in the open space and um, the issue is still just the kind of the systems for the for the Argentinians they're, they're, they're kicking the ball and they're defending very well and they were way too much for the Italians both just with physicality and, and just that kind of pressure yeah I mean they, they were definitely better this week um, they moved they, they did struggle at times in the passing game but then they got a couple of good tries in the passing game as well towards the tail end of the game Cordero had a nice score that's right um, there was there was nuggets of positivity. Their kicking was more proactive. It was. Um, Buffelli, I thought, was excellent. He was. He really good in the air. They linked up off it um, and took took some nice tries. They were winning some massive contacts as well. And, and the, the real story from their point of view was just how much they destroyed the Italian ball. There was just no Italian yeah. offense in this game. Yeah. Julian Montoja, I think, three or four turnovers. Yeah. Um, and even when they didn't turn it over. Poor Varney. I was feeling for Varney on that scrum yeah. half all day because like, he's, he's a wee lad. He's a young lad. But he was dealing with like abysmal service because their rooks were all so scrappy and there was there was Argentinian hands making a mess of all of them and he was like wrestling it out of there. 
both both himself and Garbisi got kind of smashed in the tackle and had the ball stripped on them both separately on different occasions. They were just getting swallowed up. But then to grab that try, that one try that Italy did get, Varney did well to squeeze in there and snipe through. And his just reward for that was getting a big Kramer and Gomez Cadea to just crush him. And he was get, getting back up looking all ginger. And that was kind of an image of what the game was to me. Like good heart from the Italians to find that try. But immediately after, he's there bracing yeah. his shoulder and he still has to patch himself up and do another 20 minutes because they don't trust the other guy. Um, yeah, yeah, they were outmatched. Yeah, and uh, the Pumas, to their credit, I thought played a little better, but they were predominantly leaning on the physicality and the defence, which ate Italy alive it for the most part it in did. the kicking game too. Um, from an Italian point of view, it was a bit disappointing for me. It's just the Pumas are the worst tier one nation, apart from maybe Japan um, this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Pumas, they're they're a good way below, I would say the 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 Six Nations, or the five at the top of the Six Nations, yeah, and obviously the three in the Rugby Championship, yeah. So on paper, this is Italy's best opportunity to get and a on win. paper. It's resulted in their best result against any of those teams because in, yeah. in the Six Nations it was fifty something to yeah. ten, but was they were the so score. outmatched, and it was yeah. evident from the opening whistle they were just so outmatched, and it's hard to know where that upset win even comes from because yeah. they had their home crowd in Benetton, which was great, real True. and like begging to begging for an opportunity to get it into True. the game was that and crowd the odd, the odd um, Negri break that was rewarded with a big, a big yeah, reward, yeah, yeah. but then ultimately um, amounted to nothing and yeah, yeah they just they, they, they couldn't put it together the Pumas are a tough team to play they physically when you, they physically outmatch you and they're so stingy and, on defence and when they're better at um, kicking than you yeah they, exactly they, they tried to engage in the kick tennis and they lost that too yeah well um, and kind of of course and yeah. it was just everybody, everybody on the pitch seemed to struggle they weren't able to, to get the inroads they needed and then even when they did it didn't matter because the tackling was ferocious um, I like you talk about Varney's hustle and they did show some good hustle but it just kind of demonstrated the gulf in class between the two teams I think but uh, credit to the Pumas I thought they were they were yeah, solid good, good and it was one of their better win. performances of the year certainly two of their nicest tries Moroni's yes. and, and Cordero's tries were two of their nicest That's tries of the year definitely true um, definitely true and they were yeah they were just deserving winners in that one it, it is a tough spot for Italy and Italy now face a different team this, this week who, who they outrank so last time we saw that happen in the World Cup Italy ended up putting on a massive score on them so they are just kind of in that limbo zone where when they meet a tier two side they tend to put them to the sword but when they meet a tier one side mm-hmm. they tend to be put to the sword well themselves. we'll see you so know they haven't know. put the tier two side no, to the haven't. sword yet so um, um, they'll have to they'll have to do that but yeah disappointing obviously <laughs> fronting up against the all blacks probably a lesson for ireland in that fronting up against the all blacks is is perhaps easier at times than fronting up against the pumas they yeah. are very physical true um but yes, then the only other note, the sad note that, that we have on this game is that Riccioni, the, the Sarri's tight head, won a scrum penalty in, in one of the few scrums that happened in that first half, owned it against yeah. this very tough Puma scrum, and then unfortunately did his ACL in yeah, the second half. blew it out, and it was it was um, tough. It looked initially, I think the commentator had called that, it, that he'd got a shot, but he didn't at all. It was actually, no. planted, it was a standing leg, he planted and changed direction, and he just, it blew out under him. And that's sick, yeah. yeah. Those are those are always nasty injuries, so oh, we kind of yeah, hope, hope he's, you know, 10, hoping. 11 months maybe even out of the yeah, game. No, it's, um, it's very tough for, for that guy, because he's, he's been a great, a great hope for them, a great asset for Saris, and it, like, one that we were billing as like, this could sort out some and, problems for and Italy you could and, see it yeah. kind of working in that yeah. first half but yeah just a just terrible look for him and for Italy um, but we're going to move on to the next game yeah. um, the next one was one of the one of the juicier ones and honestly one of the funnest ones of the weekend yeah I enjoyed this one S- Scotland 15 Springboks 30 um, this was a really good game I just enjoyed it because it lived up to its billing in that you did get to see Finn Russell Take up against this Springbok defense, uh, defense. Yeah. and it was a good ding dong battle you was. know there was pressure coming in from the box and Russell was under pressure and they he turned over a lot of ball by Etzebeth at got, one point he did and um, but they managed to get some stuff off in spite of that like the opening 10 minutes was kind of bizarre that um, the Springboks o- o- owned all the ball but Scotland's defensive uh, hustle on the goal line was excellent yeah. they didn't give anything easy and they, they turn over the ball the ball goes back to Finn and he dummies the kick whips it out to Duhan who makes a 50 metre break and all yeah. of a sudden Scotland take the lead he found the edge with a couple of like, cross lateral kicks. cross yeah, kicks yeah. The and then pass. Duhan yeah. who was excellent all day managed to make magic happen and, and Hoggett ultimately goes into the in on the corner and then in the second half you had that um, that other Scottish try um, which was another beautiful set piece move Maul crabbing right to the touchline Ali Price manages to throw near enough a like 25 meter pass off the left hand a fizzer straight to Matt Scott back in behind to Russell back in behind to Doohan flicks it over Am and away they go Hogg is in 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 the corner and so their set piece strike plays are great yeah and they they, they got some stuff off you got got to see Finn Russell go to work against this Bok defence 
But on the other side of the coin, for large parts of the game, the the Bok defence responded and yeah. you saw Am um, swallow up, swallow them up on yeah. the outside and on you, numerous you also occasions just saw the um, attritional nature of that defense like yeah. like for any other team to defend that way it's them who's wearing who's wearing down over the course of the 80 but you saw in the last in the last set when Scotland were chasing the game or the last few sets that like having with all the hustle that they had in the first half and some of the really good accuracy and techers you could see some of those key men being a little loose and being a little tired and just all of them rocked and beat up by, by physical hits all day and yeah. then that sequence where they had to chase the game and they started on their own in their own half just near near the halfway line and a couple of couple of phases one loose pass behind them regathered more frantic play firing it back and they end up knocking it on in, in the panic <laughs> under their own sticks yeah. and like 40 minutes back the, from where they started this, this synchronised um, face palm in the coaching yeah. box from four yeah, of them going exactly. like this just once. watching that um, mad <laughs> sequence of I mean it was pressure. all born of pressure again yeah. it started with Am on the outside but yeah. that was there all day long and while Russell did get outside them a few times like the very first thing that happened was he was forced to knock it on mm-hmm. I don't know how many turnovers in the game it's sometimes the stats are a bit misleading it felt like there was more because there was knock-ons as well yeah. but the defense forced so many turnovers yeah um they called they said it was 11 on the stat book but i don't think that takes into account some of the knock-ons yeah, they forced forced like, fumble they, guy they idea. Was, like just the pressure that stymies yeah, those attacks it, even if it isn't turned over yeah they, it, they force a kick as well every now and then in, yeah including the two tries which were very well taken off turnover ball you got to see some development of the Bok offense in True. that sense that they didn't actually get in on them all. The Scots managed to repel them all pretty well, True. but they managed to find the edge really well off turnover ball. Um, the, the Elton Yankees flat pass was pretty good. He found himself a second distributor, and they managed to get managed to get first of all Khaleesi onto the ball to put Mapimpi away, yeah. and then second of all Mapimpi in again. I'm not sure who was who, who was it to put him in in I'm that sure uh, in that second one. But now Mapimpi um, is is lightning and doing yeah, his but, credentials uh, the, all the world are good. Larue and, and Elton showed some good passing to find to find the outside, yeah. and it was a good adjustment to how Scotland defend as well because what they sat really deep and and moved it to the edge which against a team like the All Blacks, not necessarily the best thing to do because they'll fly up and use their speed advantage and catch you behind the gain line. Yeah. But against the Scots, who are a very good defensive team but actually don't push up as much, they kind of soak and drift and, and make sure you don't breach the line. Overloading the edge was actually a way to get around them and it was it was a good adjustment by a Springbok offense, which yes. was definitely a positive yeah, definitely. for them. Um, I definitely thought as well as we were musing, uh, Reinach coming off the bench changed things for them in that second Herschel half. Was, did have Herschel game, was a yeah. little bit off in yeah. terms of just the accuracy of the passing and the speed of the passing and then when Reinach came in, it was also just as those Scots were starting to tire and all those yeah. Etzebet collisions were starting to weigh on them and uh, yeah, the, like uh, he was really expert at, at dictating that final quarter and just kind of mm-hmm easing themselves comfortably away from what was a very good Scottish performance and by the way just we were mentioning Etzebeth a few times but what a performance man yeah. match he's gone to another another extra level that we know he has where it's yeah. just his hustle they, they were using him so, they were using they were, so much in the yeah. carry game as well they were also um, using him as Peter Steff was like he was yeah. flying out of the line to pressure uh, pr- pressure Russell and he was showing good turn of heel I'd say he just like, fancied it yeah, he, he did, yeah. Russell, Russell's the kind of guy he'd like to hit yeah I exactly think. it's um, like I'll, I'll just do this one this time <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll take this I have him he's mine yeah exactly um, um, but I mean, it, like as good as Reinach was, it was one they they took the set piece away from Scotland, yeah. which yeah. was really rough. Xander Fagers and geez, yeah, very, a very a competent Scottish scrum um, was made look very very dodge yeah. uh, by a very very monstrous yeah. Springbok scrum. Poor, and poor old Xander had such a tough outing against Ox and Che, and he really that really needed not to happen. Yeah. Like it, when it, you know it, that the other guy, those yeah, guys yeah. are coming off the bench at. at 40 odd minutes yeah. of these days so you've got to be able to lock it down when in Che yeah. and, and in Yukanye are when you're, in there when you're fit and strong and raring yeah. to go at the start of the game um, but yeah unfortunately he couldn't and that ended up telling so and the second half was a tale of just set piece uh, penalties defensive penalties and constantly slow consti- fatigue, yeah constantly chipped down. over by the box they 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 um, got raced to 15 points the spring box and then from there with two tries and then from there it was another they added on another 15 of all three pointers earned by their defence and their penalties Yeah, and it was very impressive I thought Khaleesi was excellent as well just everywhere as, as he always has yes, been yeah, no, very, um, very much he's, so. had a, he's had a really good season um, and another um, note of interest is that Franz Stein came on and passed Victor Matfield as the longest serving Springbok there over you go. a length of time congrats to Franz Stein Matfield kept coming back he did when he, he was also towards the tail end of back. his career he got the band um, back together for that World Cup <laughs> yeah, at one yeah. point yeah yeah um, um, oh, two, two legends of South African rugby and yeah credit to Franz Stein he's had an awesome season as well as just an awesome career um, yeah 
sure kicking those winning goals like he'll still do that you know yeah. <laughs> he'll still slot kicks for for ages um, um, but yeah no really yeah, good game it was, it, was, it was an excellent game and the, the main narrative of it was that uh, like the, the Scottish offence took on that Springbok defence and just couldn't get it done yeah. like it was two tries each on when Scotland had the ball but the turnovers yielded more points to the Springboks that's it but you know yeah. maybe you get a set piece that, that that evens up a little bit but at the moment the Bok defence imperious very much so to the end of the season so. um, but we will move on for there was another game this weekend that uh, oh, all the games that uh, <laughs> kind of dragged all of our attention away from all the other games for the most part but uh, yes it was Ireland v the All Blacks in the Viva Stadium Ireland 29 All Blacks 20 um, and not just that but what an awesome test match it was from, from minute one just the intensity levels that Ireland mainly brought to it uh, initially and then the All Blacks forced to respond throughout and did show their quality in terms of grabbing tries out of nothing but yeah. were overmatched in terms of just the uh, the energy levels and the accuracy of the Irish which was fantastic to watch from, from our perspective as Irish fans it was a joy to watch yeah, um, I'll be able to say forever that I was at it I was yeah. I'm delighted Book Six, 68 minutes there once once the try doesn't go on you can see him on the box that's right yeah, <laughs> yeah. looking very very worried at that point but um, I mean yeah it was a bucket list uh, item chucked off uh, to see Ireland beat the All Blacks yeah. what an effort what an effort from, from, from the guys it was it was, a spe- it was a special performance definitely so um, we got to see sort of the full potential of the dynamic forward pack in, in motion this is it um, guided very well by two lovely halfbacks but it was like the, just the, the, the winning of the contact and those matchups was, yeah. was special to see they were picking lovely lines off one another and uh, just owning the, the offence just owning the All Blacks I loved the um the obviously the first half was a huff and puff they couldn't get it done in the end um, yeah. for, in one, large one parts low try um, five points for all the huff and puff yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but despite that they did so well to, to, to work their way deep into the 22 on, on numerous occasions and it was just the difference in, in two things really from what we were looking at you know even six months ago mm-hmm. but the dynamism of, of the team in terms of the speed that everything is being done with from folding around the corner to passing off yeah, the base the to nine. carrying yeah. um, and then also the quality of pass and we saw the quality of pass um come to fruition I think in that James Lowe try yeah. just a, a year ago I wouldn't have trusted Bundyaki to make that pass as on the money as it was right in stride to Hugo Keenan on the edge yeah, who also Beautiful. put in a dime a peach yeah, pass exactly. to, Time, to Lowe, yeah, timed yeah. it perfectly and, and that just wasn't being done a year ago here it is coming uh, uh, to full fruition and then the other one which was gas to watch was the Kalen Darris try yeah. which was a set piece move off a line out and um, they just go hit up from 12 around the corner with a with a one out from nine and around the corner again with a one out from nine which is kind of exactly what we saw them doing in that Automations Cup last year where they were so terrible yeah. except in that stage it was win the line out pass out hit up from 12 get into the rook everybody set yeah. to, uh, offense a little slow to fold around the corner sets up a pot of three pick and go uh, or, or run off nine go around the corner again everybody stop yeah. set, stand to attention yeah. go again yeah. Um, tackled and then well, I guess we'll kick it we yeah. don't really have any other ideas whereas this was just night and day different it yeah. was it was done with speed the, the the speed at which the offense just folded around the corner yeah. the different options they had available to them the fact that Sexton in behind was always calling something always had to had to have the attention of sure. the All Blacks yeah. um, opened up the space for Darris who just does uh, Cody Taylor with a bit of footwork but yeah. the, the All Blacks are only just folding around the corner as Darris gets the ball yeah. and, and so it- Taylor's flat footed Darris opens him up it was it was a it was a much much better offense, and you can see just how good this back row and this whole pack can be when things are done at speed and they're providing exactly. good service. Yeah, they're yeah. all really good footballers. And it's kind of retired the talk that we were having of like who's going to be the second playmaker or whatnot, because like the answer for the Irish is the forwards are the playmakers. Mm. Like so, it doesn't doesn't really matter. Leave the leave the backs free to to be hard runners to be options out the wide. But like the the great protection they offered Sexton all day of having. Either like what Furlong was doing it very often, but Furlong or Porter or someone as first receiver, and it just means that those guys who are shooting up, although you know the pullback might be onto Sexton, you can't just ignore the fact that Furlong has the ball right now because yeah. if you do, he will go through, um, yeah. and it just offers you that little bit of protection that allows Sexton to dictate things out wider, which was lovely to see. Um, also on that Doris try, I really enjoyed t- uh, James Ryan's clean out on the rook pr- immediately prior to Doris's one because he absolutely blasts the man through perfectly legally he doesn't bind him he just hits him so hard that I think it's Ethan Blackadder ends up 
getting sprayed out into the background and kind of interrupts the guys as they're trying to fold and Cody Taylor gets out of position with it. Yeah. And it's through that little gap there that Dyers finds that's like perfectly set up and it's just little detailed work from the forwards. Like James Ryan was obliterating rooks all yeah. day long. And, and it was um, spe- it was special to watch the, 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 the forward pack in that offense groove so well. Yeah. Um, James Lowe was also awesome you talk about slotting into first receiver did yeah. that on numerous occasions yeah. grabbed a try very special performance against his native country absolutely um, so was Whiskey actually against his like Whiskey's service was flawless and then capped it off with that 50-22 off, off yeah. turnover from Gary but like for oh, me to be the, the ceiling rooks, came week. off the stadium when oh, we kicked yeah. that kick yeah, um, it, was, it was an absolute peach but uh, yeah no they, they all played well to be fair and Joey Carberry off the bench kicking uh, kicking three clutch clutch goals including one from the halfway line which was a brilliant play from both Lowe and and Peter O'Mahony and a slightly bad play from the two uh, all black locks in, in that they were the first on the scene and white lock completely fails to, to move Peter O'Mahony and Ritalik actually smashes Lowe who's on the <laughs> ground having completed the tackle and he just takes Lowe completely out of it instead of committing to O'Mahony, hitting O'Mahony yeah. the danger which might have changed things but uh, yeah it was just kind of reflective of the difference in accuracy I suppose of both forward packs they, the yeah. all blacks were a little off the pace in terms of the, the contact area they were, they were a lot um, off the pace were, in a lot yeah. of ways it was definitely not a, 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 a top level all black uh, performance they they played a very poor game they did well um, Marshall on the comms he's, he's a very good pro and he stays he stays pretty unbiased which is more than I can say for our own RTE char- yeah. charges a lot of the time but you could hear in his voice that he was pleading with them to stop kicking the ball at yeah, yeah. half time and then when that one went up that Hugo Keenan ended up picking he was just a big ball of nerves and it was actually Rico managed to stuff that one yeah. in that instance but he's just like stop kicking why are we kicking uh, yeah, yeah they, they, like, they went to the game to kick they looked yeah. to find the edge with the boot it was a definite mm-hmm. tactic of theirs but it was it was a dubious one let's be real yeah. and, and Hugo Keane and Ireland have a very competent minder of the backfield and he did it he did it time did, and time they again they didn't know him um, but they knew now they yeah, were very they were, impressed a, with him a lot yeah. of guys who they didn't have much tape on yeah. really showed up look yeah, at Ronan Kelleher um, Doris, Doris was another I think course, I'm sure yeah. they did have tape on Conan and on Van der Fleer and then sure, that's why yeah. Doris was everywhere yeah, then, all of a sudden exactly um, um, it's, a, it's a funny one but they, they didn't really know what to expect we didn't know what to expect it's such a it's it's only clicking now for Ireland yeah. and that definitely caught the All Blacks but no I was disappointed with them they're, they're their phase play at the moment is, is poor and they've perhaps suffered a little from all of those mismatches they've played this year That's where you can just find true. the edge instantly and then work a try yeah. with their skill set and it just against a good defence it wasn't happening and they were a little sluggish and um they like they were, uh, like you look at the, the two passes into touch, you look at the little pick to Gary Ringrose. Yeah. Um just inaccurate Jeez, ALB's pick on the on the on the line. line that could have uh, could have been to, a different to, moment to, to Ronan right. Kelleher at the yeah. very beginning of the game. That yeah. was a poor one. Um and uh they like a lot of a lot of players really didn't show up either. they they have their issues on multi phase, but I thought White Whitelock had a really rough day at the he office. Did. He was lost at the line out of there. Um just didn't play with much composure. Terrible decision with ten minutes to go as to the captain the to kick a three pointer to yeah. make it a three point game when they just crossed the line and yeah. silenced the crowd. I mean, it's hard to overstate the lift that that decision gave the whole crowd. Yeah, sure, and that team. was like there was um, respectful silence for all of the kicks, apart from that one, because by the t- like there was a yeah. ball of nerves, and then they decided to kick three, and then the fields of Athen Rice yeah, starts but, ripping but, up because everyone's t- like, "Oh, there's a white flag from the yeah, All Blacks. That's by, great." By the time um, he kicked it, uh, yeah, we were full yeah. of the fields of Athen Rice because it was such a shock. This was after Rico's little forward pass to Akiri um, which, which I thought was a forward pass in the oh, same yeah. way that I thought Kelleher's was, one was a double move. It was, technically, once you look yeah. at it, it, that's what it yeah, is. But it's um, a, yeah, you've seen them. You've seen, seen them, them given. If given, maybe in a Bledisloe yeah. test, they just don't look at it, and then yeah, they say play you've, on. You've seen, but, you've seen them given, but once you once you look at it, yeah, it's hard to argue. Yeah. But at the same time, um, I thought um, I, I I I thought the All Blacks did show some of their quality. Like it was a bit like that first Springbok test. Yeah. It kind of reminded me of that, down to the fact that once Ireland got that disallowed try in the first hand. Um, Ireland were still or, or the first half I should say Ireland were still kind of reeling from that yeah, particularly to like Furlong yeah. he's caught flat footed yeah. when he thought he just scored yeah, a try exactly. <laughs> and then all of a sudden from a midfield line out they yeah. break through and score a cheap one which yeah. is exactly what they did to the Springboks in that game yeah. which of course they ended up sneaking um, so that was definitely a concern of mine right the way through and from an Irish point of view it's still a little bit concerning just how 
they can be caught for speed on the edge. They can. And you can see that. And the All Blacks are, are as good at exploding and, and it as we anyone. Were struggling. We were um, finding the edge, but their yeah. speed advantage was allowing them to shut shut it down with the scramble. Like We had many yeah. good moves that found the edge, and then we had to cut back inside, because speed-wise, we yeah. were still and, at a disadvantage. And Ireland's scramble defence in general is, is not great. Like yeah. The line breaks turn into tries against us in the evidence of this year a bit, bit too frequently. Bit too but that said, it's the All Blacks. Like it it, It's hard to know what could have ha- what could have been done different once Papali'i breaks that line and feeds uh, Cody Taylor or once of course you get Jordan in space Yeah, that's, that's all she wrote normally all she and wrote against top level teams yeah, as well and it's, a, it's definitely a positive for the All Blacks that they're still yeah. like one when, positive when, was, was Pop Papaliti as well not just yeah. that break but he made I think 28 of 29 tackles he attempted as well and he was yeah and then their mall defence was excellent their goal line D hustle was outstanding um, but they couldn't they couldn't lay a glove on us in the breakdown and they were given just no yeah, opportunities for, for, off they, turnover they completed like 238 um, tackles but they only managed two turnovers I think was the stuff yeah. that I was reading and one of them was TJ in the first half TJ Perinara who is great at that skill mm. but they are missing a kind of well when you look back at that 2015 team when you had uh, you had obviously McCaw but also Kino and just these kind of workhorses yeah. who will go uh, into the into the fire and get the ball for you like already has that skill set in him but obviously we'd done some tape on him he was kind of going on his own look, kind of speculating for one but the Irish and generally the Europeans are, tend to resource their rooks very very tightly like the latchers are already there mm. so if you're just going to go in on your own you're not really going to find an isolated pod or anything you're going to have to scrap more for it and I just I think they're kind of missing that balance in their back row their back row are all singing all dancing but in terms of generating turnover ball yeah. like considering how lethal they are with it they probably need to focus a bit more on just getting some yeah um, they, exactly right they, they weren't able to affect turnovers partly to do with how well Ireland played I mean yeah. they did blast out the yeah, offensive when you win the contact day. and, and yeah. have latchers there it's very very tough yeah. for any latchers right. and that um, uh, third quarter 15 point blitz that Ireland put on was ultimately the winning of the game yeah. and uh, very very effective and yeah credit to them for just the, the showing their potential as a forward pack this is it um, but granted it was um, we're not going overboard it was a game in Dublin with a packed house at the end, end, house, house, at the end, the the end of their season. season the beginning of ours yeah, it's uh, all of those all of those changes we know that we stick. have three tests in New Zealand coming and yeah. like once once New Zealand get past France this weekend that is their next focus yeah. is us in, in summertime so yeah the, the narrative will change once that happens but it's still a fantastic result and yeah. it is and we are I a very think, tough team to beat in yeah. Dublin nobody wants to come to Dublin and play us we're just extremely good yeah. there yeah. it's true and like just, just the style I think it was actually Andy Dunn citing it as well which goes to his, his prolonged point about just the attrition rate and the economy of effort is that like as, as well as they played and as heartily as they played it was a skills based game and it wasn't as attritional as even the 2018 mm. win over them in, in Dublin when we absolutely defended like monsters and carried like monsters yeah. and but it wasn't quite as speedy or as deceptive as that it was more just brute force and it's very tough to sustain brute force as he's saying you ask some ask a workhorse to run into a brick wall 10 times he'll do it but he'll be a bit ginger yeah, afterwards yeah. whereas if you ask him to run into it three times and then the other seven kind of go for gaps that's that's kind of what we're seeing here with this kind of young and rangy and pacey uh, pack that we have yeah. is that they are aiming for gaps and and creating problems because yeah. they're a tough hand like <laughs> Ronan Kelleher sitting down Bowden Barrett on the edge and then getting through you see yeah. a lot of that from all of the forwards just really good good yeah, hustle very good, very good ball carriers and footballers and yeah. Ireland actually um, used their bench um, which we were concerned we about were concerned, but better they, than the All Blacks to be fair the All Blacks comms were, were talking about that saying like when you can bring Conor Murray and Keith Earls and, and all these guys the amount yeah. of big match experience off the uh, off the bench which I was I was agreeing with in that we were six points or nine points up and it is a good yeah, state yeah. when you're closing out the game if we were chasing the game I maybe, maybe wouldn't have agreed but actually no it was the All Blacks who, who misused their resources because Finley Christie and, and Tupo Vai I think um, didn't feature didn't feature despite yeah. being on the bench and you'd think I was thinking like one one change you could make is Whitelock instead of going for the posts goes for the scrum and you bring on Finley Christie and Vai at that instance for that scrum yeah maybe yeah. it's a different game no but, I agree um, yeah, you've you got to use your resources and it's the second time in a row they've done that they've been yeah. beaten up in Dublin and um, then they've had a chance to dig themselves out and take in a tame three instead of going for broke and then not getting back up the other end and scoring again yeah. like they did that in 2018 as well it was weird to see them not learn that lesson yeah. but, but great but great from Ireland is, who, yeah. who have proven if nothing else that they have the talent to be one of the top sides they in the do. world and that's a benchmark performance for them and I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged to see okay. what they do it's, going it's forward it's encouraging stuff because I know um, Leinster have started with a with a plum in terms of ball in hand and now it's great to see Ireland putting 60 yeah. on Japan putting 29 on, on the All Blacks 
it's it's been a good start to the season for Ireland, but it no is question. it is only that, and it was good, encouraging to hear that it is only that. Like mm. we're building blocks. This isn't but the we, end. We goal. literally can't get carried away yeah. <coughs> because the last time we beat the All Blacks, we got carried away and didn't play a good game for two years. That's exactly um, right. So, so let's let's not have a repeat <laughs> of that. But uh, but credit to the boys in green. It was a joy a joy to watch. Yep. And uh, yeah, delighted. Um, speaking of joys to watch. Um, there was a game that wasn't that um, <laughs> between say, England thirty two, <laughs> Wallabies fifty. Yeah, yeah, that um, wasn't a joy to watch. I, I watched, I watched the first twenty minutes live, but then I had to head off because I had a, a gig later that night. So I, I watched it back, and yeah, well, they, they, there was no even drama or suspense in it. Like England were superior, but. England were chopping and changing as well, and they weren't quite as accurate. They scored one. The, the lovely try that they did score was the one where where Marty Stewart Smith put in. Stewart in, yeah. and Stewart took it very nicely. Did. And that was a good sequence of attacking play from England, and that was the difference. In that you didn't see any re- any of that in Australia, apart from Paisami had a nice break at one point. He did. Like, Paisami was probably their one positive. But yeah. the story of this game was a bamboozling array of Australian errors. Yeah. Um, and like it's hard to even draw a pattern to them, like the discipline. Oh, there's no pattern in their team, so it's, yeah, it's the, very, the discipline yeah. was awful. Yeah. Um. I mean, some of the penalties they were giving away, they were just so so cheap. None of it was under pressure. It was yeah. all just completely, for want of a better term, shit in the bed. Yeah. Um. As the as, like as they were trying to do anything, and they never got a chance to get into the game. And it wasn't that they were outmatched at scrum. They weren't particularly. They no, weren't Slipper, particularly actually, to his credit, yeah. Slipper, who I was worried about, managed yeah. to hold his yeah, own. They, he was they, outmatched they, for minute one, they, but he got a couple of penalties. They weren't um, particularly yeah. outmatched in the contact. Those very brief and rare opportunities they got to carry. You saw Valatini and Leoto winning Still contact and presenting the yeah. ball. Um, but there was just no pattern or rhythm to anything that they were doing. Some of the knock-ons they had in open field, some of the loose kicks, yeah. and they didn't know how to attack. Seemingly, I thought the halfbacks, White and um, O'Connor, okay. like Pretty try shocking. saving, try saving tackle on Jamie George. Notwithstanding, outside of that, they did nothing. Exercised no control over the game. Never tried to develop an offense. But then it was hard of them to do that because there was just so many individuals making so many bad errors and yeah. um, Fyang Ga got the line out yips again yes um, which is well never back. helpful um, never helpful yeah um, and it, it, so that it, it's it like was there one area of the game they were bad every area of the game they were bad it was knock ons it, it was a tough day as well passes. including yeah. throwing that pick at the very end to Sam Skinner yeah and he, he, he had one that really try. annoyed me where he, he gave up he gave up the ball and then Michael Hooper won it back off a of Toji with a great play and the ball flicked up to Icky Tao and he just kicked it instantly and it was a terrible floated yeah. kick that yeah. the English marked yeah. and it was like oh there's a, another rare opportunity gone yeah. and yet bamboozlingly they found themselves in this game yes. because, because England, England were, were rusty and, yeah, and yeah. gave up a lot of penalties they themselves did. bad yeah. ones cheap ones True. and their forward pack weren't weren't dialed into the task and we didn't get to see we got to see some decent rhythm from the offense and that, that culminated in that Freddie Stewart try where he picked yeah. a lovely and line and Freddie Stewart was um, a good find for this game yeah, very good in the air he's, he's probably going to be in that fullback jersey quite, quite a bit in the years to come he looks rock solid and yeah. physical and kind of in a good English yeah, role yeah exactly like, um, they, they've, and, Alex Mar- and Marcus Smith played a decent game uh, with limited as you were saying limited opportunity like the one the one bit of nice sequence ended in that try for yeah. Stewart but then there was so much chopping and changing so they, found so many in, they found it in in the kicking game this was it but there were so many scrums and then I was just thinking of it like oh, this would would be nice if I was looking at like Tupo versus Marler but I'm not I'm yeah. not because both of them are out so yeah, this is just a, a mad old game yeah both 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 sides missing their front two at the yeah. at the at the left and right hand side of the scrum yeah tight head for Oz and, and loose head for England so yeah that dynamic didn't get to play out as much as we love yeah um and it, it, for for England it was a case of job done they were they beat what they were presented with they weren't overly convincing in doing so um, and they have apart from lot. the fact that it was 32-15 more yeah, than but that, scores, was, but that was a, a pick, at the, end, a pick at the end of the game that, that padded the score although they do have form in that regard against Australia yeah. we often see them uh, pick off a late try against an impotent Oz it's not it's, it's not been an unfamiliar side no, in Twickenham it's not, it's um, not. And actually, they're so, certainly punishing them for that 2015 uh, World Cup humiliation because I don't know that they've even lost to them since then I don't think they have um, they've yeah. just completely uh, blown them away every time they've Aren't met you, since the, then the Oz can um, still take that one to the bank though that one was was perhaps Czech as fine as most. Yeah, it um, was, but I mean, England 
and they're on a, one hell of a run against the Wallabies. And the Wallabies are a sorry sight. They're yeah. not a reflection on what this team was at all. No, it's been um, a weird old year for them. And I, like, I suppose even if they lose this week, is it still a successful year with the French success well, and then with, with second in like, the thing they, and two wins just, over the world champs? They just and, have to chalk it off because yeah. everything that they built doesn't seem to be here at all. No, um, well, like, all the, like, it's a completely different team. Like Curtly Beale at fullback was an absolute mess. Yeah. Uh, like He just looked like he rocked up from the beach. Yeah, um, exactly. Rip, it, looked, rip. it looked like a team an Aussie team that might have taken the field before all of this Rennie Revolution stuff we've yeah. seen this year before all these young guys like Philip and Swain were just missing yeah. and we'll just have to accept that yeah. um, and then um, uh, without obviously uh, Karevi Korobedi the spine of the team um, poor Quaid. Ke- Kellaway was in but he was frozen out unfortunately mm. and actually had a rough day in the air but yeah. no Quaid and then Tate McDermott who was another bright spark this year being ignored for for, no, he... for a misfiring Nick White who gave up the game icing penalty before he was substituted off at 74 minutes yeah. ridiculous like yeah. I just I'm not enjoying even how Rennie is managing this tour but they've rocked up to Europe with no kind of form and no kind of shape and no kind of purpose and have been badly beaten now two weeks in a row, and they're looking to go three zero oh, and three, yeah. uh, and heading into the into the neck into the new season with a, an entirely different ebb than the winning streak they yeah, took they took up here. This is true. This is um, true. Uh, yeah, no, it's it's disappointing. They will have a chance to at redemption against an, another misfiring team in Wales this weekend. Mm-hmm. But uh, but yeah, no, that game in particular was uh, yeah just just a bit of a by the numbers kind of. There was no. There was no suspense in the result, and like thirty two fifteen could have been a great game if yeah. it played out, but it, it kind of wasn't, and I think both fans would probably agree with that assessment as well. Yeah. It kind of went went by the numbers, but neither side will be yeah. overly happy. And England um, with a bit to improve on uh, coming, coming coming into coming, next yeah, week. Well, England are eyeballing this week as as a big chance for redemption with the Springboks coming to town, but. But there was another game which was as advertised and was, apart from the fantastic Ireland defeat of the new, the All Blacks, which was, of course, my favourite fixture of the weekend and the year. Yes. But, uh, but there was a fantastic fixture, which was definitely my second favourite, which is just rugby was the winner. But Portugal 25, Japan 38 doesn't reflect quite how close it was because it was a pick in the very death from Portela that, that was just picked up. Yeah, and just he, he broke the line. He broke the line yeah. if he... If, like, Literally, he if he delayed, if he delayed, the, ball, delayed the ball and gave it, then that's the win for Portugal. But he didn't, and that's that's uh, in the end it was Japan. But that's what it came down to because Portugal, from minute one, in front of a great stadium, which I believe had fifteen thousand in it, which was a great crowd for Portugal too. Uh, they ran it. They ran it out like well, we've been watching them all year and been so impressed. We obviously it's always we don't know when tier two sides face tier one sides. Although only a recent tier one side in Japan, so probably a little bit more vulnerability there than than some of the others. But Portugal. Really Really took the game to them in front of their fans showed excellent skill set as they've shown all year they're passing sharp they're running lines yeah, are they're, very they're, sharp their whole Marquesh offense at nine yeah. so sharp they're, they're, um, their whole offense is 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 lovely and it's all dialed into finding space and attacking space yeah. and it is not one dimensional which is yeah. something you might have feared for them just because they've they've come on leaps and bounds in the back line but this wasn't you know overloading wingers no, on the inside they scored a mall um, try they scored a couple of mall <laughs> yeah. tries or a couple of tries in the tight yeah. um, um, I thought David Wallace, the the reincarnated David Wallace yes. at seven, yeah. um, had a had a big game for he them. Um, but they were just they were they were game for the physicality, game at the line out, and just trying to find space. And all of them had the skills um, to do so. They are a much better team when Marquesh is running the show. There's 100%. no doubt about that. Yeah, he well, guides them very that, well. That try was all him. Yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. And it wasn't just that. Like oh, he just he does guide the team around the pitch very well. Kicks um, great goals as well. Yeah, in, indeed. Yeah, yeah. And, and kept kept them in touch. Um, and uh, they they were they were always. In in touch for the whole game their crowd were into it yeah. and they're they're a team that's going places man they're they're like I, i'm not i'm not convinced they're going to fade away that nope. crowd is big their underage teams are performing well yeah um, they're passing their skill set really really sharp just their ethos um, in terms yeah. of how to play same as what we love about japan and uh, japan to their credit dug this one out because they were very close to having egg on their face a few positives uh, was it what's his name at 13 on debut grabbed a yes. lovely try just broke um, the line yeah and um, that was um and uh, nakano Nik- Cano, that's right. Yeah, yeah broke partner. the line very, very nicely on the inside. Nice delayed ball to him, and just took the inside like you'd see a great thirteen do. A little swivel of the hips, and then through he went. Lovely try from from him. But like they have struggled in general to just uh, to replicate that that terrifying tempo they had in the World Cup. Mm. And part of that is because with the likes of Fafita on the wing as opposed to Fukuoka, they are just a little slower. 
Um, Correct. They're, they're not as lethal. They're, they're not as lethal out wide. And but he used and, to be, you get Fukuoka one-on-one matchup and it's going to be seven It's going to be try, and then you have Matsushima um, on the other wing. And yeah. Matsushima has been coming off the bench in the in this thing. I yeah. think he should start this week. Although and at fullback, it was, it, was, it was a good pick from the fullback yeah. to, to ice the game. And he was very good too. But they do need to kind of rediscover some of that speed that they had out wide. And I think with this yeah. kind of new new personnel, they haven't quite discovered what their ideal tempo no, they, is off nine. They, and they looked a little more like twenty fifteen Japan, yeah. where they they moved, they hustled really hard, they stayed organized, they moved the ball really well. But they did move in three pointers a little more. Yeah. They kind of worked a penalty and kicked a three and stayed at it. Yeah. Um, but then defensively, you know, they were able to be caught as well. Mm-hmm. And both sides were were not particularly physical on the defensive no, end of the ball. No, they weren't um, as robust Which, as which facilitated see. the high the scoring shootout the that, 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 that did uh, come, at, come about. Um, but it was joyous. Uh, Japan have had a rough trip uh, up to up to Europe. Yeah. Um, Jamie Joseph has, has stuff to reflect on if he wants to sort of rebuild this yeah, side the to his best. Is that they managed um, with, with the, the dying embers of the game, they managed to dig it out and stretch it out and, well, managed to not have egg on their face because they were very close to it. Portugal were... were yeah, like if, if if he had like it was, it was to Portela who threw it and Portela had a lovely game and it's like it, it is literally those are the margins of it. If he probably yeah. if he dummies it, he's probably committed. If he dummies and then gives, that's probably yeah. a famous victory for Portugal. But as it is, it's a pick and it's a it's a yeah. good win for and, Japan. And, and I hope he um, doesn't get uh, discouraged, Portela, no. because um it, as much as as much as they they may have missed a chance to 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 record a famous victory if they stay on their current yeah. course. The famous victories aren't too far no, away. No, they aren't, and um, they, they still have a mission in terms of getting to the World Cup. And there are yeah, other I mean, other, prote- other scary, guys around. This, this guy, Spain, obviously are, are renewed, and we'll talk about that. But um, Romania look on fire. Like Russia it, it, still going nowhere. Well, Russia are probably going nowhere actually. But well, like, they're in the mix. I mean, they'll all be looking to take scouts yeah, off each other. It's going to be a it's, great, great Europe Europe tournament. Yes, dear, and looking forward to that. And definitely delighted to see Portugal in such fine fettle. Um, there were a few other fixtures on the Saturday just before we move on to the Sunday games um, the French Barbarians did predictably uh, see off Tonga tw- uh, 42-17 to 17, a tighter yeah. score for the Tongans but you know well beaten still yeah. um, Belgium nil Canada 24 in a bit silly mismatch of a game I yeah. think the, the Canadians actually had a red card yes they were 10-0 um, up and they got a red card for yeah, yeah. loose play and but, then, but then Ross Brody I think came off the bench and scored a nice try and they were they were comfortably superior than Belgium despite yeah. all that which yeah. was, they haven't you know, fallen that far just no, yet they're not down um, in tier 3 yeah, yeah um, indeed and Italy a uh, uh, beat a changed Uruguayan strip yes. thirty one to yeah, thirteen. Kind of Italy A versus Uruguay A sort yeah. of, um, but uh, didn't bode particularly well for next week for the no, Uruguayans. No, the Uruguayans struggling. Ab- abysmal European record continues despite yeah. their great hustle and, and yeah. ability. Well, I mean, they've already their mission accomplished for the year. They have qualified for the World Cup. They've booked yeah. their ticket to France, so that's all fine. They can afford to lose this one, but they will need to get over their European hoodoo because the World Cup is in France. So. Yeah, they'll need to start recording some performances to write home about. But uh, apart from that, then, yes, there were Sunday games. There was Tier 1, Tier 2 clashes on Sunday. It uh, started off with France, uh, Georgia. Uh, France recorded 41 points, Georgia 15, which I thought was a, a little harsh in terms of how it reflected yeah, the, I mean, the game. It, uh, it Georgia was, were more competitive than that. Georgia were firmly competitive for the most mm-hmm. part. They were defensively very sound in large parts. I mean, they were opened up once or twice, Um and they were offensively industrious they yeah. they edged they had moments in the kicking game they were physical they were certainly up for that challenge they weren't being opened up left right and centre no. it didn't look visually too much like a tier 1 v tier 2 game except in the penalty count uh, from the from the officials which was just blew, blew George away and then the sad thing was that the game was over in the first half it was over before it had begun Um, after 20 minutes the Georgians were down to uh, to um uh, 13 in fact and um, that was definitely a rough one for them yeah, and Tato, 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 Tato with the, 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 the knockdown the knock which is, is pre- there's precedent for there, that there's one. of course yeah. precedent for it and for, for many of the Georgian penalties you can see why it was just that they came firm and fast and constant uh, against one side yeah. and um, yeah like I thought they were all just like on the margins a little harsh like the, it started with Melakidza the tight head who had a tough day of it actually getting over the ball for what looked like a decent poach but I guess if you slow it down his hand might touch the turf before it gets the ball but he looks to be on the ball with the Aussie ref Damon Murphy penalty straight away to France didn't communicate well with the Georgians either just sort of whistled them yeah. and then you know the, the slap down penalty comes that's the yellow card the um the Georgians, the, 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 the Georgians the, suffer from the same thing that the Springboks suffer from and mm-hmm. we will talk obviously about Razi later on in that generally 
and it's 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 a macro thing that I don't agree with it, but like there are biases in refs and stuff and how they want to run the game, and particularly if you have an Aussie ref, yeah. yeah. If you're a team that wants to throw the ball around and wants to play a bit of footy, you'll get a bit of leeway. If you're a team that wants to slow the ball, get slow the game down, make it about scrums, make it about breakdown penalties, you won't get the sympathies. Um, and that's the Springboks suffer from it. Hence Razzie going on a big tirade about it. But the Georgians definitely suffer from it. every time I see them play a tier one side, yeah, the ref is out. And I remember Nigel Owens, who's a great ref just used to whistle them relentlessly yeah. off the park all every time he was reffing them because it was just they're like yeah people get frustrated with Georgia and we don't understand I, I like Georgia I like the way they try to play the game I think it's honest it's, it's how I they do it and I think, think they're they, built they're, they're, it's not fair yeah. to them because they're expanding guys like Nini Ashvili yeah. are expansive they're, players they were like, hustling their passing yeah. was much better they actually aren't that team anymore who's yeah. just like their physicality is still there but they're, they're not that team anymore that just tries to put it up the jumper and slow yeah. everything down they have evolved their game yeah Shara Kadza had an exchange with Damon Murphy where he was saying I think his quote was I understand we're a small team I understand they have an advantage but you aren't giving us any penalties <laughs> yeah. and then Damon Murphy was saying oh, abide by the laws and you get penalties um, yeah, there's just there's such there's, as there's, a, there's an, an really there is a nasty kind of thing that do, like, every time I watch Georgia face a tier one side it was the same in the Autumn Nations Cup the refs always seem yeah. to uh be overly punitive on they, them. They, they do again, have well, they, they do, do have issues with discipline. They, they do. need they need they that's, need that's to try and, and not allow refs to get into the game. Like that. Trust their multi phase yeah. defense. Tr- just stand stand a, take a little step back. Don't allow the offside penalties. Don't allow the hands in the rook penalties. Yeah. Because outside of that, it is like it is killing them in games yeah. against these top tier teams. And you could see this time there was a shift in attitude from the Georgians where I think Sharik Hadza reiterated his frustrations after the game and said he didn't feel they got a sh- fair shake. Yeah. And um, which I think was just reflected in how how differently the French were reft when they were doing questions. Well, that was that was that was the um, the, the difference there. Like I would yeah. I would say generally like mind your discipline, play the whistle, ref's yeah. word is final. All of that is fair. Yeah. But then when I like watching that uh, in the last quarter, the French try that they end up getting. Like I watched that whole sequence. It starts like they they win a penalty. That's yeah. I'll I'll give them that penalty. They go, win a penalty in the middle of the third. Go to the corner. Uh, set up a mall. Break from the mall. Truck and trailer not called yeah. like immediately truck and trailer instant penalty Georgia just ignored another phase goes on like another like six or seven or eight phases go on they drop the ball knock on ignored play on they get it back go again 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 then they drop the ball again but Georgia were offside so it's a penalty France and they yeah. go again and it's just like you gotta call France for some of this stuff like it was it was truck and trailer at the start of all of that yeah. why wasn't that called like yeah. that, when it's, it's when you're looking at things like that that you feel and it's you're feeling and you know Georgia need you need a, a rubber every, green you need to every make bit the game of those. competitive yeah exactly um, and that's what's I'll, unfortunate as a neutral watching yeah. it's like come on now yeah. France were not after also, like, there the, 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 the um, Molsack um, penalty try was a funny one because I watched it back and tried to isolate the George and he brought it down it definitely wasn't Saganadza yeah <laughs> like Saganadza went off for 10 minutes he was upright he was the last man standing yeah. the mall was down and Saganadza was up yeah. and the so, referee yeah. went and gave the penalty try and called him up and, and yellow carded him I thought it was just a, a, yeah. a weird call yeah um, I don't know it looked like the Georgians pulled it down but it was hard to see on the replay who who did it it is true um, but um, I thought much of what they much of what they did were impressive their two second tr- half tries were great you could see yeah. them winning the contact I love Lobson Dads's complete uh, fooling of Demba Bamba yeah. like because he was he was um, given the ball pretty consistently out mm-hmm. and then he kind of does a does a little um, frustrated kick at the brook and he's annoyed and he picks it up and takes like an exaggerated step to move it and throws it f- goes through the whole pump fake and Demba Bamba really poor from a pillar Buys just it, completely and gone and yeah. then uh, um, Loves and Dads is in yeah. and then their other try uh, Tabat Sadza's that was really an, an, an evidence of how, of how the Georgians have improved yeah. their capacity to get from one side of the pitch to the other with yeah, sharp yeah, passing really and finishing sharp really pass well. off the yeah. left yeah, yeah that was another one that the ref managed to find no try on the field for that has to be overruled <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's like what are you talking about no uh, try yeah. great try um, yeah no there, there, there was that there were a few like not to, not to kind of overstate things but uh, France were blessed but they they did have some qualities here Cyril Bai was very good in the scrum in the first yeah, half destroyed and actually it. Damien Pinot who grabbed two tries very very well it was encouraging to see him coming off his wing which we yeah. were accused like in the uh, France Australia tour it was a problem he was getting frozen out of games and he was just staying on his wing yeah. whereas now he was kind of roaming a bit more could have grabbed another try as well he looked very dangerous ball in hand so, I had yeah. bits of what they were doing on offence were functional DuPont was still very good yeah. when they were at their best they were driving a high tempo still for me like not not doing too much to control the game themselves they they were able to control this game because the whistle was so on yeah, their side um, but they were um, 
they 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 they, they were I mean, they get like a pass grade for me like they were yeah. they were up against a tough side and they saw it out and they would have won it I think regardless of what the ref had done yeah they were they were always going to beat the Georgians um but um I thought I, there was I, there were some pleasing aspects to the Georgian performance as well um I really have enjoyed Sharikadze's re- revival as a player the captain yeah. um I just think he's like he he used to be one dimensional and um a bit slow yeah and he's uh, he's now developed like back in the World Cup like you were thinking oh is he really able for this like he wasn't very great on defence he wasn't great on offence now he's great on both yeah. he comes out of the line he smashes Captain players fantastic and, his, and his footwork is fantastic at yeah. the line in the build up to that lobs and dads a try he absolutely did uh, one of the French lads on the inside um, he'd like very very unpleased with his yeah. with his development they were, they were generating um, good go for because of that, that one, axis one guy I, I have a, a bone to pick with is Mamukashvili who's been there forever yes, the 31 year old hooker and yeah. when you just look at some of the hookers that are out there in the world at the moment and then you look at this guy and you're like, really? Like, he's he's a problem in there. His line-out throws are dodgy at best. And then he just gives up penalties. He drops balls. He misses tackles. He's yeah. outmatched. He gave away the worst penalty of the game after the Lobs and Dads a try. Yeah. Um, offside, off the box kick. Oh, yeah. That's, that's a that's classic right. one. Um, All that's right. That's just 10. Then, of course, instantly chalked off. Um, yeah, I think they really do need to be looking at moving on from him and yeah, finding another hooker. Yeah, have such good front row stocks. Yeah, yeah, you can convert prop. one of your great props that can't get into the team into a hooker. Yeah, <laughs> and then you'll be a scrummaging and force c- as well. Conversely, the yeah. backup tight, tight head uh, Japarid's a very good game, and they, yeah. they turned over the scrum then in the second half. Yeah, oh, their scrum um, is still mighty. Their yeah. locks were very impressive, which is sometimes yeah. sometimes an accusation. But, but the mall defence again, yeah, that's always struggles always against away against tier two seats, sides, even when they have good offensive malls the defensive mall is one that very often struggles um, but yeah no credit to Georgia they made it made a good game of it despite all that all of that um, and they are a coming force the kind of as, as someone was uh, was kind of tongue in cheekily uh, regard or remarking the kind of six nations tryouts continue for them in yeah. terms of games like this and to be honest they're good value like I'm not sure what was the result that France had over Italy in the Six Nations um, yeah and probably not with as, as favourable a whistle on their side but um, I'll look it up now uh, yeah. 50 points to 10 50 points to 10 there you go as opposed to 41 that 15. was in Rome in Rome there you go so it's like you know who's yeah. who's going to argue that the Georgia aren't competitive and aren't a coming force they are definitely a coming force and yeah no, we, they have our support on this podcast I hope that they keep getting more games like this because yeah, and they, yeah. they keep developing their offence and their halfbacks keep getting better yeah um all of that very very pleasing but congrats to france it was a solid win and they have still some improving to do in the build-up to their big game against the all Blacks next enough. week true enough um but we're also going to talk about another tier one tier two clash and another game that is sorely not reflected in the scoreboard yeah, it's true 38 to 23 wales over fiji yes um geez has ever a side deserve to win less than Wales in this one <laughs> I know that like Wales Wales fans might give me sick but like they were awful yeah, like they were. they were I've never seen a side record 38 points by playing so badly but they yeah. played so badly like it wasn't like it wasn't anything even too specific it was just like all the decision making like when they were they, they played against 14 men and 13 men for the majority because there were two yellow cards as well as the red card Aroni Sow got himself red carded and it was a red card he like he made a great hit and it was great Aroni Sow absolutely rocked Johnny Williams and you could see in his face as he was going down like ooh yeah. and then for no good reason at all he gets back up and hits leathers him in the head when he could have just won the ball or something yeah, if you're playing yeah. so Kate. really poor um, play from yeah. him and he's, he's um, picked up a ban for it for five weeks which is right and proper and it killed them here ultimately but uh, but even with the 14 men and then 13 men because they had two other yellow cards they played all the rugby Vola Vola was beautiful uh, in terms of yeah. how he was dictating things where Bigger was all over the place you could see from early on they had a drop where Bigger kind of fired a pop pass that had this like groovy kind of spin on it. It kind of looked like a knuckleball in football, yeah. like it kind of dipped away from the man and he dropped it. And you're going like, that's a bit of a weird pass. And then he was trying to dial in, to kick into the corner with the kind of banana kick, but they were slicing every which way or going too far. And it was just like, yeah. is Bigger dialed? And it turned out, no, not really. He looked a little dialed out. The only the man who t- rocked him to the pitch was Liam Williams. That's and right. He, he earned a well earned man of the match because he was dragging Wales, he was kicking the and only, screaming. The only um, Welshman who was winning the contact yeah. area and he was like yeah. he's so tough he's yeah. so he's incredibly tough yeah. um, he has elite toughness he for does. a man of his and, stature and he's bony um, angular he's, he looks yeah. like one of those guys like, who's tough to tackle like Jordy actually good. Like Jordy Ring, Barrett, Ringrose yeah. gra- put a tackle on Jordy and got bloodied for yeah. it Liam Williams has the same kind of ed- edge to him he just wins yeah, contacts and, and like it, it was it, it, other, outside of that the Fijians were, were mighty in the contact but it was it, like a, a curious thing to see them yeah. 
not really handle Williams that well mm-hmm. um, but they were handling the Welsh pack extremely yeah. well they were running over them at yeah. times Nike Levu at 13 with two tries and all the defensive oh, reads he what was a, awesome what about that second try yeah. oh brilliant yeah. Tui Sui with the little yeah. uh, mark deceptive mark and then tap and yeah. then gone and yeah. it was just a classic Fijian try it was really a classic Fijian performance in many ways right up until the, the dam broke at the tail end the, it looked like it was break. it was going to be a Fiji win all the way yeah um, and then obviously the other um, scooby dubious one as well is that uh, that Louis Rissama try yeah I wasn't I, w- I wasn't awarding that now on first viewing because I, like, I, I was just looking back like what didn't Latanyo Am have, have won overruled in the rugby championship for pretty much exactly that like missing the ball not yeah. grounding well, it. It, it, they were talking about separation was, yeah, well, and there was separation between there, the hand and the ball but I think ball. there was because there was no grounding that's the thing. Like the, he only grounded it with his chest after, so there is separation because his hands are on the ground, the ball's on the ground, and then he grounds it. Did he not just catch the ball on his way so. down? Oh, get, it was a hell of an effort. It to was get a great there. run, um, and his speed yeah. is lightning. Like he is yeah. really lightning. I like the celebration too. I think that could stay as a viral yeah. little one, but uh, I thought it was Scooby Dubious to be honest. Yeah. And they were they were pretty he, blessed he, to get out of he jail. Himself for was, was desperate to score that try. Yeah. He had one chalked off, and he has been in grumpy humor in yeah, recent weeks. Not grumpy Louis. Yeah, as opposed to like smiling, playful Louis. Every yeah. every cut to him has been him scowling at the camera. Like he definitely he's a winger. He wants tries. Like a striker wants goals, and yeah. he, that'll that'll cheer him up that he got that one. And it was a huge one for. Well, for that Wales was it. Was what ended up winning um, the game ultimately. But yeah. yeah. Overall, from a Welsh point of view, I know they they had some chopping and changing, but even, like even so, they had an extra man for so long, and they, they had to and they had to lean on the mall to get it done. Yeah, exactly. They, like we were saying, the off the defensive mall sometimes a struggle for tier two sides. Even though the offensive mall pretty good from Fiji as well, yeah. but like that a lot. Elias had a good game uh, at two, yeah. and they and managed to dial that in. Even though they were f- facing thirteen, it felt like their best avenue to success was to keep it tight. But yeah, which was I, a, a just, damning enough reflection I, I on their offense. Don't know where that offense is. Yeah. Well, where is the Welsh offense? Where is the offense that found the edge consistently? That had Beard in the wide channels linking yeah, up. Beard had, had options on the inside. Poor, to be honest, to this yeah, autumn. Beard has been poor. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. He's been missing tackles. He hasn't been physical, but also misused. He's playing mm. on the inside instead of playing on the edge, where yeah. you need him, where you need all those link plays to. to find access for your for your good runners true um, and that Welsh team that was so hungrily taking tries in the Six Nations is just gone and, and this team doesn't really know what it is bigger struggling um, guys like Roland's looking uh, out of their death yeah, out way, there like well that was that was what was shocking from the minute one was that Fiji were just dominating the collisions yeah like if Aroni Sao hadn't been won I don't see how Wales could have won that game yeah um, if Aroni Sao had, had managed to rein that in and maybe won the turnover that his yeah. good smash had earned um, then it would have been a different story because yeah, no, Fiji played pretty much all yeah. the rugby and actually Vola Vola for my money was the best 10 of the weekend I actually thought he moved them around very very yeah, well Lamani excellent too Lamani brilliant um, too um, where by contrast the Welsh kind of halfbacks were a little loose too it was just it was a weird Welsh performance really good from Liam Williams he showed all his Lions credentials and all his clutch and he basically because before they even discovered that the mall was an in it was only Liam Williams yes. and they'd lost a tight head through a, a knock after three minutes just felt like they rocked up completely not at the pitch whereas yeah, Fiji and did and um, you, have, you have to have to have to take this uh, this Fijian team seriously yeah. they are excellent They're, they're they still have all of that pace and physicality that they naturally have that yeah. comes to them their natural footballing ability they, yeah. they really are natural rugby players they, they are they, yeah, just, yeah. they just are born into playing the game um, but they've added some pretty neat looking structures on True. offense and defense and really you talk about the mall defense if they can dial that in dial the set piece in and mine the discipline they're going to start turning these great performances into wins against yeah, top tier they one have, sides they've already got, they've, got a, they've got a few scouts um, but they are on the level that's what we've yeah, always yeah. said is that like player for player they are on the level like, yeah. look at Naya Kalevu's performance at 13 yeah. defending the 13 channel with only 13 men he was brilliant yep. he was shutting everything using down using that speed advantage yeah. killing them yeah. um, Wales were helping them a bit by being very one dimensional yeah. but uh, yeah it was it was it was very very impressive from the Vigians and I felt I felt bad for them then towards the tail. Yeah, I felt I felt it was it the didn't feel like try just garbage tra- tra- time as well. Like yeah. They made it a fifteen point win, absolutely mental. Yeah, no, blessed, um, blessed was it. Yeah, yeah as you were doing, as you were well remarking, it was like, geez, we have a lot of tape on on how Wales cope with fourteen men. <laughs> well, <laughs> it just yeah, keeps that's happening. That bizarre run. <laughs> yeah. And listen, I don't think there's a single one that you could argue is harsh. No, teams no. just keep giving up 
red cards against them. Yeah, no, indeed. Um, which, which, like Wales, you can only play what's in front of you. That's yeah. it. But uh, I, I don't even think they did that particularly well. So no, not they, this week. No, yeah, they they, they, they'll have to dust themselves off. They're the facing yellow cards. Another, it was the subsequent yeah. yellow cards on top of the red cards. That's what did for Fiji. Yes, indeed. It was the it, minutes when they were down to thirteen, more yeah. than they were down to fourteen. When they were fourteen, they were more than competitive. Yes, they were actually winning the game. Yes, because they kept winning all the collisions. Um, but with thirteen, it was too much to bear, and ultimately Wales found their ends. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, credit still, still a good game, and credit to Fiji, and uh, yeah, Wales will have to dust themselves off and be ready for for Oz who come this weekend. But uh, yeah, that was, it was it was still a fun game of a Sunday. There were a couple of other games as well. Uh, rugby Championship uh, intrigue continued. We had Romania R- Rugby Europe Championship, a Rugby Europe yeah. Championship, not Rugby Championship. That's yeah. a Rugby Europe Championship where Romania stuffed the Netherlands as kind of expected, fifty six fifteen. Um, yeah, what a show from Romania. Didn't quite expect them to put 50 up. That was Romania very, looked very good, impressive. good, 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 good. Yeah. We talked about Portugal looking good. Romania just getting better every week. Yeah. Uh, the mall, of course, absolutely tortured uh, the, the, Netherlands. the Netherlands. And that was an, un, that was an unsurprising in for them. Yeah. But I'm loving the speed they're playing with. Yeah. They're, they're, they're not just pe- more powerful than the Romanians. They're moving it well. And this lad, Vao Vasa, this yeah. South Sea Island guy who's come out of nowhere into the 13th. Just, just as long as he's an eligible uh, player, I'm excited. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah, he's, yeah. he's threatening to tear this championship apart every week he got two tries this week but he was everywhere coming in hitting lines from all sorts of different angles and the poor old Dutch just had no answer no. and uh, yeah this this exciting backline gets gets better every week and the forward pack is really well structured really powerful their mall is excellent their set piece is excellent they have a, a pretty high ceiling this Romanian team and they're getting better every week Love. they're on an absolute collision course with Portugal they next are. year but this yeah. is a this is a very good Romanian team yeah and um, they've, they've teed themselves up they've done yeah. their job uh, perfectly now they can put their feet up for the rest of the year and be ready for next next year's kind of do or die next year is when yeah. the, the knives come out and it really is cutthroat because there's one, one oh, place gonna to be, be scrapping there's going to be such drama lads you're going to really want to get on board the Rugby Europe bus all of these teams now after the pandemic they've had they've had a chance to set themselves we figured out kind of who they are yeah. and now they're coming in this is why I actually I love the, the two year competition yeah. I wasn't sure of it at first but I've really come around I love that as a World Cup qualifier because we've teed it all up now yeah. and now they have a chance really with, with all the tape and knowledge of each other to go at each other and see and who made, the better made team the better is. one survive because um, there was another one as well Spain um, yeah. and put I put Russia to the sword, forty nine to twelve, uh, in Madrid. It was it was one we were billing See as what like, happens when you have the extra. Exactly, man Russia managed to grab. Or yeah. Russia gave away a red card sloppily early doors, and Spain were well able to capitalize on yeah. that, which was kind of the inverse of what we suggested might have happened. And yeah. earlier in the season, definitely probably would have happened. But that's such as the spread. Not not only is it two years, but it's like spread out. Like yeah. the first games were near enough January, and now we're we're like the last game isn't going to be till December as well because there's still one remaining but uh, it means that yeah different veins of form have come and gone at different par- parts and Spain have rediscovered a bit of what their yeah. attacking aplomb is about yeah they're um, bouncing back from what was a, a hideous slump earlier yeah. in the year um, they're they're not they're not as rash as they were, but yeah. they still have that very game tough mall. Yeah. They have a scrum half in Rue who moves them really really well, and they all have skills. They find the edge really well. They pass really well. They don't make too many mistakes unless they're put under extreme pressure. But they're physical. They're sharp, dynamic, quick runners. Know how to take tries, score some gorgeous highlight reel tries, and some mall tries. Managing at scrum time just gave the Russians no in to stop them. Didn't lose the contact area and didn't lose the set piece. And the Russians were like, oh. Well, we done then, yeah, and then we just much. gave up all kinds of tries from yeah. there. Um, yeah, all of these teams, uh, Portugal, Spain, and um, and uh, Romania, evolving at a rate that Russia aren't, and that's probably true. A, a, a Russia def- still need more speed. Like, yeah, it's been true since the World Cup, since before yeah. the World Cup twenty nineteen, and that's probably still true. Yeah, um, away in Madrid, but they are still in the hunt. That's why it's what's fun about it is like yeah. all of those teams are on similar enough points areas, so one or two results could sway it next year. So it, it is as you said. Yeah. Very teed up. And, and there was one moment from the Spanish that, that should go mentioned. It wasn't caught by the ref, but it's just like a little indication. Like on one of the Russian tries, they ran under the sticks and one of the Spanish lads just hit him high as he was doing that. And I was like, hmm. And it didn't another, go called because it, it was a Russian try. Yeah. But I was like, hmm. Yeah, Don't be ref doing that, Spain. That's, that's, <laughs> that's a card. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like, to be honest, so, like in, in, my, in my book, yeah. all of that, that <laughs> nonsense that happens yeah. as the try is grounded should yeah. be a card or should be a restart with a penalty. Yeah. Like, a, like a high shot is one, but the, the sliding knee tackle that you see very often yes. when a guy is just grounding it and the guy is coming in from nowhere. Just like, to give him a shot. Just to give him a shot. Yeah, like, yeah. the ball's already 
ground, uh, grounded, I'm going to slide in knee first and take a, give him a shot. I would be giving cards for that. I yeah. think you probably should to protect the player, protect the same as roughing the pass or roughing the score. Yeah. Um, but it is just a nasty little habit that some some players more than others have. Some teams do as well. Spain were ble- lucky enough to get away with that one, although they probably were winning that game anyway. Uh, regardless, but yeah, no little old habits dying hard. They were definitely better on the discipline. It's easier to do that when you're already up a man. Yeah, and you don't have to. They, don't they have, have to stress. Potential. They for sure have potential. This team. Um, yeah. it, 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 some of their looser aspects might be punished, but they move the ball very well. Like they, they could give Portugal and Romania a game themselves, and all of a sudden be right back in the this mix. Yeah, um, yeah. They have a game against the Netherlands on the 12th of December or the 18th of December yes. uh, randomly Wild. next month um, but they do look well set to yeah. beat the Netherlands I who mean, are I mean, happy to play the role of whipping boys this is it. And well, then, as a result yeah. of that result it's it, regardless of yeah. whether the Netherlands win or not the Netherlands will be bottom and they will be the ones yeah. in the playoffs and they so will, Spain and they have managed to drag themselves yeah. out of that mire yeah. and, and the, back into competitive. they're ahead of Russia now if yeah. they can beat the Netherlands and then we will you know resume with this class tournament with all the money on it um, next February and that is going to be a really really exciting really? I'm, I'm des- desperate to see what happens in that one and uh, yeah good luck to all sides it's poisoned nicely absolutely um, going into next year um, but listen with that I think that wraps up our, our reviews of all the games this week and uh, we're going to move on now and look ahead to next week yes and we're going to start as we do at the beginning of Saturday the opening weekend the opening game of the great Super Saturday that it is yeah. and we're actually going to start with some of the smaller games involving some of the tier 2 teams really and we're going to build up to the crescendo of uh, of France New Zealand yeah. on uh, on Saturday night that's a uh, it's actually a well-timed Saturday schedule this this week. It yes. feels like it's going to be building all the time, although we do have a big England-South Africa game, which is probably the biggest game of the day in the middle of it, but there's yeah. just going to be plenty of rugby to enjoy. But we're going to start in Parma, That's in right. Italy, yeah. um, where the Italians, the Azzurri, get to take on a side for once that they're ranked ahead of that's true uh, yeah, Uruguay unusual. are going to be travelling over there looking to, to claim a famous scalp in what is a dry run for the Rugby World Cup pool. that's right yeah yeah um, this is a, a pretty rare case that go, both coaches will have a chance to look at this game because it's quite a rare fixture in general like uh, they've actually only met three times but uh, yeah the fact that they're going to be playing eyeballing it with a mind towards that World Cup pool game adds a layer of intrigue to it as well um, yeah just to clear it up it's going to be one o'clock uh, that's two o'clock local time kickoff. we have Craig Evans uh, of West Wales is the referee. Uh, then we have two Frenchmen on the sideline, uh, Ludovic Carré and Tuai Tranini, uh, with Ben Whitehouse, also of Wales, in the TMO box. Um, yeah, it's uh, yeah. The, an, an interesting kind of French-Welsh combo for this game, where they'll both be looking to see sides play running rugby, and both of these sides will probably be keen to do a bit of that as well. Um, Uruguay, as far as their record has gone, like it's their 0-2 this, uh, this autumn, as are Italy, it's, uh, whoever wins this game will be uh, be carrying a win into next year, which is quite uh, quite coveted. But uh, to be honest, Uruguay haven't quite travelled with a plum, um, which is kind of to be expected. They are a tier two side who did just get the dizzy high of of getting the booking their place in uh, in the World Cup in two years time. So the end of a season like that with a long campaign, uh, it's kind of tough to get to the pitch of, of the battle so far for them. Yeah, it has, for sure. Um, and uh, Italy would definitely be keen to, to start this season with a plum and, 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 and or uh, finish, finish, finish yeah. the series with a plum, I should say, but uh, and, and, and get and get a win. Yeah. They're kind of a tough team to figure out right now, Italy. They're like, are they... Like it, 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 like the the thing that's gonna puzzle me is that I feel like they're gonna go out this week and smash Uruguay and look very good while doing it. Mm-hmm. And they've picked their team. They've got some bangers back in there. It's good to see Bram Stain back in. Yeah. Um. Yeah, when he's at eight. his very best, he's a phenomenal player. Yeah. Um. Really does give their back row. They're already very good back row. Yeah. Uh, lift. Negri, Negri um, Lamaro as uh, captain with him in at eight is probably their strongest one available right now. Yeah, Obviously, indeed. guys like Pelledri have been out for ages, but they do have really good stocks. And um, Negri yeah. was a. Uh, was a standout last week in terms of he was one of the few yeah. lads who could win a contact against those Pumas. And, and when um, Bram Stain was at his best, he was out sh- outshining Negri. Yeah. Um, so there's definitely there's potential in that in that group in there. And then obviously there is no Stephen Varney after the injury you're talking about um, that he picked up uh, on the weekend against yeah. Argentina. So there's Callum Brady comes in, but they do have Paolo Garbisi, they have Marisi, um, they have Brex, who was actually Argentinian born, so South American um, by country by his nat- his nativity, I guess. Yes. Um, then they have Montiuani still out there on the left wing Pierre Bruno on the other wing and Eduardo Padovani at fullback with no Minazzi, um, him also injured on in the weekend yeah. and they've got um, 
uh, Rituva Tavoyara, uh, Tav- Tavoyara, I should say, yeah. um, who's been, uh, one of the Benetton outside backs who's been absolutely lighting it up for them in recent years. Yeah. He's going to be in the 23 exactly. shirt, and I'm excited to see him come on and play for Italy as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but it's, it, it's a, like it's a good team, and we watched them last week, totally unmatched, outmatched physically, blown away by an Argentine side that is on the lower echelon of the top tier teams. But I still feel like they do exist in that sort of middle of one or two. They do. Um, well, like the last, you have to go way back to the World Cup, uh, to their pool games when they they last faced an opponent that they outranked, and also the last time they got a win. Uh, they haven't. They've been winless since those games, but they absolutely blew Canada and Namibia away. Yeah. At Fifty points to one try. Very much the kind of hidings that they would be getting getting very regularly from the tier one sides, particularly in the Six Nations. But they they generally when they meet tier two sides, they've been able to dish out some of that punishment, and that part of that is just the physicality, the innate physicality that they have to have to just even field a team and go into battle with some of these like the Englands and the Frances and the Irelands of the world that uh, tend to do quite quite a lot of damage, wear them down over the full eighty, yeah. but they're more exposed to a higher they, they, level, and they they tend to be able to inflict that kind of shock. On their tier two or on tier two teams when they, when they do come around. Yeah, exactly. They they, they they have to learn to execute against teams that are physically much outmatching them, likely outmatch them for speed, yeah. um, likely outmatch them for rugby smarts and professionalism and everything. Yeah. And they have to learn to execute at least some plays yeah. under and that kind of extreme grab a try. pressure. They, they, they do normally yeah. grab a try. And it? when it's not there, when all of a sudden they're playing against a, a side mark that's markedly below that, they're yeah. just... They, they, they play with a freedom yeah. and uh, you got you start to see some of the skill sets that they've yeah. been working and on some of these come, young, young halfbacks fruition. that we've been excited um, about and guys like uh, like um, Monty, Monty, Monty Oani well. who's, who's a, a firm favourite any time was, his contributions were all great against Argentina although he was frozen out but uh, at one point he, he kicked a ball through and got tackled as he kicked it which well, like, it wasn't even that late of a hit but the whole crowd went no. <laughs> it's like don't touch Ioanni he's great mm. and you might get to see more of the likes of him in a game like this where there's a bit more space to range and we know Paolo Garbisi can pass he's been doing good good work at Montpellier this season it's, uh, he was under tremendous pressure the both halfbacks were under ridiculous pressure from yeah. Argentina that, that defence is mean uh, it is mean like they're, they're not stringing the full game together this this year as far as the top level of tier one but their defense looks top level tier one it's it's the other bits and pieces and Italy were were eaten up and beaten up uh, for large periods so there could be a shackles off kind of scenario here where yeah, they I'm, get to I'm, not only inflict a bit of damage in the tight which they will be with Bram Stain back in and all yeah. that but also a, a bit more room for guys like Garbisi, Garbisi to, to get the yeah. flow going and to run a multi-phase I mean there were moments not many of them but there were moments in, in the Six Nations this year and, and the, even the year prior um, yeah. when their offence found a rhythm yeah. they actually had one or two bits against France yeah when they were able to recycle the ball for a few phases and all of a sudden you could see Garby see the wheels turning he started to manage things well he started to pick uh, holes and they started to appear he started to work the short side a little bit against the French yeah. and work edges and get guys in space and then you know once you get Monte Oani in a bit of space you've got danger there and a chance to score the try so I'm excited to see an Italian side that can breathe a little bit go through its phase play and work its offence and yeah. we'll get a picture as to what that looks like and um, it'll obviously um, without the dual distributors and Luca Marisi and Brex in there it's on them to, to find the outside Big as, well. as well as well um, 15 he was very good last week in the air particularly because Argentina did kick the leather off the ball and he was their best fielder in the backfield last week so he'll hope to keep some of that form because Uruguay will kick uh, at them they're good yeah. kickers themselves and it's a good test for him but yeah a, a decent balance to this side that they picked um, I'm excited to see them take the field in a match that they're favourites in to be honest it's it's an yeah, unusual we'll sensation what their for them. looks like I mean um, it, uh, more excited I would be for them to play a, a game that they're truly competitive in yeah um, but I guess that the sides that they're competitive with you can kind of count Georgia, on one hand Fiji Georgia Fiji yeah probably and that might be it yeah. um, why don't they play those guys in a, a, a trifecta yeah. yeah of three and we'll see like Fiji are looking like they're making the step up themselves True. like um, yeah it might ju- <laughs> just be Georgia and even then, you know, Italy's last game against them, they won, but it was a one score game, which it is was. a little more. Well, that's uh, it. That's what you kind of want um, to see is competitive games. Italy in a one score levels. game of any kind yeah. is a remarkable thing. Um, 
are one of those sides that can that can be competitive against Italy is Uruguay among those sides Uruguay is coming for that mantle they, um, they have obviously already qualified as we were saying um, but uh, they need to find a, a performance not just against Italy here but just a performance that they can take some positivity from on European soil because it is pertinent that the World Cup that they've qualified for is going to be in France and their record on European soil is abysmal and mm. this, this autumn has been no different um, Romania was the, their first test and that's a side who have been on the up in this autumn they've been riding good momentum but definitely a similar ranked uh, opponent and one that they would have hoped they would be tighter with um, although they obviously they just didn't perform as well or as bullishly as Romania on that day but it is a track record of, of them not really doing the business in Europe when they look so good in Montevideo and other parts of the world and yeah. looked great in Japan as well like um it's so, true, yeah. it's true. It, although in, in this season specifically, um, it isn't just Europe. Um, really, they well, we saw them have a performance that they stuttered in against Chile. Yeah. Um, like they won that game about three points. That's a forgotten game of the qualifiers. The, the, the gnarly Chile pushed them all the way. True. Then they went away to the US and looked kind of like they've been looking for the past couple of weeks. Really slow, non, non-physical. Yeah. Um, yeah, just non-reactive, not certainly non-proactive. Yeah, um, some of their kicks, yeah, loose as all hell, yeah, just, just idealists in that yeah, game. Exactly, yeah, exactly, not playing with any energy. And then we, we saw them dial it in essentially for one game against the US in front of a raucous home support in Montevideo and for all looked, the marbles. And they looked great. And they looked great. We saw yeah. what this team can be. They yeah. were speedy, they were purposeful, they got off the line in defence, they were proactive, they were getting turnover penalties, they were feeding off each other's True. energy, yeah. they were marrying that South American passion with the skill that we know they have as well, and the footballing instincts yeah. and they look like their very own brand of exciting offensive rugby team yeah. and we know you know on their day obviously beating Fiji at the World Cup um, but even beyond that like they, they have they can be solid defensively they have some some top quality players they unfortunately do. this week there is no um, Arata there is no Bershesi yeah. there is a Kessler in at Hooker who's that also is, a class good. player one of those um, guys from that uh, that Fiji game and from that World Cup who was great yeah, yeah no, big, big job for Inquiarte and Echeverri who we have seen bits of yeah. at halfback but it's they need to get and, them moving and, uh, Freitas uh, in the midfield is a class player Rodrigo Silva at fullback is a class player yeah and um, so when they're at their best, they have weapons, they move the ball well, they can find tries. True. This Italian defence is not something that they can be that they should that should discourage them from playing ball. Yeah. Um, I but think so. The they, first thing they have to do is just bring something similar to that energy and yeah. that passion that we saw. They'll need, they'll need the all of that. They'll yeah. need a performance similar to what we saw Portugal give uh, Japan to give yeah. them a proper run. They need to kind of be themselves, go gung ho for it and uh, yeah, try and attack with a plum, try and rise to the energy. That was a home game for Portugal, and Correct. it's, it's, it's yeah. more difficult to travel when you're under-resourced and overmatched in games like these. But uh, that's kind of what we want to see from, from Uruguay, is just an emotionally charged showing. That gets the best out of the players who are on the pitch. Maybe they can find a couple of tries. There is space against Italy, we know this. Yeah. Um, if they can execute well, it, it should be a, a fun game. I do expect... They will be overmatched. It is the end of their season as well as Italy's, and I think they they'll probably be blown out a little in the uh, in the final quarter, perhaps. Um, similar to what what happens to Italy, it'll be a little shoes will, on the will other foot. Will it take that long? See, I don't the know. funny See, thing is, is in my head, if it gets to the final quarter and it's a tight game, that's a success. Then, then yeah. no, but then it, it might it might kind of stay that way. Yeah, maybe maybe it'll, yeah. Italy get one try to put it away, but I don't I don't really see it playing out like an like like a game like that where it's like tight and then Italy all of a sudden well I mean win. tight-ish like no, tight, tight-ish yeah. with Italy on top and looking on top and then yeah, well, it, a little it might kind of um, break them but I feel like if, if Uruguay aren't at the if Uruguay are at the pitch of the game they should be competitive for most if not all parts of it and maybe Italy will grab a try here or there that might get the, the winnings of it and if Uruguay don't show up with that passion and that you know that all of that energy that, that they do when they're at their best then uh, they're probably going to get blown out early yeah, that's um, true. because Italy you know it, 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 there's a factor in this game playing in Parma in Zebra Stadium like we saw a little bit of it in, uh, in Treviso last week where the crowd that came out they're just so appreciative these are a, a long suffering group of rugby supporters true. who go out and watch Zebra um, and you know they, they lose nearly every week um, it's a thankless job being a season ticket holder for those guys but even just fans who want to go who, who live in that area yeah. they're so appreciative when the national side comes 
comes their way yeah. and let alone a game that they can win yeah. I anticipate a huge raucous atmosphere and a passionate yeah. Italian team I'd determined like to two good anthems yeah. here and let's go yeah um, to, to, well, the, to, the Italian team will be determined to, to get a win on the board it's a good, their best opportunity to do it yeah. and they'll feel that they've been more than earned it over the last few years like they feel they have improved their game they have and they've, they've got found some good it. talent um, and they, they've tightened up in certain areas they still have a very very good uh, back row they've, they've had yeah. that for the last few years but now young halfbacks who can slot in decent options in the back line yeah I'm, I'm going to predict here that Italy win by about 20 odd points 20, between 20 and 25 yeah. point margin I um, might take the over on that maybe that's harsh no it's that harsh I'll say you're probably right yeah we'll 3 point game 30, 30 <laughs> last minute kick f- Nah, forty-one, no. fifteen, something like that. Something along those lines. I do want to see Uruguay get their game off a little bit, and I'd like to, I'd like to see yeah, a try well, in my scenario, or potentially a Kessler yeah. try because their their offensive mall is pretty good yeah, when it gets yeah. dialed in as well. Both um, of their game can be, but I just I anticipate Bram Stain and Cole yeah. just not giving them anything. That's in that kind area. of where I think it's going yeah. to be decided. So is the collisions. Know. Look at the early going collisions in the first yeah. quarter will kind of reveal what kind of game it will be. Whether Uruguay are there for them, and then it, we get into a good scrap where it'll take Italy doing yeah. something proactive to win it. Or less so. If they're yeah. blown away from the immediate, then Italy probably won't have Which to do as much. More likely, um, in my mind, on the evidence of what we've seen so far, is that yeah, Italy, Italy will win this and be comfortably the better side. Um, yeah. But let us know what you guys think down in the in the comments below. Any thoughts? Um, do hit us up. But uh, with that, we're going to move on absolutely to the next game, which takes place kicks off at the exact same time, uh, one o'clock uh, GMT. Uh, in Murrayfield, um, right. we have um, the repeat of a World Cup classic yes, as uh, the Scots host Japan this time at home, obviously in Murrayfield. Yeah. Um, one o'clock kickoff. That's going to be ref by Brendan Pickerel of New Zealand, Paul Williams, and Andrea Piardi of Italy um, are going to be on the AORs. Yeah. And then um, Stuart Berry is the South African TMO. That's right. Um, this is obviously um, a game that I think has been in this, on the Scottish calendar for a while. It has um, vengeance, vengeance, and a yeah. chance to sign off the season with a win at home. Which well, they'll is feel that they've improved massively since that they World will, Cup in attitude and just performance level. They'll also feel like um, they were play- they played bad. Badly, even for the team that went to that World yeah. Cup, they played a poor World Cup by their own by their own no standards, question. and yeah. they probably have improved since then as well. Yeah. Like player for player, you look at the front rows that have taken to the field since then, and they've probably built on on some of that depth too. And um, but that was an instant classic, obviously 28-21 to Japan in that uh, World Cup. Um, that pool game, the last decisive pool game that ultimately ended Scotland's World Cup campaign. Um, they have met eight times overall with Scotland winning seven of those. Interestingly, they've met thrice in Scotland, thrice in Japan, and twice on neutral venue on neutral soil. So this will be tipping it in the scales of more and more appearances in Scotland. Um, yeah, the uh, the three tests since uh, since the kind of twenty fifteen World Cup have been pretty close. Before then. There were a few blowouts because Japan were still a coming the, force. The but. 2015 World Cup was a was a bad one because yeah, they, they, the Japan beat the box and then had and a short turnaround that's and right. changed some players yeah. and then ended up shipping a massive scoreline against the Scots. 45-10 I believe um, it was. Yeah, um, and that was that ended up um, knocking them basically out. Basically, created them history because they were the first team to win was it three games yeah. and not qualify from a World Cup pool. So that was Scotland did them they dirty did. and they got vengeance. They got their like, vengeance. So yeah, so it has fast become a very good rivalry, yeah, a very yeah. good global <laughs> rivalry in modern. Rugby. Rugby. and both sides kind of want to be quick attacking teams as well by by kind of ethos and by mantra yeah. they were both rocking up to that world cup trying to be the quickest team to play rugby and it was japan in that instance a couple of years ago who were at that but uh but yeah scotland have been moving the ball very very well very nicely off set piece they've kind of looked stronger in set piece they've also had a better autumn campaign so far than japan yeah um, oh it's not just autumn i mean they've they've developed a balance to them they're a much more balanced team than they ever were Scotland they used to be you know we'll concede one to score one kind of job you know they they would pick guys like Hugh Jones in the midfield and just sacrifice defence for the sake of offence now they have a very solid defence and they have an offence that still works really well spearheaded by a really creative out half a very very good scrum half in Ali Price who's really improving he's he's, he's kicked on since the Lions Um, tour not all of the Lions have but he's definitely kicked on since that Lions tour his passing's great he's starting to see the game a lot better than he used to he makes less mistakes that's right he, he's passing as I said was Chris but he's just he's got a lovely vision of the game on offence and complements Finn Russell's game perfectly True. so too does Stuart Hogg two tries last week brilliant on the edge and yet they 
they do have a centre combination in Johnson and Uday, who's now back in yeah. and Harris that are robust miserly. as well as good yeah. on the offence they'll sit people down miserly and, and speedy on the edge as well yeah. like Japan will not find it as easy to get outside of Chris Harris as they did at the World Cup no, he's especially when on. it's Naka uh, and Nakano as well on de- or he was on debut last week yeah. and he's got the 13 shirt no sign of uh, of Lafayette so that'll be a big test for yeah. him because Harris is a, is a bit of a rock on the defence indeed and Duhan van der Merve is like he's gone to another planet in the yeah. past year he's looks one of the top wingers in the True. world was exceptional last week against his home country it's which is very, a rare enough thing it is yeah um, expat Saf has normally struggled but the Scot- well, Scottish ones didn't really last no. week they they did ultimately get worn down by the um, world champions but, uh, but they put in a good showing um, um, Hamish Watson was also missing for that game in Japan they've got Scott Cummings back in the side um, that's exciting yeah because yeah, um, they've been lacking perhaps a little bit for their yeah, so monstrous second row him and Gilchrist with Sam Skinner I believe on the bench is, is a lot of uh, lot of heft to mm. be throwing throwing Japan's way particularly in the second half yeah. and I think they have gone 6-2 as well on the bench with the mind towards exactly that being hefty they have only the two horns they have George Horn and King Horn covering the backs yeah. but they have a lot of units to chuck in in the second half as well off that bench so yeah, yeah they're, they're, they've they become more bullish in the tight they, they yeah. really have fancied their set piece and it has been working in the Six Nations they've been getting an edge on they were scrummaging really well in Paris really yeah. well in London again in Twickenham I mean um, had a rough day last rough week rough day but, against yeah. the box but the box we know yeah. are a, another level from even top level yeah. there they are the and, top and the drop off from scrum. a spring box scrum to a Japanese scrum is, is night quite, and day. quite vast night and day. Um, um, so they might like yeah, it's a decent front row that they feel that they might find it a bit easier this week and oh, find a, a chance to attack a bit they, more they'll, they'll be bullish they'll be yeah. bullish of putting on a show here because they've they're, 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 as I say the nuts and bolts of their game like just the, the individual elements are all kind of there their offense is great and it's wonderful it, it, it functions off a set piece that that is actually really really competent True. Um, yeah. and even last week Sam Skinner poached a line out like they were they, they lost they but they were com- yeah, yeah combative maybe more than competitive yeah. but they were they are right there like they were a very solid set piece yeah, they were there in the first um, half they kind of got worn all those guys like Richie who played really well in the first half yeah. got a little just worn down which as, is what happens as, um, as we yeah, see there's yeah, an attritional see. game that you end up having to play against the box mm. and it's like less so against Japan they no don't put quest. the squeeze on you anywhere near like yeah. even even by any tier one standards much less the box they're yeah. not that kind of team no um, question and uh, yeah just looking at the Japanese form this year the defensive um, issues that they've had if I'm Scotland I'm thinking there's no area of the game we shouldn't get an edge on yeah. here we should, should win the scrum attacking those we new centre yeah. par- that new centre pairing yeah. up the middle you should be trying to find the edge because they're not like with Fafita on yeah. one wing instead of Fukuoka they're less fast than their they were wingers the are actually and... probably maybe on balance worse than the Scottish wingers yeah. you know would you rather have Duhan and Darcy Graham or Matsushima and Fafita I think I'd rather have Duhan and Darcy Graham yeah, to be honest. Probably um, at the minute based on uh, form as well. Yeah, it's right that Matsushima comes in for Japan as well. He's he on the he's bench, great, like, yeah. but uh, he was he was one that remains there. But obviously, it's just a new new look backline. They're slightly different in terms of their tempo. So Scotland should probably be looking to be the slightly quicker team with Finn Russell passing very well mm. and trying to just exert themselves on the gain line first and then give Finn the ball generate yeah. that quick ball and just give Finn the yeah, platform give Finn a better service than he's had all year yeah. and a chance to be patient and to pick his moments like yeah. against the box it kind of had to be frantic to get outside them because yeah. they weren't winning those contacts on the inside but they'll have a chance to be a bit more patient in terms of how they find True, space more control. and work the and edge and also if they can um, get an edge a nudge on at scrum or be, be solid at scrum and line yeah. out without as much issue here then there's a chance for those beautiful strike moves that have yep. been have been cutting the top level defenses apart on phase one pretty yeah, much and, for years. This and is half. not a top level defense no. right now. This Japanese team. Um. So yeah, they should be very confident on the ball about dominating the contacts and yeah. getting tries yeah, in. Good and tape then, from Portugal last week in yeah. terms of how to run away, <laughs> run at them, and cause problems. Indeed. Um, and on the other side of the ball, the defensive side of the ball, they should also be confident, and that's probably the biggest work on for them. They they have become really really good over the ball yeah. um, and their uh, defensive their defence from the midfield through Chris Harris who was there at the World Cup but is, is twice the player now that he was then yeah. um, that has become really elite as well and True. I think a really good benchmark and a challenge for the Scottish team is to not allow the Japanese anything cheap yeah. on the other side of the Some, ball someone anytime um, you see Jimeno who is a big danger for them yeah. or Labashagna even just blasting them out yeah. on the offensive cl- and defensive clean outs just Getting getting the contact area won thoroughly with yeah. commitment, and that'll that'll be the first step in kind of getting the crowd on your on your behind you, and kind of making Japan question and doubt a little bit, and then try and exert control over the course of the eighty minutes. It's 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 going to involve like a, a well balanced showing their kicking acumen as well from ten and fifteen predominantly. Try and try and peg those Japanese back test their exit ability because they haven't been. 
haven't been too great on that either um, and to be honest you can either catch them on the high ball or just win a kicking duel with the, the length that those guys can get as well just yeah a nice control showing from from the Scots here and they'll be trying to slowly turn the screw yeah, and break them and in a few key moments that's kind of yeah. one of the tests of it is how mature can they be because yeah. I, w- I would I would hold one thing against them I'd hold is that they're perhaps a little immature sometimes, sometimes. and perhaps can be bullied and can be rattled and yeah. then sometimes as well in, in a in a matchup that they have the advantage on could show up a little dialed out True. and all of a sudden you're kind of playing that beach rugby that can get you into trouble yes, and defending somewhat. a little like that as well and if you do defend loose the Japanese will, will cut you open and grab a couple of tries they will. and make it, make it more of a shootout than perhaps it should be yes they probably shouldn't uh, engage in, in shootout mentality quite no. as much they will be trying to strangle control of this in their home ground and try and yeah. make, deny Japan ins entirely and just kind of slowly build your score and, and play your game the way you want to do it be proactive be the more proactive team at home is, is definitely a good challenge I think they will be buoyed by things like the uh, the Australia result a couple of weeks ago and the France result that ended the Six Nations the fact that they would so often lose games like that and are developing a bit of a habit for edging tight ones means that yeah. even if they end up in that shootout that they were in the World Cup say a while back yeah, yeah. they will feel a bit more confident of their ability to adjust in it and can wrestle control back and try and edge that game but from, mi- from minute one they won't be aiming yeah, for plan, that game plan A all. isn't that game yeah. um, for Japan I suppose plan A is that game yes um, make it a shootout make it a, a <laughs> kind of knife fight in the middle third with Techers being the, the dictating uh, kind of the factor in the game if you can just we'll execute you'll execute we'll execute like, we'll execute four times to your three yeah. and that's the game <laughs> um, and that's like yeah very often that has been uh, what they what they do so well they will be a little rock they'll be grateful and f- relieved to have got over the line last week against Portugal because there was very nearly egg on their face it was there but for a yeah, one one last minute play that was that was a potential kind of big banana skin. It would it would have been their first defeat to a tier two side since they'd been officially made tier one. Um, obviously that didn't come to pass, but they don't carry too much good form into this set uh, this contest. To be honest, they have have looked good in patches, but obviously Ireland blew them away. Um, yeah, their defense has been pretty toothless throughout this campaign by by their own standards. Because like p- part of that World Cup game, like that great intercept from Fukuoka, strip, rip, and and go. Like they were bringing def- defensive pressure that was testing top level teams. They smothered Ireland with their speed off the line. We haven't really seen a lot of that. And no. um, we did like that back row. They got Michael Leach back in. They do. And um, they got Lavish Gagne, who at his best is a very ferocious right. tackler. And um, Jimeno at number eight, which at the minute that. that is their best back row, and it's good to see them field it. And I they need to be workhorses those guys will be tested and like every time you go to Murrayfield you know that the back row are going to have to put in a serious shift like north of 10 tackles each yeah. uh, getting in breakdowns they will yeah, and yeah. even more is the point even looking at that type 5 yeah. like they are uh, tip prototypically I think a breakdown avoidance team on the offensive end yeah. and they're going to have to be so careful minding the ball against these Scottish That's jacklers true. I mean like uh, every line break can be punished with a uh, with, with a, a with Richie steel or yeah, exactly Hamish right. Watson steel or yeah falling at the feet of, of someone like that even a yeah. like George Turner you know yeah, they, just they all the they all have an eye for it it is it is one of their better qualities mm. even in losing efforts they have a, a knowledge of how to scrap in a breakdown and make it make yeah. it messy the centers do as well like it's you can't so it's a, can't get isolated yeah so it's about offloads it's about yeah. it's about keeping the ball alive but getting minding the ball on your way down trying to keep it alive as best you can and then flicking it up to the next guy yeah. trying to keep the pace of the game relentlessly high slipping away from Scottish tackles yeah. um, and let's be real getting an advantage to kick the ball as well is not the worst thing although you have to be very you have to do that proactively and on yes. the front foot because chipping it to Stuart Hall will be punished you'll yeah. just no, you big, won't win that test battle for Nagara um, and Matsuda to try and dictate when and how they kick and yeah. move them around the park uh, well yeah, same with Yamanaka at fullback as well like uh, they'll all be tested I'm sure yeah. Masashima will help out but, but like they, they, they kick a good three in Japan. They do. I'll tell you that and like, if they can make sure that the game takes place largely in Scotland's territory um, that'll, that'll be an advantage for them that's sure. where they might p- poach a penalty or two but the problem is that they're going to have to be so wise to the fact that Stuart Hogg likes to belt them 80 metres up the yes, pitch indeed. and then you can just lose that battle so they'll have to have something on counter attack and the other thing they'll have to have is something off set piece yes. I want to see some Tony Brown magic back yeah. it's yeah. kind of what this team used to have back in 2015 um, when they weren't quite as quick with your f- uh, Fekito, um, not Fekito, I always do that um, Fafita uh, on the no, wing no with, uh, uh, Fukuoka, Fukuoka. Oh, sorry, but, yeah, yeah, with the World Cup team with yeah, without without Fukuoka on 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 the wing, and um, they're just not as quick. Yeah. But what they had before he came in 
was real smart soft set piece a bit like Scotland have now where yeah. you're running maybe two or three screens yeah. and the Boys results like in Matsushima on the edge yeah. exactly right and uh, I want to see them work all of that kind of magic little dummy pods and yeah. c- clever first phase and second phase moves off set piece to try and bamboozle the Scots yeah. just to get themselves an overlap and from there they'll trust their skill set true big test for uh, Nak- was it uh, Nakano who made his debut last week against Portugal grabbed a lovely try looked pretty good yeah. But in terms of that set piece strike play, like they do a lot of distributing through thirteen in that World Cup team, and that has been a pivot point for them. And Harris is the big defender that you yeah. want to occupy as well. So it's just it's a I think it's, it's a, a massive little, it's, test. It's a bit more probably on 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 Nakamura to be well, that he, guy. He, he was been, obviously yeah. the the partner to um, yeah. to Lafayette, but I think he's he's become more of a linchpin figure this year in, in terms of that offense. True, and it is on him I think to be that second distributor yeah. and to suck players in and sure. maybe release. The, the hard running of Nakano on his outside. So. Yeah, I would I would hope so. They need to yeah. try and kind of make that per. They do have some bench depth as well to bring in. Gunter's a big fella. Tatafu is a useful unit. Tatafu is great. He's a very useful. He, he'll probably be introduced likely for Michael Lute. He'll perp one Scott at least. He will. Yeah, he is very least. good in the contact. Yeah. Uh, Utamora as well. The ten who who did yeah. such damage in that World Cup game. He can come off the bench as well. They do look good at ten in terms of their stocks. Like as you say, Matsuda kicks a lovely three. He's yeah. pretty very dialed technique. He hasn't really missed many this autumn at all. That hasn't been the problem for them it's going to be in guys in the tight like Cornelson and Moore in the in the rows going to have to do a lot of work like those are three good second rows that the Scots are bringing to the party counting the bench as well and a hell of a lot of back row yeah. units and, and like that defence just in general as you say getting out of the line and tackling but also reading on the edge yeah. um I haven't seen much evidence sticking can, tackles yeah sticking tackles was the first port of call some of, the, some of the tries are just way too soft they were blow, um, blown away by Ireland yeah. and then conceded a, a fair few against Portugal including on the defensive mall it's true yeah very concerning because Scotland's mall is very good yeah um, they will need to be better in, in pretty much all areas a lot of it will arrive will, will be like arriving to the pitch of the battle it's the last game for both of these teams in 2021 mm. can they get a bit of a bit of kind of yeah. oomph in their performance that they have been lacking in all of the games so far, including that Portugal one, because that like they were so buoyed and so geared up in that World Cup that they would have walked through walls uh, through that pool, and they, they were yeah. fantastic. And we haven't really. It's not just the lack of the pace or the change changing region in the back line. They haven't really brought that emotional energy. And since since that World Cup as well with the new personnel, they haven't quite stumbled on what their right attacking tempo is either. Yeah, uh, they haven't been... really been able to kind of dictate things that way because they've been kind of start stop start and not really sure of themselves and you'd want to be it'll start with being emotionally charged yeah. but you want to see a more proactive more positive showing here yeah it's been a rough tour for Japan um, and this is probably the game that they would have been targeting in this game in this series yeah. if they were to be targeting a game at all they um, are yeah I don't think they're much of a chance in this game unfortunately um, I think the Scots who I've been very impressed with will win it it's a question of, of how dialed in they are and obviously if maybe Japan can pull something out of the hat and bring out, yeah. well, bring if, out if something close to their best if complacent or if they, yeah. they struggle with the favourites tag which can sometimes happen yeah. then maybe they throw a pick to one of one of the Japanese and be generous yeah. that way but uh yeah, I think I'd I'd just, just, the bounce back better. from the sixty to five defeat wasn't much. Like no. they 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 backed that up by struggling to beat Portugal. It's true. They have dropped down a level and this like listen, it was probably always gonna be a tough tour for them. Scotland obviously having all of these t- Six Nations teams having just more um reps since COVID anyway, yeah. they, they they were quicker to come back than uh, than Japan were and just the fact that they've been targeting this game they remember what happened in the World Cup Ireland were the same yeah. it was probably just destined to be a rough November for them and I think probably Scotland will take this one by a score or two but Japan will be back in time for 2023 they, they definitely mark my words oh, yeah. no doubt about that yes they will be at yeah, that um, World Cup to compete no yeah. doubt they have a lot of good resources the top league is ticking away but it feels a little soon in this autumn series and I think yeah. Yeah, that it'll be Scotland who will end their campaign and year on a, on a, a win yeah, by I, think, I think they'll do it do it comfortably yeah, um, if you have any to. score predictions or anything like that let us know in the comments down below Absolutely. Um, but uh, for now we're going to move on um, yes the next game is a real tier 2 clash and also like a funny clash of continents that only shows up in these uh, yeah, festival quite, November quite series game. and uh, yeah. yeah we're getting two it's the first of a two match series actually that these two are playing they're going to play this week and next week both times in Russia 
Um, so that's yeah, it's good to see some of these games. Obviously, yeah. Russia were at the last World Cup and still it's in the in the hunt for this one, and Chile are still in the hunt for the next World Cup as well, having uh, dumped Canada out earlier in the year. So kind of yeah. good fun in that regard. And yep. um, um, it's going to be at the Yug Sports Stadium in Sochi in Russia. Uh, kick off three o'clock. Uh, that's local time. Sorry, twelve o'clock noon GMT. So it's actually the earliest of the oh, games. Oh, we screwed up. We, no, no, um, I'm just chucking it in there. It's noon, <laughs> long, noon here, but it's three o'clock local time. Yeah. Um, Chris Busby of the IRF. You uh, is the man with the whistle, the referee. Adam Jones and Manuel uh, Bottino are the linesmen, and Sean Brickle uh, is in the T in the TMO. So two Welsh, one Irish, and an Italian. Uh, all all Pro Fourteen kind of uh, refereeing <laughs> yeah. team for this one. Um, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean this is a uh, this is a funny game. They have met once before um, back in twenty seventeen. Uh, Russia won forty two eleven in Hong Kong in a game that it's impossible to extrapolate anything from, no. other than Russia coped better on that occasion with going to Hong Kong to yes, play Chile. Indeed. Which I think it was a, like it was, a, what was it called? It was a nations, a cup of nations or something right. that Hong Kong hosted. It was a very unusual one. That was that was it. But that is the only time that they've uh, they've met, and it's a while ago now as well. Yeah. A lot of development has happened in Chile uh, and Russia yeah, since then. I'm, I'm curious to see what the Chileans bring. I have a feeling I know what. Russians are going to bring. Yeah, the Russians are going to be physical. They're going to play set piece ball, defense ball, territory um, ball, three ter- point ball. Absolutely, yeah. all of those balls. Yeah, and um, they're going to play them all. And um, they're um, uh, they're going to play a very simple, effective, physical game plan and yeah. look to out muscle the Chileans. And Chileans, the Chileans, we have tape on doing exactly that to Canada once. And then and the opposite of that, when they met them down in the right. uh, in the in um, Chile, they they cut loose in Chile, whereas they were tight and scrappy in Canada. Correct. Um, um, and against uh, Uruguay, they played that tight, scrappy game again. Yeah. Like they have been for predominantly this season, a chop and jackal and kick deep Big forwards. and defend. They have some serious units yeah. in that pack for a tier two for side. Sure. Like they're massive. Yeah. And their ten is very good as well. Yes. Like they actually, he's a, game, they, he's they a potential can, game breaker. They move people yeah. around um, the, the field very well when they want to. It depends what conditions are, are like in Sochi as well and what they kind of feel when they face the Russian kind of physicality in the first off. We'll kind of we'll see in the early exchanges how game both, they are, both sides are. They did look big against yeah. Canada. Yes, and yeah. everyone looks big against everyone Canada because they're quite big against small. Canada. That's um, right, except yeah. Belgium last week. Like, I'm yeah. sure Russia would probably beat Canada. I would um, think so. Like, I think they're... the level of that Rugby Europe Championship is actually r- quite quite high in terms of the physicality, and it does tend to shock the teams from the Americas. Like yeah. even the US would struggle, and the yeah. US are the biggest of the teams in the Americas. The US they, would probably I think finish they, fifth or yeah, sixth. I think they would yeah. struggle based yeah. on this year's showings against Romania, against Russia, against Portugal, against Spain. Yeah, yeah definitely lose to Georgia. Oh, um, sure. but. Yeah. yeah, like that. It's the the rugby Europe is actually developing into quite a competitive thing. With like all of them are eyeballing Europe too, and it's quite competitive. And Russia have a mind to that as well. And they do. Although like, to be fair, Russia are on the lowest deb now that they've been they, all season. They, they, they opened go. their season with a tenacious. Jackling, frustrating, eighteen to thirteen win over Romania. Disciplined win over yeah. in ill-disciplined Romania. They That's capitalized right. on that by kicking all the threes and yeah. punishing them. They, they um, caught them with caught them with bad penalties, and that that could be a narrative for this game. Guy, they have a lovely place kicker in Guy San, and Chile aren't the most disciplined team in the world, True. especially away from home. You know, they could be just a little loose, just a little disjointed, not enjoying the contact as much as they hoped they would, and then all of a sudden those good jackal steals turn into off your feet, get your hands yeah. off the ball penalties. Indeed, and then all of a sudden Russia are ticking over the score. Board. That's very much their narrative. Yeah. But since then, it's gone not been great for Russia. I mean, nope. they've the Iberians have put absolute scores on them, Portugal and they Spain have. last week, which is to, probably the mold that Chile. Those are the te- that's the tape that Chile should be looking at because yeah. as good as their physicality is, you play Russia in when you play that physical game, and they can be very accurate and very disciplined at it, and they will be looking to put the squeeze on because they're, they're still, better they are against still, Georgia and uh, and Romania than they did against Portugal and Spain. Exactly. That's probably telling team, teams that up the ten. Tempo, they don't have that much speed it was true in the World Cup they were yeah. very combative in the contact even against tier 1 sides they were able to mix it they had a good uh, really good 7 in that tournament as well who we haven't yeah, really seen he since yeah. he's disappeared yeah, yeah. Um, Gadjev, Gadjev. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was awesome in that tournament and they were very combative but you, their, w- their wingers were also like back row forwards in that tournament and yeah. there was just no speed out there to execute in, in the in the fire whereas Chile even though they have a massive pack a few really big units they were bullies in, in leg 1 against Canada 
they cut loose in Chile and they should be looking at the tape from the yeah. Iberians and thinking that's our way to win this yeah, game that's what we're talking about uh, um, Fernandez. what a game he had against Canada yeah. out in, uh, wherever it was not in Santiago but somewhere in Chile yeah. um, that was a, a, a fabulous vintage Via Parezo. Um, Via Parezo, <laughs> that's, that's where it was yeah. um, a vintage performance from any 10 he, like he was in front of a pack that was going forward but he yeah. cut lines really well he was a, a, an absolute running threat but had a lovely passing kicking yeah. game and all of these guys have a good kicking they game they do the edge. same is true yeah, of yeah. Uruguay same is true of Argentina Argentina 15 or Jaguars yeah. they are all good footballers down there yeah. and they should utilise it it's, it's yeah. a kind of game that could shock Uruguay just yeah. finding the edge quickly and then as the Russians are slowly scrambling kicking the ball ahead of them and yeah. outpacing them on the edge yeah. finding tries for cheap chip and um, chase is a definitely a, a, if they can find the edge at all chip and chase should favour them I think they yeah. are the quicker back line by far yeah. um, but it's whether they get are able to kind of stand yeah. up to that that, yeah, that pressure in in a, so in a stadium in Sochi with the home crowd and with the, like they are the Russian bears like they are physical, um, no question. And they'll be hurting from last week. They will. And listen, they were at fourteen men last week, and they're probably just the one one of the teams least equipped with being down to fourteen they in world are, rugby. Just it's to just, cover the space, yeah, yeah, it's just um, you're going to get cut apart. Yeah. So there's only so much you can really read into that, other than they can't get cards because they can't cope. Yeah. Um, but uh, um, from a Chilean point of view, it is that that marriage of we have to front up we have to be physical to match these guys we're going to have to be game at the set piece and at the breakdown but also that's not our game plan at yeah. the same time that's not what we're trying no, to make the game about exactly. that's just a prerequisite to doing what we want to do which, which is being quick and yeah. getting to the edge two pass plays at least yeah, two yeah. pass plays move move the pill wide of those rooks move the Russians left to right try and use the extremities to make them cover more distance on defence it'll make the offensive clean outs easier when you're stretching them anyway if you can be accurate and uh, yeah, just take the game to them as they did. They have done throughout that World Cup campaign. Like we obviously saw Uruguay struggle to travel to to uh, Europe after such a big campaign, a big emotional campaign, and arrive to the pitch. It may be the same for Chile, but we don't Although know. They've had a they've um, had a longer cooling they off have, period. Exactly. Than so we don't had, know. You know. Like no no judgments, and I don't fully know what happens when these two take the field no, like it's kind of a new picture it is a new picture yeah. like like we saw obviously Uruguay struggle against Romania away from home and Romania are a, a pretty pretty well established force in that rugby Europe championship as our Uruguayan thing whereas Chile are kind of a coming force Russia got in by default uh, to the last World Cup they didn't qualify they're probably a better team since that World Cup because they kind of got in shape for the World Cup and did arrive to the pitch and played yeah. a good game in day one against Japan and they have grown since then so it's 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 whoever's bets it's take your pick as to who's in a better place right now I'm not fully sure I think Chile ultimately are closer to getting their arses into the World Cup which makes them in a better better place overall in terms of getting that big payday but in terms of when they take the field I don't know we will know yeah. more next week and they're going to do it twice because it's on next week as well it's a good so, one yeah, yeah. But I, the one thing I'd say about Chile is that they definitely appear to be well coached they do they, they don't seem to be a stupid team as no. much as they can be a nasty team like with that eye gouge yeah. they, they can or the, some of the sliding late uh, hits and stuff yeah, that they were they're, doing they're, against the poor Canadians they're, yeah, they're, yeah. Not, they're not the nicest team but, but they don't, that doesn't mean a they're a stupid thing. team no no and um, um, so they could be like if they're wily enough if they can sort out like the areas like mall defence mm-hmm. and then you know manage their way again around the game like trusting their kicking acumen to just win the territory battle and play most of the game down there then they could pull off an upset and I think yeah, yeah you're definitely thinking ooh Chile if yeah. they can pull it's off de- this it's win it's definitely not fortress um, Sochi either because I think that Portugal win came in this very stadium and yeah, they absolutely yeah. hosed them yeah, so yeah. like you can play a bit of ball here if the, if weather allows it um, yeah so you know I'm I'm hopeful, yeah, Russian, hopeful uh, for the South Americans to put in a show in on a European soil if it's not this week then next week um, form guide's not great for Russia they're, they're, they're too um, what do they call that league the Rugby Europe Super Cup and yeah. those two teams just lost at home back to back weeks against uh, the Israeli team yeah. and the Georgian team yeah. So and they've obviously had that terrible result against the Spanish last week yes um, um, yeah Netherlands win notwithstanding Russia not in a great place so I think opportunity beckons for Chile but yeah. I don't know how do you see it going yeah so it's like I don't know. How do you see it going? You're, <laughs> You're not like, giving an answer. Like, not, no, not no, no, I'm just saying. I'll say Chile win. Like, I, I'm going to say as, Chile as, steal a win. Uh, yeah, I was kind of leaning that way myself yeah. as well. Like, it probably won't happen. It probably <laughs> won't. Maybe I'll, I'll say Russia on home on a home edge it and Chile yeah. don't look quite quite to the pitch. But I, I really don't know, and I am excited to see because. 
like you know, it's it's matchups like these that need to happen more often for these teams. I think just to cr- cross continental tier two clashes, and it's a two match series, kind of more akin to like old school rugby tours like that. I just I love everything about these kinds of matchups, and I, I whoever wins, I just hope it's the better side that wins. I hope we see a bit of justice. If someone gets themselves red carded, they will deserve to lose, and yeah. it could be any of them. Um, so um, I, d- I don't know, but uh, I'll say Russia for for week one at home, and you you're uh, back in Chile. Yeah, just to just to maybe be be smart, maybe maybe. We'll We'll see all the Chilean smarts come to fruition. Yeah. Although I must say the rugby Europe teams tend to be matching up very well against the America teams, as you say. But we're going to move on and look at another tier two clash. I know all of you are wetting the appetites to hear us talk about um, South Africa, England, or France, New Zealand. Well, you can't. You're not allowed. No, you're nobody is allowed to skip the video. You sit through all of these games: Russia, Chile. Now we're on to Romania, Tonga. That's what we're that's what we're going to be talking about. So it's Romania Tonga. Absolutely. That's the game that we're going to preview right now. Yeah. This is in the uh, Arkel de Triomphe in, B- in Bucharest, taking place this Saturday, um, and uh, it's going to be refereed by AJ Jacobs of South Africa, two Scots Ben Blaine and Sam Grove White on the on the touchlines. Ian Tempest will be um, having a stormy session in in the TMO um, uh, box. Yes. Um, and yeah. then uh, in, as far as the color of this game. Tonga have the edge overall, which is unsurprising. The, yeah. the South Sea Island team winning twice in Romania once. Um, pretty pretty but, decent record. A chance for Romania to level that record up. It's it's a the pretty informal guy. Is, is is not in that in that way no. for Tonga. Well, Tonga obviously having had a rough enough tour, uh, including getting pumped by the French Barbarians last week. Um, whereas Romania. Uh, to their credit, they started by beating that Uruguay side who were much touted and had just qualified for the World Cup. They did due diligence and absolutely whooped uh, the Netherlands as well when they were forced to. And yeah, they look in decent stead. They look like they're yeah, a bit of a force now in that uh, that article to triumph after much much to do about uh, about getting getting that uh, that stadium properly available for them to just play in un- unopposed by their own government their own <laughs> sports minister trying to annex it notwithstanding but it seems now that they have a bit of momentum they definitely have a good coaching ticket uh, they seem to have invested and are, are still eyeballing that uh, that World Cup sc- spot that Europe 2 spot that all of these European teams are kind of building towards so they'll be looking to keep keep that momentum going and seal, seal a good home win against what is probably a slightly beleaguered Tonga side um, at this point. No question, no question. I have been very impressed with Romania, um, truly. Yeah. I think they're very well organised. They appear to be really well coached. I think Andy Robinson is unquestionably doing a good job. True. We're just seeing the nuts and bolts of their games coming together. It was kind of, as we referenced in the Russia yeah. game, they started the season with an ill-disciplined kind of nowhere performance against... Um, and besides, uh, they probably are better Russia. then, and were better on, in, in, on paper in that game. And just yet, yeah, they were they were frustrating themselves, and Russia yeah, were punishing them. weren't moving the ball well. We're slow. We're trying to take on these teams in physical battles. Then in, they were kind of blessed a little bit against Spain that the Spanish went and melted down and gave away a million red cards. Yeah, they were only the physical match of that team, but they were blunt enough on offense that it was it. They only managed a six point win in that game when they should have won it by more. Then they come up against Portugal, get absolutely blown away on the defensive end look kind of nowhere and then pull it out with a really a ballsy finish to the game True. where they show where they just Good touch. yeah showed their maul and their and their and their strength and their forwards ability to take control of a game even against a, a like a pack that was not great from Portugal but as we've seen in the month since wasn't all that bad no nope. they absolutely Can't blew them yeah. away in that last 10 minutes um but then since then they've really picked it up they had that great game against Argentina yeah, where they were super where competitive really, yeah. and then they've ha- in this window they've hammered Uruguay really in that second second half 29 to 14 all over them um, uh, and they absolutely put the score up against the Dutch as well and they seem to have like they're solid defensively they have a decent jackal game good scrum more, more backs as yeah, well now yeah exactly I was going to say good scrum good line out mall all of that's still there but they move the ball well. They do. They move the ball well. They've it, got some nice players out was, there. It's was, not the Vlaiku no, team anymore. This is it. Well, I, was, I was reading actually about Vlaiku. Vlaiku uh, and a couple of his compatriots who, who obviously didn't make the squad for this most recent window. And this most recent window was the first squad that didn't include, because of not including him, members of the under 20s side from 05. Um, that was, that was, they were the, the last dream team, team. The dream team of 05. Yeah. <laughs> that, they, that they produced a lot of their talent and the spine of that old team was kind of that. And Vlaiku yeah. obviously is their top point scorer, top caps, a, a legend of their game, but has, has since moved on and has opened the door for a slightly more exciting young backline that that is is starting to purr a little bit in some of these games and starting to kind of add strings to yeah. the bow. They're they're looking quite a well balanced unit. Tamani yeah. Viavasa midfield is yeah. great, and the back three is class as well. Onutu and Dumitru just 
each of them grabbing a try a week. Yeah. And uh, Malinte, Malinte from fullback has slam and kicks, yeah, moving the ball. It. He's taken yeah, that, yeah. that Laiku role of just, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a member of the back line. I kick the threes. And, and he's another yeah. quick guy as yeah. well. They're, they're speed out there is really encouraging. They're starting to score prettier tries. That's it. Just more week. variety to their yeah. try score. It's often a critique of slower teams that, like, and to be honest, Ireland, as, as Ireland fans, we've mm. been guilty of it a fair few times, is that, like, the picture of all your tries is very similar and they're all hard graft and all very narrow and you don't really grab cheap cheap tries out wide with your speed and um, Romania are starting to find some of those tries and there has been space uh, that uh, Tonga have been leaving obviously Tonga have been outmatched in, in all of their games this is their first time facing a tier 2 side in quite a while since their World Cup qualifiers over the summer and they've like all, all of this autumn campaign has just been spent I suppose maybe they outranked the French Barbarians but not really and they were no, pumped no way um, no. Um, and they got, they got well beaten they by did. them yeah. um, it's easy to look at Tonga in that regard and say they're, they're, they're struggling but obviously, you know, we don't they, know. They, 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 yeah, yeah, they they were they were completely outmatched in the games they've had to play, and obviously they have a limited deck to choose from as well. Yeah. So in that sense, it's stacked against them. In the way, in some ways, it's stacked for them. I think we forget, like in in our watching of rugby Europe, just like and in the same sense that the European sides have had a decent dominance over the American sides. The South Sea Island sides have always dominated the European yeah, sides. It's true. Every time they've met, it's been all South Sea Island absolutely dominating the yeah. contacts, shocking them. You can see um, that. It was only Fiji, Fiji oh, Georgia yeah, is the, the kind of flagship thing G- of that. G- yeah. Georgia managed to break the um, the spell of Samoa and Tonga themselves only in about like 2015 yeah, kind of yeah, era. Yeah, That's yeah. when they started to get a handle on those teams and win tight enough games. And yeah. they do usually now beat Samo and Tonga. Yeah. They don't beat Fiji. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of a telling, that's a telling enough thing. And you know, Georgia are obviously the big dogs of Europe. Romania are a little step down below them. But it would be, it, it would be, it's going to be, I think, a, a decent litmus test for how, how much the tournament is coming on. Yeah. Because I think Romania, listen, they're flying high. They're, they have all the momentum they have a healthy squad they're, at they're as well stocked as they can be and Tonga by cr- contrast are just a hodgepodge of talented players yeah. but they're just thrown the tongue, together the demoralised over the last number of weeks and as vulnerable as you can imagine they'll be so the odds couldn't be more stacked in Romania's favour and it'll be interesting to see if they can get the job done and if, if Tonga can just find some class well, plays with it. some of their class yeah, well, players Tonga do have some class Tusa players Bayanu, and, like, if, if Fafidas look good as well yeah. like they have a few Fafidas in their squad I was talking about the one on the wing but yeah. uh, Walter Fafid I believe but uh, yeah they have some serious units and they will be encouraged that they're facing a, a team that is on their level on their tier tier 2 clash here they don't have to go into a, an egregious mismatch they don't have to kid out in in England against a team that's like bulling up and, and purring up to get ready to face the spring box and they're just going to hose you on the way to that um, yeah no they don't have to be in for that kind of contest at all it'll be interesting to see how emotional they are at the beginning obviously they'll have their own kind of kibi kibi or not kibi I think it's the sippy tau, sippy tau in Tonga um, yeah so they'll I'll see how emotionally charged they are in front, front of that away crowd which like they do get good noise in that uh, Arco de Triumph it'll be should be a fun atmosphere and yeah for some of those collisions can be one like, like Romania a very competent pack Tonga are just very massive men yeah and, um, and that's always been what's happened to yeah. these big European teams is that the explosive nature of of the South Sea Island contacts has shocked them a little. Yeah. The fact that they just put sort of mean, dynamic footwork into their physical carries, yeah. where your your Georgians and your Romanians are more, of an, more an honest barrel chest into you, that yeah. you know it's physical and you find it hard to stop, but it's more of a sort of a grinding physicality. There's kind of an explosive pointiness to the... Yeah, yeah there's exactly right. Yeah. There's a pop to the tongue and carries and the tongue and tackles yeah. at times that can shock yeah, a team of, like Romania. The tongue and tackles over the years have been absolute <laughs> chiropractic maneuvers yeah, more yeah. than anything else like they are they are the biggest of those big South Sea Island uh, peoples they are massive men like you look at Big Ben Tammy Funa who is a tight head for them as well like you try and shift him Romania had good purchase at the scrum against tier 2 sides but he's you, try and, you try try to move, move him he's I don't know <laughs> he's yeah. just yeah, crazy <laughs> if he can hold himself up you're not moving him yeah it's um, true. Yeah. Every now and then he has the explosivity to carry as well. You're not tackling him either. No, he puts yeah. it in. He'll, he'll gas himself out if he carries like it too much, but yeah. uh, he can be a, a right handful. And yet, like, they, they'll need to arrive knowing that this is a good chance to arrest some of that uh, momentum and try and do right by Tom. I'm sure that they'll be, they're a very proud people always, and they tend to rock up to things like World Cups at a fever yeah. pitch. They tend to overperform more than their, their uh, South Sea Island prep. Uh, compatriots at World Cup certainly certainly than Samoa um, yeah. and, and, and this side has been together for a few weeks now yeah there's they, they should hopefully they're, they'd be well rested as well they didn't play um, although I suppose they played the Barbarians they last did. week but I mean 
I think they're I think they're probably in a position where they can they can have figured I would hope some stuff out as far as offensive and defensive systems and put together a competitive performance here against a tough Romania team. But um, as far as who's going to win, I I again I'm kind of between minds on I it. I am between um, minds. I think I'll say Romania. I've been very impressed by Romania. I would be. I think I'm leaning the same way to be honest. Yeah, like it would be it would be amazing to see Tonga just rock up and be like free to play a game that they're competitive in at this level and just show what they um, can do maybe yeah, yeah, but yeah. I wasn't fully impressed with them even in those Samoa games over the summer when they were facing that uh, Samoan team that was a little bit hodgepodge itself and then they were well outmatched uh, and I think they're just they worn down the amount of punishment they've taken over the last few weeks whereas yeah. Romania flying high I think yeah the home side has the edge in this one is, is my prediction I think but it'll be tight a, for a time tight for a time I think it might be around a 10 point or maybe even 10 to 15 point win for Romania yeah I'd say I mean. a little narrower than that alright like yeah. I would predict it could be one of those three all at half time could be that too games. yeah it could be a you know, snowy yeah, game well, it, it depends on whether know. or not Romania um, can actually get some purchase on the offensive end because they've been quick but they've been physically on top in those games true. that they've been quick yeah, yeah. and like as much as they could dominate Uruguay and that was impressive they're yeah, not going to dominate the Tongans in the easily. same physicality then, no, like oh, if, if they can, if Tonga can get Fafita 1v1 on that wing it'll mm, be you know yeah, yeah. tough stopping him it, um, it, it remains to be seen if, if Val Vasa is as good as he's looked and can like open up this Tongan defence and maybe he can because he's looked awesome yeah. and if he, he if he gets some of that own South Sea Island juju going and, and starts breaking up the game then they do have wingers who can finish and that's where you could see them maybe pad the score a little yeah. bit but I don't see Tonga scoring too many tries you know maybe two max I would think yeah, maybe. so I think it's going to be like a, a, a slow burner of a game that maybe two tries to one Romania okay yeah, yeah yeah fair call fair call let us know what you think who you got if you have any Romanians or Tongans down there drop it in the comments below but uh, I think with that we are going to move on to another Absolutely. game Georgia versus Fiji, the Lelos versus the Flying Fijians. Uh, when when last we previewed it, we built it as rugby's ultimate clash of styles, and it definitely is. It is the tier two answer to All Black Springboks. Um, it's just a fantastic game whenever you whenever they take the field because they are two up and coming sides, two sides for whom it's their national sport. They live and breathe it, but two sides who couldn't be more diametrically opposed in how they approach the game in terms of from their fundamentals onwards their work-ons are completely different their style is completely different but they are two great tier two sides with a great uh, tradition in the game and it is just exciting to see them meet more and more often in in these kinds of games uh, it's going to be in a neutral ground it's in spain i believe uh, arunia's uh, stadio de delite de um, right. um, Arun arunia is just a, a, a a suburb in the south of Madrid. Yes, um, yeah, yeah. part of the metropolitan area, I guess, but it's a, a little area of about sixty thousand seats. It's kind of a weird place to have the game. It's a ways off the center of Madrid, yeah, yeah. but hopefully, I, I, I'm going to assume that there is a decent rugby bubble around there, and that they're going to get good bums on seats because Spanish rugby is being treated to quite a test here that they get to put on. I'm not quite sure why it's in Spain, but it is. Yeah, and hopefully, it's good show and uh, and and the crowd get out and support it because this is a good one. I hope so. Yeah, no, definitely uh, Saturday as well. So Super Saturday comes thick and fast. This one's a 3.30 kickoff local time, which is 2.30 GMT. Um, and uh, yeah, it's going to be ref by James Dolman of New Zealand with Ben O'Keefe of New Zealand and uh, Gianluca Necchi of Italy uh, on the sidelines with Stefano Penne of Italy also uh, in the TMO box. Two Kiwis, two Italians in it. Um, yeah, they couldn't get a Frenchman or anything to ref uh, Georgia. No. Yeah, the, Fiji, the, the, the Georgians wouldn't be a huge fan of the Kiwi refs, I wouldn't have thought, but no. probably better than an Aussie ref in this instance. A little better than an um, Aussie ref, but yeah. I think it's still slight. If you're going to take anything from the referee appointment, I think slight advantage Fiji in yeah, terms well, of, you know, he'll want to play play on, he'll want to say, he'll, don't he'll, disrupt the halfback. He'll, he'll, he'll like say, Fiji, bo Fiji yeah. ball a little more than he likes Georgia yeah. ball, perhaps. Um, you're not wrong in the sense that you say this is a true clash of styles. Um, however, both of these sides have come a lot closer to the other um, than they would have been during that last billing when it was the true clash of stars, when it was slow, deliberate, scrummaging Georgia who wanted to spend 10 minutes scoring a try and wear you down while doing it and fast Fiji who could score from everywhere but were perhaps a little yeah, loose on the we've inside seen, we've seen Fiji, Fiji are, in the are, tight are much better than yeah. they were their defensive acumen improved their scrummaging acumen their mole acumen all better than it was that day perhaps and, yeah. and in that tournament and uh, Georgia found themselves some some nice new backs uh, guys like Nini Ashvili out wide uh, in Taylor Webs and Dadza they have a guy who's maturing day by day in the top of tours as well really good 10 good and kicking it's actually game now, all of the a battle of two of the better 10s you'll see in tier 2 rugby obviously Adj McGinty for the US 
when you see him out there. But Ben Volavola and uh, and Tato Absendadze, two really good level tens uh, yeah. in this one, which is unusual for a tier two clash. Yeah, it's gonna be. Um, it's gonna be. It's gonna be a very intriguing game. Both of these sides have developed their game since we last saw them meet, and. Um, it's definitely a bit, I think you would make Fiji favourites on the evidence of what happened last week. They blew blew away a tier one side um, for most of that game, and were very unlucky uh, to find themselves fifteen points adrift by the end. It was discipline only that kept Wales in that game, True. and both um, of them are coming off performances where discipline will be a big talking point for them. No each question. of them in the thing because it did cost them dearly in games that they were both competitive in. Like Georgia, were looking, were mixing it with France very well in the middle third and in large periods of that game, yeah. and they had grabbed a nice try too. And um, just in in terms of the history of this clash, as as we build it, the ultimate clash of styles, it's only happened four times. Yeah, um, we need to see more of these games. Um, Fiji hold a three and one winning record overall. Um, their first meeting was in Tbilisi in 2012. Uh, Fiji won that one 24 19. Uh, second was in Suva, and the Lelos won that one 14 3. And the last two meetings b- between the PNC and uh, and the World Cup as well are uh, Fiji wins. You know, Fiji have been. PNC, ex- yeah, and they, 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 they played in the Automation Cup. So actually, so it's, it's yeah. now 4 four and 1 for Fiji, um, for Fiji in favour yeah, of it. And, and momentum they, has been good for them. They have been. Knocking up, notching up wins where where in in France last time uh, Georgia will feel aggrieved and did feel aggrieved at the referee. We saw a couple of years ago Fiji rock up to Paris and do a number on yeah, France. Yeah. So Fiji probably a little bit ahead of Georgia in their development. Like Fiji arguably yeah. in tier one level already in terms of caliber. Near um, enough, yeah. They pre- they pretty much are. They, 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 sometimes just their own mentality and their own mistakes can hold them back when they are a team that that can well mix it in the physical and talent. Uh, pools um, from Georgia's point of view obviously um, they're, they're, they're at a nice place I think mental mentality wise I think we had called for a shift when they play this sort of the bigger teams yeah. to not be you know too respectful too different yeah exactly not, yeah. Not, not be reactive and be proactive and look to take the game to their opposition and they have certainly dialed in that and they've also dialed in a more rounded game I think yeah. they're they're becoming students of the game over there. They do obsess over it and love it. And if you, actually, if you search around, you can see like Georgian language YouTube shows, not dissimilar to ours, yeah. going out talking about the game. I mean, it, it is their national sport, and they've had to do some reflecting on whether their natural talents of the sort of wrestling and the old school Lalos is going to be enough in this game to mix with it. And I think they know that it's not. They, they needed to develop a kicking game. They needed to be more proactive on the defensive they end. more speed They needed the more line. speed, exactly. Yeah. They needed to move the ball and add all sorts of elements and strings to the to their bow. And they've done a wonderful job, really, in the last couple of years. You talk about teams that have kicked on since the World Cup. Georgia's won. Georgia, yes, certainly yeah. one, of the, one of the more impressive out there. Um, they were all over the place at the World Cup. They were one-dimensional. They were slow. They were defensively reactive. Yeah, they were physical um, with the ball and not so physical without the ball, which yeah. is a very frustrating watch when you look at the massive men they were. They were doing soft hits and stuff, and ultimately they got torn apart by Fiji when that fixture Correct. came around. Yeah, yeah, um, and, and and they did lose heavily last year to Fiji, and they still get a little shocked by the, the level of physicality, as we talked about with the Tonga-Romania game, yeah. the pop that Fiji put into those shots and those contacts. Yeah. The Georgian backs particularly yeah. don't deal with that well but in the last year we've seen them develop a very good defence we saw them in, in, in moments against France go through sets of multiple phases maintaining their width getting out of the line being disciplined enough and then making tackles although it's important to note that virtually every one of those sets ended in a penalty against them yeah. harshly or unharshly like when they go for a jacko they'd be called they'll have to be dialed into the refereeing yeah. whether it's unfair or not they cannot allow themselves to be in that situation where they get whistled off the park they have to take just a little step off their defence yeah. they're not a major blitzing team anyway they're a contact and then soak and then slow up and then contest the ball yeah. team they'll have to do that with a bit more discipline but primarily stepping up on defence maintaining their width and then making their one-on-one tackles and beating, winning their one-on-one matchups is going to be huge yeah. Kvesa Ladza at 13 huge job against yeah, yeah, he was brilliant in the Autumn Nations Cup last yeah. year, but he's, he's obviously he's kind of stalled a little bit in terms of form since yeah. then at 13, but they do have other resources there. Yeah, more proactive D is what they'll definitely need in terms of their Fiji matchup and the history, the more recent history in that game. Can't be standoffish, need to kind of get up in the face, need to tackle man and ball, be physical in all of those those contacts. It starts with defence, because like, if you can't defend them, they will find themselves at a loss for for school. keeping keeping There's no winning a shootout with, keeping yeah, pace yeah. with Fiji in a shootout is just a no go so the defense has to be a primary factor so to the set piece they were unable in the world cup to make 
uh, their scrum count. Their scrum didn't actually do as well in the World Cup as it had done traditionally. No. Um, it is a traditional strength of theirs. Fiji, Fiji have improved in that area themselves and yeah. are massive men. It will be tough, especially with a Kiwi ref who will be telling them to use it every time it gets to the back regardless. Yeah, but um, they, but they, 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 they should be trying to edge they'll, that set. They'll get some honest reward if they do scrum as well. What I will say is that the, the backup um, props of Gogachashvili and uh, Japaridze last week who came on did win comfortably the battle against the French replacements, yeah. which is quite it's a like quite not easy to do. French do yeah. scrum. Cyril Bai now he did a job on Melikidza. Melikidza was was conceding pens at that scrum. He had a rough day of it, mm-hmm. but in the second half, Georgia were winning scrums and they were moving backwards against a good French scrum. That's positive, and I wonder if they might go for 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 that combination to start the game. I, sure. I would hope that, that we don't have the squads as we are now, but I would hope that they'd be involved significantly in the game in some True. way. Yeah, because yeah, yeah they, you're right; they will need the set piece edge. They will. Yeah. It's need the line out mall to be working as well. Because Fiji yeah. couldn't defend Wales's line out mall last week, and yeah. Georgia have a very effective mall when they get the line out right. Uh, they need to kind Their of line branch it better. Last it week. has. They've been bold in terms of going for things like th- going to jump at three and stuff, where that was what was one of the lessons they learned. Not just in the World Cup but the Autumn Nations Cup was like if you're going to mall don't slowly walk up to the five metre line and telegraph that you're going to jump a two and allow Wokey or whomever anyone to just pinch it very easily off you yeah. by being that telegraphed and that slow and they have mixed it up there's more deception to their line out now and they can kind of set up malls from different angles that will be an in for them uh, I did see Vern, Car- Vern Cotter Fiji coach kind of reporting in from uh, from overseas obviously he's still way back in, in Fiji or but he was still checking in on their progress and suggesting what uh, he might expect from Georgia saying that the last time out they tried to kind of run at them try and go gung-ho that's right and, yeah. uh, and that they will probably learn those lessons and go back mm. to a tighter game plan that's certainly what Fiji are expecting from Georgia I think that will be the first port of call but ultimately you do want to find guys like Kavesel adds in a bit of space guys yeah, like Nini Ash really need to get t- some time on the yeah, ball t- t- um, tighter doesn't necessarily need to be you know slow and one dimensional no. like uh, we saw last week one of their most promising offensive sets the one that ended in the Lobson Dadza try was pretty dynamic and it had good involvement from Shara Kadza and yeah. it's kind of on Tato and um, uh, uh, Lobson Dadza to um, make sure that their runners are have multiple options to them. Becca uh, Gorgadza was giving a lovely tip on pass. He was yeah, tipping on some nearly of the, every some thing of the be, footballing um, qualities of, of him specifically, but their back row yeah, yeah. forwards are great. They, they, they um, had good, yeah, they had good misdirection as to where the ball were going. And actually, one, once or twice, Gorgadza, because the French defense were starting to dial in. Hey, this guy's tipping the ball on every time. You would love to see him tuck and run, yeah. and they do need to mix that in. But the little options, the the forwards running off one another, trying to overload the Fijian defense, and basically not allowing the Fijians to line up a tackle and smash yeah. you but yeah. instead kind of catching them on the edge winning little contacts on the inside then Shara Kadza picking a hard line on the inside gaining those inroads in, in kind of the middle in those bust up plays needs to be in large part what their offence is checking the Fijian line speed and giving a little more space to Tato um, and then he can kind of read the game and see yeah, what he see sees he wants whether to it's time yeah, to pump the ball long yeah, or watch, what you, what you want to do don't, certainly don't want to snap it out wide too quickly because like no. Nike Alevu was defending like a monster again with the Wales could not get to the Wales, edge against they them they couldn't so yeah, guys against like, 14 of them yeah guys like Vessel Adza might be frozen out a little bit like you'd have to be the timing has to be absolutely right and they have yeah. to be sat down with a few hard earned yards before you can even think about going as wide as that but ultimately you do want to get Nini Ashvili involved and you do want to try and execute on the wings once that hard graft is, yeah. is done Tabak like, Sadze you know, not getting too many headlines but scoring tries scoring routinely, good tries yeah, yeah. yeah this is it yeah, yeah. find him on the edge if they can earn it they can uh, they can try and squeeze some uh, some points out of them over there but uh, yeah it's a big ask for these Georgians and it's one that they will be targeting as far as a game because they feel like they are on a level to compete with Fiji it's just unfortunate that like when Fiji they are like, taking well, up when, level well, when they when, well, the other thing is like when Georgia play their best game possible like it'll still probably be a bit of a scrap with Fiji ultimately just given the nature of their team whereas mm. when Fiji play well and Georgia are a bit off yeah. the pace the score will blow out and that's the way yeah. it is well, just they, by they, style I guess they're um, kind of hoping as well on the other on the other side of the spectrum that they meet like f- there is the schizophrenic nature of Fiji like they're true. hoping they meet the Fiji that played in Spain the last time yeah. that rocked up to Madrid a little dialed out and went 10-0 down and wasn't even paying attention as opposed to the very dialed in we're going to catch you Wales Fiji that played last weekend End where they yeah. were just awesome yeah um that's definitely yeah there's definitely a look element to what fiji you do get and from fiji's point of view i think they do they do feel an air of confidence in this game they should um, yeah they, they've the recent record has been good it was yeah. tight it was tight in the early goings of 20 like 12 through 16 when these teams were meeting but in the years since fiji have kicked on to another level seemingly and georgia are, are holding on to their coattails and trying to come along with them like they're both yeah. progressing 
but uh, but Fiji look really good and looked yeah. really really good last week and they just it's their physical the fact that they have the innate power to not be shocked not only not be shocked but to actually shock the Georgians themselves just gives them that edge whereby they can back their ball skills to get them over the line even in a stuttery stop start performance if the ball bounces it's kind of not dissimilar to what you saw Ireland v the All Blacks in that like like for for the the Irish to win they had to put in an 80 minute showing of such accuracy and such ferocity and yet when the ball did break it was try time for the other side and that could be a dynamic here of like a lot of huff and puff from Georgia they want to soak it they want to put pressure on with their blitz and their aggressive line speed that they've developed generate a turnover and then go yeah. transition play is just what killed them in the World Cup game particularly was just that transition play they were able to swallow them up with their defence and then pounce yeah. on the counter caught them on the edge off, off like yeah. things like restarts as well yeah. when the Georgians were just begging for a ruck to happen and yeah. Fiji were like I don't know no, let's, no, see, maybe, what, let's maybe, see maybe, maybe there's something over here on, I think Radradra's yeah. over yeah. there yeah. Um, so, they yeah, don't yeah. have a Radradra this time but they do have the likes of Tui Sova um, yeah. very very exciting players Tui Sui I thought was great on the weekend um, and uh, Tui Suvu the fullback what about that little play that he yeah. did um, setting up the uh, setting up the drive for Naya and um, they've got some wonderful ballers great quality, great quality. Um, and some good halfbacks well. yeah, Lomani well. and Volvola playing they played a brilliant game in Cardiff they completely outmanaged the game on the Welsh halfbacks it was, it yeah. was just for those cards that uh, otherwise they would have put in a winning showing and just their, their strength in the contact zone was so incredible encouraging both yeah. in, in like not not just last week but in general over Although, against tier two t- tier one teams yeah. they've looked good in the contact in recent Although times it, it might be true that, that Georgia would have beat, would have won the contact against that Wales team as well might have been this too, is probably yeah. a more physical Georgian team than the Wales team that played last Certainly, week whatever, yeah, or whatever pitch them. that they took um, to yes that they, was true yeah you it's it's if, for, for, from Fiji's point of view you're absolutely right if they can front up if they can not give the Georgians the ins at the set piece that they're looking for yeah. they'll fancy winning this game they'll yeah. think they'll have more to more strings to their bow and they'll fancy their defense to take like it's a it's a more positive offense than they have had and they do have to be mindful of, of the, the footwork that sharp cads is putting in and also just the quality of the back rowers of course yeah. the dynamism of those guys it is a challenge yeah. to stop well, them, the danger is getting outworked if yeah. you could turn up lazy and, and like like when when you see a fighter lose a fight from just being outworked and not throwing punches probably yeah. and just kind of plodding around the ring they are guilty of some of that sometimes when they just are dialed out but uh, but they will still be confident even if they go down or things don't go their way for a period of possession that their purple patches will count a lot more on the scoreboard than Georgia's purple patches which is tends to have been how this game has got has played out Georgia do kind of mix it with them even in those blowout games kind of get some stuff off for a little bit but aren't haven't thus far been able to execute well enough mm. on the backside of it to uh, to put scores on the board and when it gets a little loose out wide and turnover happens Fiji just make them pay yeah um, although I'm going to say go on from my prediction point of view I'm going to say that this Georgian team is better at executing than any Georgian team that has come before that's true and hence they do find tries and maybe they do find a Fiji team that's not quite at the same pitch that they were last week and that they do turn them over oh, I'm going to say yeah the back in the Georgians I think it'll be a good game I think there'll be Fiji tries I think there'll be Georgia tries and I'll say it's going to be yeah, an absolute barn burner game of the weekend 25-22 to the Georgians in the end that's seeing it home that's a great old game I'm in their corner Shane it. somebody needs it. to be I am yeah. I'm um, thinking closer <laughs> somewhere in the range of 38-24 ah that's the same game they played last time that's that's the same score as the game they played in the All Nations Cup 38-24 well that's probably why I'm thinking yeah it. No, um, get out of here with that that's a terrible call okay I'll, can't just say, I'll, say, I'll say 40-20 a 20 point win for Fiji no in, a, in a good game the Georgians will never concede 40 again Shane that I was would the last hope, time against France that I would, was the last time yes, it's I would hope that that is true and yeah. to be fair it can go either way I can see it going away it, one of the swaying factors is the fact that Dolman is the man with the whistle I think like George, yeah. like we're seeing a lot with South Africa complaining about refs and all Razzygate and stuff and like <laughs> no one gets harsher treatment than no Georgia no one gets harsher treat- treatment than Georgia but they get they the bring, harsh, they they get the some harsh treatment the same for the same reasons that South Africa not entirely there are other things with South Africa obviously but uh, but the, the primary reason that a ref will seemingly get on top of you in a game isn't necessarily bias against your country or anything like that it's generally a rugby based thing yeah. like if a wallaby is looking at you making putting your hands in every every rook or scragging a nine yeah. they'll pin you for it like they don't like teams that want to slow it down and make it physical which is what Georgia do and as such which is why I'd love to see a, Fran- a French ref ref their game because he would at least look at the scrum like I'm we watched it all last week yeah. when they got a dominant scrum they, 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 either the wallaby or the kiwi or the, 
the, the Aussie with the whistle was just saying use it or, or pinning them and I'm sure this weekend Dolman will be the same I think any time a ball yeah. is at the back even if the, the scrum is yeah. being monstered it'll just be use it the ball's there use it it and might it be just, the case that Georgia like to be truly competitive just need one or two edges and they're not getting like you want to see them play at home with yeah. a ref that's not that's not that way inclined they yes. seem to always have the southern hemisphere refs yeah um, whereas with, with, with a an big, good northern sure, hemisphere yeah, yeah. ref and then a, a, a game at home in Georgia that might tip the scales enough to make them truly competitive and maybe pull off a win um, but as it is um, yeah you're probably right on the balance that Fiji will win but I'm still thinking you're going to give Georgia the punt I think it's as you said a great game who do yeah. you got let us know down below who's going to win this ultimate clash of styles as we build it between two of our favourite Tier 2 teams that are, are fast coming, closing the gap uh, on behalf of Tier 2 with the rest of Tier 1 and kind of, kind of dragging the rest with them. Being an example for either kind of mould, you can kind of emulate Fiji in your in your progressions, you can emulate Georgia in your progressions, yeah. but they are flying a flag in Tier 2, so it's great to see that contest happen again. No question. Um, with that, we're going to move on. And we're going to look now at, well... If it's not the game of the weekend, I don't know what is. It um, is. We have a repeat of the World Cup final, England against the Springboks, taking place at Twickenham in London, 3.15 local kickoff um, in the afternoon. Andrew Brace, the man with the whistle, big job for him this yeah. week. It's as big a game as I remember him having, and hopefully he's up to the task yeah. and keeps the pace of the game good. Angus Gardner and Frank Murphy are the AORs, and Brian McNeese of the IRFU again in the TMO. Yeah. So... Irish officiating of this England Springbok game. Um, I guess they figure we're biased enough against both. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. Neutral all that. tries chalked off. Yeah, um, everything but, uh, is crossing, guys. Sorry, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. sorry. No, don't no. think that one counts either. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, this is obviously um, this is obviously the crescendo of quite a bit of a, of, of of media um, chat as well as everything oh, else. Oh yeah. Well, there was a fair um, bit of color that I had it based on the history, and I will run through it. But obviously, it's been marked by the whole Razi situation yeah. this week that has coined like it's. It's funny that it didn't happen like next week when they because they, they had that ruling a few weeks ago they could have like released it after any well they had the hearing and now yeah. they have, now they have the ruling but we'll get into that a little later we anyway will. in the show if you're interested in seeing it on the main show it's at the end in our rugby news of the That's week right. segment but at the time being we're going to just look at the rugby and as you say um, it's been a it's been a colorful history between these two sides the Springboks as the Southern Hemisphere teams do have the edge overall with a with a record of twenty six to fifteen. Um, but it's actually honestly been more dominant than that. True. England had a real run of games against them in the Clive Woodward era around the turn of the century right. when the Springboks were kind of nowhere yep. um, and England were one of the best, if well, not the best team in the on world. On their way to winning the um, World Cup at that yeah, stage. Yeah. Had, had on their way to going to um, uh, New Zealand and winning tours there. They yeah. were that good, that Woodward team back in the day. True. Um, but since November 2006, when the Springboks got a record, uh, got a win against England, um, it's been just one way traffic really it's 14-3-1 is the Bok record since then yeah. um, and uh, obviously the, uh, the last time they met was that 12-11 game with the Farrell shoulder gate in That's Twickenham right. which was yes. I think their they, it, they, they first time, the first and only time that Razi uh, since Razi took over the Springboks went to Twickenham yeah. and that'll definitely be a point that they're it also prompted to, another, and another, they another little write. barb at World Rugby didn't it he was posting that video of the tackle bag thing of like one of their <laughs> back rollers leathering a tackle bag with good technique and going like no no Shoulder higher, <laughs> <laughs> perfect. <laughs> like he's always had a had a, had a, a niggle to him. It's he's never true. he's never been a lover of the powers that be. No, it's true. Um, but um, yeah, it's a it's definitely a, a colorful game. And we're going to start just looking at it from the point of view of the hosts, England, um, and they have named their their team this week. And I think there's no headline bigger um, than the fact that uh, Marcus Smith has the has the reins of this offense in a big game. Yes, he does. And, and he has some good units either side of him to help him out. It's it's exciting. It's exciting because he he was on that. He came up on that uh, Lions tour as well. Obviously, his after his like monumental rise last season, and he was well earned. And uh, yeah, he played a decent game in what was a terrible game last week against the Wallabies. He kind of found the the moment of the match was the try that that he kind of set up with a nice pass. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to see him getting the reins uh, fully here. Obviously, yeah, Farrell has actually been forced out through injuries. So that kind of made that decision for them. But, uh, yeah, excited to see how he goes. But uh, he's not alone in that England squad. They do have other other units that perhaps he won't even be the deciding factor, as is often the case in these box, box games. For England, you have Bevan Rod, Jamie Blamier, and Kyle Sinclair up front and the, fr- the starting front row. 
big big test for those guys like yeah. they need to be locking down Sinker obviously went down very early in that World Cup final so we didn't get to see mm. after his great vein of form how he stacks up against Springbok scrummaging um, and obviously like fresh cup guys like Bevan Rod and Jamie Blamier very inexperienced green. very yeah. green they do have on the bench I think they have Marler to come in and uh, hoping for and the Marler Stewart Gigi. and Nick Dolly as well is another front row but they'll be facing up against those monsters that the box have and it's yeah. curious to see how they go with that they do have Maro Toji and Johnny Hill which is their heftiest yeah, of locking they're, they're back, their back five is strong let's yeah. be real it's very it's strong the same back five um, that they had in the last game as well yeah. with Courtney Laws captain from six uh, Tom Curry at eight and Underhill at seven very good pack um, generally just very yeah. very good pack but it is as big a test as any pack will ever have yeah, to face and, and they've gone 6-2 again themselves they, uh, they've they gone uh, Sam Simmons and Alex Dombrandt so yeah. they've both two big barnstorming number eights to bring on if they need them yeah. um, and they and Charlie Yule's an absolute unit as well and they're hoping that the Marler Juju um, and his just he is a remarkably wily scrummager he like he, he's a he bit is. like a, a, a Castro Giovanni at loose head yes. style player where he just finds a way yeah. finds a way to make it a mess against any scrum yeah. and um, so yeah, I definitely have to do against Koch though, he will right? yeah, he yeah. will but I mean I think he's done it before yeah, against yeah, Koch Saris in a Saris stuff, context yeah, yeah. like he, he does mix it just Joe Marler and they'll be hoping that he can do something similar again yeah. um, but I mean the real question for me like there's, it's such a conundrum that it's the question that's been probably the most asked in, in media and certainly English media over the last year is what how do you beat South Africa yeah. um, and I think we've seen it done exactly once I mean the New Zealand model is no model to follow yes. lose in every area of the pitch and then be just unfathomably clinical yeah. and somehow win the game that yes. way and just by, not you get three chances you score three tries ha ha and then hustle the rest yeah. of the game I think the Australia game is probably where you saw your best chance at some inroads. And yeah. the way that they managed to, first and foremost, they managed to kind of shock Dale Indy yeah. in the contact Occupy through Karevi. Yeah, yeah. um, they, they, they blasted them back on the inside and then from there kept the tempo of the game so high that the box couldn't reset without being offside. Yeah. Froze guys like Am out yeah. of Am and his read out of the game yeah. because it was a discombobulated defence. You've already occupied the inside defenders who, last yeah. game it was Etzebeth shooting, but generally it's been... Um, uh, Quagga in the yeah. absence of Peter Steph occupying that inside blitz uh, Dale Indy being the rock in the middle and Am shutting down the outside how do you occupy them we saw Scotland try with creativity to find the outside somewhat prematurely sometimes yeah, uh, yeah no they have with their selection they've indicated that it is that, that Australian model you're looking at like obviously Marcus Smith we were saying is at 10 Manu Tuolagi returns to his rightful place at 12 in this England side with Henry Slade outside him and you can see Tuolagi is is in a good mould to try and do a Karevi impersonation, although he was on the field in that World Cup final and he was bullied too. Yeah. He's actually lost weight since then and Dale Indy's a big unit as well. It's a, it's yeah, a tough task for all of these guys. run sharp and yeah. hard and into Dale Indy and try and, and win that contact. And then the other thing that they have to do, and I think the, the absence of Jamie George is such a blow in this regard, yes. yeah. is that, into that like what we saw with Ireland against the All Blacks, the interplay between forwards, such a valuable part of the inside yeah. offence. You want to give them um, different looks, give guy, yeah. get guys over the gain line by being deceptive, kind of, you can milk a few penalties for a box over committing and smashing the wrong man and you may have to take a hit for it but you'll get a penalty um yeah yeah but I, i'd like i'm just looking at the, the the pack at the moment and i'm hoping that it, it, it can be that it can be explosive enough to open up that space yeah on because it is it is in that that scene between quagga and am or whoever's on the outside from the Bok pack rushing and um, yeah. um, that you can find your inroads if you kind of blast through that contact and then from there keep the pace of the game so high that the box are up naturally, they're caught offside and then you got like a little bit of space and time for Marcus Smith to find the right pass to open them yeah. up. And we saw the Wallabies do that to great effect and all of a sudden those binary code tries conceded actually they conceded I think three or four in, in each did. of those tests yep. um, it was it was mighty impressive stuff from the Wallabies and it showed a way that you can catch them if they're not 100% dialed um, but I'm wondering just from a forward point of view like looking at that pack who's their best ball carrier like are, are any of them really designed to carry it's probably Tom Curry um yeah, or a Toji. <laughs> Toji's a like, again a Toji like carrying. But actually, Blamier has good good turn of heel as well. Sinker yeah. can be decent. I, I mean, on the inside though. No, like, I know. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I, 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 hear I, you. I actually like. Fair, I like Sinker as a pivot. I actually like what um, they have on the bit. They have Don Brandt, obviously as you alluded to, but uh, Sam Simmons is there as well. So mm. if they have managed to do the work to be in the game in that final quarter and stuff, those are guys who can be game breaking in the carry as well. And mm. um, but I do take your point. Yeah, no, they're very, they're yeah, very. It might be a little imbalanced. They're very physical, but maybe slightly imbalanced. How team. are they going to win the ball back uh, properly with uh, with this kind of back row? How are they going to carry 
robust in a robust fashion against what is a frightening yeah. defense. Well, it, it's definitely a back row that can defend. Like That's Sam true. Underhill and Curry have excellent jackal game, and Courtney Laws is a wonderful tackler. True. Like that's that 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 is plainly evident. And also, you got Maro Toji in there. I think you've got the capacity certainly to be miserly with what you give up on the inside to the yeah. likes of Etzebeth. But on the other side of the ball, on the offensive side of the ball. Like it's so important to find a way to get moving against the Springboks so that you don't end up playing their game against them again like so many teams do. Yeah, like they did, um, they very much did in that World Cup final. Yeah. Like they could not buy a contact to save their lives in that in that game. Yeah. And then from there, as we've seen before, and they are still guilty of it, like they have a lovely ideal tempo when they can manage to win a bit of game line and get themselves purring and Marcus Smith is a perfect guy to kind of get that going if they can at all. But shy of that so far, they've been a little stuttery in terms of how they generate anything on the multi-phase once they're kind of being hit very hard in the contact, which doesn't happen very mm. often. They, they match up very well against almost any team in world rugby. Springboks is, is their worst matchup in world rugby because yeah. they like to it was true back then it is still true they like to be bullies they like to lead from the front by winning game like hard and fast that's why the likes of Manu Tuolagi so popular and so yeah. successful for them but you can see mm. when, they, when they meet a pack this is the one instance when they meet a pack that is sometimes meaner than they are and more physical than they are innately and yeah, it doesn't tend to do the English psyche very, very well. No, uh, they they like being bullies. It's the same reason that they they have never lost to Italy, say. Whereas Ireland have recorded a loss to Italy, still in France, and all of these have had yeah. blips. Whereas like when England are confident that they're better than you, oh, they'll rack up a yeah, score, yeah. particularly in Twickenham. But when they're a little bit in doubt of that, as they undoubtedly are, because last time out was the World Cup final and they lost it pretty comprehensively. Um, yeah, it's a tough ask for this pack to to kind of. Yeah. Just to, to play a good, solid game that gets them go forward. It's going to be the, tough for all of them. They will need to win game line. There's no yeah. doubt about that. And they have done, like, <laughs> there's sort of, there's been some videos posted on, like, rugby, rugby pass of them training on the beach, pulling a, a, a big car. Classic and then training, Eddie Jones tra- stuff, yeah, training yeah. in the dark. And, yeah, Eddie Jones is out in the press saying, like, we have to prove to South Africa that we don't have a weak pick. Mm. And all of that is true. They do have to front up. They do have to be physical. Yeah. But Eddie Jones' England, at their best, were always a smart team. Yeah. And they always managed the first 10 minutes of a game, like, when they were at their best, to a T. Yeah. Like, they'd, they'd pin you back, they'd force you to exit in a certain way that set up a line-out, and then they had a perfect plan to unpick yeah, your they defense should, they should go off back that, that line they, they were doing that um, to great effect in that World Cup until they met up with South Africa because like uh, tactically and uh, speaking of, like it, it seems like a good idea to target Vili LaRue in the air which they did off restart but he gobbled every one of them up and it nullified yeah. what had been a great strength which is exactly that pin them into their own corner force mm. a box kick exit that results in a line out to yourselves from we which you have up. a plan that yeah. you've been drafting yeah, three all week four, long five phase yeah. plan to and, and them. we saw them do it to Ireland to great effect we saw yeah. them open that, that semi-final against the All Blacks with exactly that yeah. pin them back generate an offensive line out move the ball win contacts be proactive and speedy and generate that tempo where you, they, the opposition can't lay a glove on you there's constant mystery as to where the ball is going yeah. and all your carry, carries are dynamic and brilliant um, and then ended up getting a score they yeah. did that to pretty much every team obviously they've never done it to the spring box but that very much is, is what this Eddie Jones blueprint is. It's less about just fronting up and being physical. It is about that to some extent, but it's also about being smart and tactically plotting your way, especially at the beginning of the game, through yeah. those opening minutes, and then you know forcing the Springboks to react from there. Yeah, um, and like if you can discombobulate them, you won't need to score a try every play, and if you keep the ball too long in the middle third, South African defense probably will Scotland punish will show you. Yeah, yeah, they probably will punish you. Have you have to pick but your moments. Pick your moments to kick and stuff like that. Like there, there is a kicking game that you can play, and England have a very good attacking kicking game but in the World Cup we saw them not be proactive and they were playing South Africa's attacking kicking game out of ideas in the middle third box kick it up slow tempo game drop mm-hmm. ball scrum lose that scrum like all of that's bad whereas if they are putting some of that deceptive shape on it moving the pill around being uh, both physical and sharp on the offensive line then after a few phases if you don't feel it's coming then drop it on the toe when they're still reeling when the back three is discombobulated mm-hmm. things like 50 22s become an option like they need to like that, that attacking kick to Johnny May I know Farrell's not in it and that's normally his MO but like Johnny May's out there yeah. uh, Marcus Smith will be aware of that um, Joe Martin's no slouch on the other wing as well like um, yeah big big test for, for obviously the, the, that half, new halfback partnership for them and for their very good uh, new full Fullback Freddie Stewart, who has a gr- had a great start to the season and had a great game last week, massive test for him. Like, yeah. I, know, I know Jason Robinson has cited 
that get that opening uh, World Cup pool game, I think in 07, uh, when they got absolutely pumped by them as the toughest task he's ever had at fullback, where you just you train all week, high ball, high ball, you know that it's going to come with an absolute smash every time and you just have to get dust yourself yeah, yeah. up and get back on and he will be introduced to a te- proper top level test match rugby yeah, the te- uh, a week. level of physicality that he's not yet experienced exactly. in the so game. it remains to be seen how he copes same is true of how Marcus Smith does he bounce back up to his feet if he gets smashed by Etzebeth like Russell last week or does he feel a bit ginger and slow down I think he does yeah. I think he bounces back I up think so I really rate Marcus Smith I, I, think, do too. I think he's already rising to the top of the game and here he is in the England 10 shirt didn't even take him that long yeah um, yeah, he's the sky's he, the limit for the kid. Yeah, yeah, for sure. England starting ten barring injury coming into that World Cup, I would think, and going yeah. from strength to strength. Love his mentality, love the style of player he is, but I also think he's he's got some like if in in NFL ways some Mahomesian qualities to yes. him. Like he's yeah. got techers but balls as well. Yeah, and he can pull out a big play. And I'm excited to see him to see him have a rumble against this Springbok defense. True, um, which has been eating teams alive routinely in yeah. the passing game. And certainly, you're right to say that working in the offensive kicking game, if that inside crash isn't working working in probing kicks is definitely a good thing yeah. and catching yeah, yeah catching yeah. them if they're a little if they're if their line is a little high checking their line and yeah. trying to work in some space we saw Scotland have some success with yeah. that we least. know that Marcus um, Smith like Finn Russell has a delicate little chip in him that can expose a blitz defence if they are up up very quick and leaving them, leaving them behind uh, there they get yeah, a bit of heads up footy and a bit of proactivity from them mm. they also like the, the intangible factor that they have is it is in Twickenham the last time mm. they were in Twickenham they did edge it a very tight one as we were saying like it won't take much for this crowd to get right behind them because they desperately want yeah. to beat the spring box so like a few big tackles here a few big jackals there and suddenly yeah, you just have be, a bit of momentum like, uh, like the box are not unbeatable but no. they are very 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 tough but yeah, like it, it, you it, need the extra man and it involves a bit of positive play to get them from a murmur to a proper raucous roar yeah. um, and it's been a long season for the box it's their last game you can make them feel tired if you can start to get that Twickenham squeeze going that is so very much their MO no yeah. question and you can beat this Bok team as well while losing many matchups with them I yeah. think is, is one of the other interesting facts about that's them like true. And that's, we that's, saw that's, Scotland, a, fact, that's um, a fact that England have not been able to expose no. other teams are better like Wales yeah. Wales are great at that like sure. lose a load of matchups and still be in the game by yeah. a score um, exactly as yeah. they did again earlier in, <laughs> in, like, England yeah, tend yeah. to get discouraged but um, it, like we saw with Scotland last week in the opening 10 minutes I mean blown away at the scrum blown away at the line out blown away in, in the contact area but hustled on the goal line and all of a sudden if you can just mind your P's and Q's such that you don't give up the spring box what they want which are you know the kick the kick chase tries the defensive tries the mole tries if you can be miserly in terms of giving them up all of a sudden the spring box are going to have to work really hard yeah. to make their to make their dominance count on the exactly. scoreboard yeah. and Big then, all of, then it just takes one yeah. or two moments on the other end yeah. of the ball and all of a sudden you can come out with an unlikely win. This is it. This is it. Uh, yeah, no, things like defensive mall, you're dead right to sight. Like, Atelji's yeah. brilliant at it, but so is Johnny Hill. So is Courtney Laws. Like, all of them telescopic limbed. They will need to be trying to stuff that. Yeah, limit the ins. They, they, they don't have the most varied styles of, or uh, manners of scoring as a team anyway. If you can just systematically limit them by being accurate and being game, then slowly but surely you can try and edge this contest at home with the help of that 16th man and uh, just make them feel the pressure of, of a long season and a raucous, raucous home crowd on top of them. That's how, that's the MO for England. But for the box, oh, you know, you got to bottle some of that anger juice that you have, some of that uh, injustice chip stuff. On chip the right there yeah. and right there, ready for smashing Englishmen with yeah. the chip on the shoulder. Um, yeah, they got to be bullish and be bullies here. It's the same, like, they... You, it's tough to preview because like just do what you did in the World Cup final like be, yeah, be <laughs> exemplary in all areas of contact be uh, ferocious off the line pressure pressure this English offence which is still a young offence in terms of not just the age dynamic but also the new combinations pressure them into f- forcing things and then capitalise yeah. on that yeah the, um, I think the first thing that you have to do is manage the English offence and I think as much as Scotland got a couple of things off you would be very, very encouraged by their the proactive nature of their defence last week. They yeah. really did enjoy defending last week. It's true. They were brilliant. And I actually there was an interview with, with Am um last week talking about sort of the defence and he's saying they've been like really dialing it in as, as a proactive way of generating tries and he was he was citing with pride the fact that they scored their two tries off turnovers. Yeah. And that Love was that. a defence yeah, that yeah. was generating turnovers. They generated so many against yeah. the Scots last week and it was a genuine. They kept doing new it against the, the Kiwis as well. In yeah, those yeah. back to back tests as well. 
they are monstrous in yeah. terms of that. Like even if you get a half break, it's almost worse because there's a, exactly there's a jacker yeah. there. There was a hilarious um, moment actually at the start of the, the way they got their first points against Scotland last week. They were huffing and puffing with the ball, huffing and puffing, and then they got stolen. And the Scots come away with it to a big cheer. And then the guy falls at Vermeulen's feet. Jackal steal three points. And yeah. it's like, oh man, we yeah. just need to not have yeah. the ball. Let's get right to the five metre line and then hand them the ball. Yeah, exactly. And that's their best way of converting the try from there. <laughs> no yeah, yeah. Question, like, just yeah. drive them back over. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so that that's definitely, it's the, the defence is where this team eats. And they basically want to force England, put pressure on Marcus Smith give him nothing, give nothing up in the forward pack such that they're not winning contacts on the gain line and then Marcus Smith is under pressure with Am in his face and has to pull absolute mad rabbits out of a hat or, if he wants to get or anything. Or just has to ship it on yeah. to Tuolagi who should be lined up for the smosh. Yes. Which they were doing in the World Cup final to great effect. Big job and for do it. Yeah. Well, he, he was great at it yeah. the last time and Tuolagi's actually a little lighter than he was in that game as well. I wouldn't like, write off Tuolagi. No, I'm not writing off yeah. Tuolagi. Tuolagi will get some stuff off. It's a high level matchup but I think the, the box will also smash him a few times. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Like, he will be the option if they are successfully shutting off the outside such that Marcus Smith feels there's nothing else on he will be the bailout option for them in terms of in terms of just trying to re, like reset and go again for the next phase even if you're kicking it yeah and um, it's it's yeah it's on on this pressure defense to try and just remove all of those options from them and then be proactive in that smash and slowly but surely you end up orchestrating the game again where they're going to sit and box kick and it's good they're probably going to decide it in the air and at the scrum exactly, and at the line out yeah, which is yeah. what they want exactly um, what they want they have correctly gone with reinick this week for the big one um, and he's Pollard in to get the well. start but yeah proper like with the absence of faff that is their a combination for for us uh, for sure although i have um, to say andre pollard's form spotty at best d- definitely true yeah, yeah. definitely true like he's and goal he's, kicking's shocking it's um, true passing game is not quite what it was also true um just what he has is proper clutch and physicality for them yeah. whereas whereas the other options tend not to and tend to pale in that area like he'll probably miss a few kicks and then if it, if he has one to win it he'll kick that one and you know as opposed to the other the other tens he'll kick the ones with no pressure but then if it's 79th minute and it's the score then it'll be skewed there's, there's an argument therefore France that it's a day. better balance starting with uh um, Elton and bring on Andre perhaps there's an argument for that because Elton actually to be fair to him his passing was solid like I don't think he's a guy who could hang if his forward pack wasn't winning particularly Definitely at this level yeah, but yeah. I'm also not sure if Pollard is right now yeah. and so uh, yeah it's a, it's, a, it's a question mark as to whether they've got that right you're right to cite Fran Stein what a season he yeah, has had awesome. and another yeah. just absolute weapon to bring on off the bench um, so good in so many areas and, and if they're in any way struggling in that kicking game if Mapimpi and LaRue aren't getting it done in or the air or Creel um, who's, who's still, still yeah, adjusting over there Creel's, that they, Creel's going to be over there on Johnny May so yeah. like, that's a tough matchup I would say that like Creel put in some absolute shots off the restart he last week he and he's probably he's been trusted because he hustled so well on the defensive yeah. end last week well he tracked down Duhan on well, that break yeah. as well which showed good turn of heel as um, well um, but I, I do feel bad for, for uh, uh, both Nkosi and Fassi particularly I don't yeah. really know what um, Fassi did wrong no I don't either um, he was yeah. very impressive to my just eye just no well. minutes yeah. after the Georgia game yeah weird weird because he was yeah. brilliant in that game yeah scored a try did he not yeah. oh no he same. got a try against the Pumas that's right he came back oh, in right. against the Pumas Sorry. and got a try and then, yeah. but yeah that was same, it like, same fate as in Kosi in the World Cup before yeah. where it's like well when you have a Colby and a Mapimpi which yeah, they, they don't they, have a Colby right they now. don't yeah so yeah. it was a funny one Mapimpi but, um, has still been brilliant again like, oh, he's one of the so wingers of the series if not yeah. he, like he's been fantastic every game he's gotten, he's, he's, he's gotten better um, even perhaps even from what he was at the World Cup but he just keeps scoring tries he he's got deceptively good movement yes he does he he knows how to skip skip the skip the skip from a tackle mode that he does yeah, is so his, good. His, his off the mark uh, acceleration is rapid yeah, as well. Yeah. He'll burn people, and he's like he's in his thirties. He doesn't look like it or play no. like it as well. It's, it's but, but he, he does in terms of his maturity. Yeah, he's a really yeah. mature player. And, and, he, and he fair, that, whole, that whole back um, line kind of has that air about it—a bit yeah. of calm, led by Am, but also guys like Franz Stein and off the bench, and yeah. Billy Larue as well has matured into quite a good leader for them too. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah, no, the questions of, of converting their pressure into points. It'll start with three pointers, but they they'll mm. be trying to turn the screw, trying to edge territory, trying to trust Reinach really. Uh, and his kicking game as well as Pollard's to try and kind of yeah. go do battle with well, them. Can they um, lose that game? And like, that's what I'm thinking. It's well, like if the game if yet. the game becomes the box kicks in the midfield, the high ball, the scrum, the line out. Can the box ever lose that game? Sometimes is this is this uh, or is that a, a England's in or is it just a case that if the box can do their job on D and get Marcus Smith deer in headlights? That that's enough. That they'll probably, probably win. That probably is enough. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like they're just their pack is so mighty, and Etzebet's form so good, and Mostert's on the bench. Yeah. To come like, in this are they really going to lose like, line out matchups? It will have to know. be a monstrous show from the likes of Atoji. Yeah, it would have to be like a, a complete 
star studded stealing the spotlight I am the best in the world in my position no doubt about it here I am yes. from Atoji which he has done once um, or twice he's definitely yeah, yeah. made our own James Ryan look silly well, in, on occasion, in the game that the Lions um, won the, he the, was the, brilliant the, the source of all this Razzie Gate so Atoji had a very fine game that he day did. he did um, uh, and he is a, a handful in the defence of Mall End and yeah Safas will be going to that Mall set up and like with Diago and with Etzebeth it's very tidy but when Moster comes in in the second half it gets even tighter I think he's probably perhaps the best uh, kind of low of the mall in terms of when he gathers a line out at the back he sets a very good wedge and I don't even think Itoji would be powerful enough to stop it if they're accurate enough in that yeah. Um, yeah, just try and be accurate in the transfer and take Itoji out of the game mm. um, and it might be the case that England edge it in the first half but then that bomb squad pack is, yeah, is just factor. very good you saw yeah. it against Scotland like it, it just takes stuff out of you every contact just takes stuff out of you you're a little if you're a video cam game camera or a character your health bar just goes diminishing yeah. by each contact with these spring box and it's it's very often that's that's the way they like to play it's just wear on you physically yeah. it's why they don't have the the love from the match officials certainly from kiwis and and and, uh, and aussies will want to see you know don't disrupt the nine don't make the rook a mess and it's like no why not yeah. i'm going to disrupt the nine make the make the breakdown a miss and then smash them yeah, turn over it's turnovers, like, yeah, yeah. turnovers. That's what the yeah. team is about. But also penalties, and then also they're going to have to score some tries. And that's certainly a, a constant point of emphasis for the Springbok is, team. Is, yeah, is not to play a great game without scoring tries because yeah, that's how you fair, get caught. The last time out, they scored thirty, and it was like, yeah, yeah. So no, they, it was very they're, good. They're in good form, and Mapimpi in good form and stuff. They'll be yeah. hoping to kind of bottle some of that that anger that you have for motivation juice which was just absolutely perfect in terms of sprinkling on the dressing room in in the absence of Razzie you have a Razzie's not here why isn't he here because of that <laughs> like yeah, yeah although I, um, I must say I do think they're a worse team without Razzie yeah no, that's um, true the Waterboy thing like, is it they were, they were he was back at Waterboy last week and they they played as damn damn near as good a game as they played all, all season it definitely is the helps, emotional heartbeat uh, of their team all and the time. one of the wisest coaches in the world it's also so true. it's definitely it's a loss yeah him not being there for sure um, but listen he needs I saw, I saw some funny uh, Springbok memes of like well I, there's no rule against me being the bus driver yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, kind of thing. yeah, yeah. it's not about people right? it's not about yeah no uh, we obviously won't see Razzie although we will probably be hearing a lot about it in the commentary for it but sure. it's, it's good juju for, for the Springboks in terms of getting their motivation right getting to the pitch of the battle and uh, yeah just obviously fatigue could be a factor discipline they need to mind their P's and Q's be, apply pressure but don't be reckless with it because yeah, when those, they're dialed out they start giving exactly, up penalties and yeah. those are the ins that England will, will take and that the crowd will get behind so if you can just be tidy and be physical you, you'll probably discourage them early enough if you can maintain that and be be winning those contacts or be winning at least half of those contacts that's often enough to upset an England team when they can't steamroll you and get yeah. their offense going and that's going to be their MO yeah I, I think I, I think I see that kind of being how it plays out I think the Bucs are a better team than, than England right now I think I, so too certainly think, than this England team I and certainly that, based on last week's yeah. form guide as well like England won that game pretty comfortably against Oz in the mm. end but it was a hodgepodge mess yeah, of an Aussie team it's, and they didn't play that yeah, well they, themselves they haven't shown um, their offence yet and yeah. this is a really rough game to try and work your offense, and the other the other understated thing uh, is that Jamie George is the heartbeat of that offense. Yeah, I know he was the one guy making line him. breaks last yeah, yeah. week, you know, and it was ridiculous when he was left out of the squad earlier. Yeah. <laughs> like he is the absolute heartbeat of their forward interplay. He's one of their best carriers, one yeah. of their best sure, passers. They're at their best, it's a Sarri's offense, yeah. and he's one of the spearheads of yeah. it. Um, um, yeah, so they are going to miss him. I think that I fear for that front row. To be honest, that yeah. starting front row, I just. Yeah, and even some of the guys on the bench it's as well. Like Sinclair's form hasn't been great for no, Bristol. No, it hasn't. Like, and yeah. we, we missed out on that matchup, so we don't have tape on it, but there were a few who suspected had he not gone down, he would have soon from that scrummaging uh, onslaught Beast against Weir, Beast Entawira, yeah, perhaps. Um, we we will see it this weekend, but it's it's on England to try and stand up and, and make a fight of it and get the, get the crowd involved. But I think... All things being equal, I think the box are just slightly better and we'll edge it on the scoreboard. Won't yeah, be too high scoring. Demoralise teams as they do and win yeah. it by a score or so. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would agree. I think probably the box. Um, but sure, listen, let us know uh, what you think. Can England pull off a, a, a famous shock and end the season on high? Yeah. The great box team of 2009. Um, uh, many people talk about them, you know, that fantastic Lions tour. Yeah. Um, that, um, beating the All Blacks. Uh, beating yeah. the All Blacks three times consecutively, winning the Tri Nations, just a historic, historic team. But few remember how their season ended. 
um, with a defeat against a team Ireland yes. who never who actually were the only team to go unbeaten in that year if I do say so myself it was a, a game in the mist in Croke Park when Johnny Sexton made his first start there you and go. absolutely owned the game and Ireland won at 15-10 and even that great Bok team towards the tail end of the year did manage to, to come up with a with a bad loss away yeah. in Europe and that's there's definitely a definitely possibility there's precedent so. for that like I mean to see, we, if we see a South Africa that's slightly dialed out in the first 20 minutes or a bit uh, a bit under the, the under the pace and under the pitch of the battle then maybe yeah, that, that flips but uh, for the time being I think they will be plenty motivated Not, no thanks in no small part to that, that, that news this weekend but I think they'll arrive to the pitch to do battle one more time for the year yeah. and I expect and, and the World Rugby Awards by the way Cal- that was another one Khaleesi yes. and Am Khaleesi and Am yeah, yeah missing it missing and, and Elizabeth. I mean gee whiz yeah. anyway um, let yeah. us know what you think down below and uh, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll definitely be looking forward to this one yeah great um, game great game alright with that we're going to move on to a harsh to say but maybe a not so good game um, we're going to look at Wales against Australia yeah. this game taking place in the Principality Stadium in Cardiff uh, 5.30pm on Saturday evening GMT uh, Adam Mikeson, Mike Adamson of the Scotland Rugby Union, uh, inexplicably in charge, and um, Matthew Renal and uh, Nika Amushikeli, the Georgian um, uh, official, as yeah. is, is taking part as AR, and then Marius Yonker of South African Rugby Union is the TMOG who is that Mike Adamson Marius Yonker combination could be absolutely brutal in this one yeah. um, then uh, so obviously the colour of this game first and foremost is just that both sides are wildly out of form that's um, true but they do have they have had some absolute humdingers in recent times they and, have and, yeah, yeah. Uh, I did enjoy their World Cup pool match and prior to that the Wallabies had a real Indian sign over Gatlin's they Wales did. for years they and did. years, yeah, and, years. And, they, and as such they do have a winning record much like as you say all the Southern Hemisphere Giants 10-2 they've won 30 Wales have won 20 12 and there's been one draw between these teams historically um, of the 27 matches played in Wales however the Wallabies have won 17 to Wales is 9 and there's well, that one draw also happened in Wales there so yeah um, some interesting colour there uh, they will be competing for the James Bevan trophy which has been in, in existence since 07 in, wow. in, in one of the many made up trophies that get <laughs> handed out for random test matches yeah. uh, this is one of them yeah yeah, um, yeah in, in the first 70 years of the Clash Wales won 6 of their 8 matches and then over the next 10 years it was fairly even but since the first World Cup in 87 Australia has been pretty dominant with yeah. win, with a win rate of 24 wins to 4 yeah um, well, so it's just very limited very limited Welsh wins over the Wallabies they did get one at the World Cup they did um, yeah. and they are at home here they're, they're definitely moving on in that way in that regard we're going to start by looking at the game from their point of view obviously this is the fourth of a really tough uh, sequence of games they set up for themselves they um, yeah. which yeah. they are blessed to have any wins in but they, they do are. yes they managed to win pretty well on the scoreboard despite being comprehensively the second best team on the pitch last yeah. week um, they will be hoping to be the best team on the pitch this week and to be fair I think the team they've named this week is a better team yeah. than they named well they made some adjustments Will yeah. Rowlands is out of there Wynne Jones is in at loose head Ryan Elias Thomas Francis that is probably their, their best at the minus Ken Owens that's that's their uh, first choice front row yeah. Adam Beard and Seb Davis who has been to be fair to him one of the bright sparks this uh, this November and uh, yeah good to see Rollins just wasn't wasn't hanging at all at test level wasn't hanging at all in, and, uh, and unfortunately for him Ellis Jenkins and Tane Basham have both been very good True. and good to see Aaron Wainwright back in there we know he can be good too it's, it's it sets up a very good back row batch, match up and if Jenkins and Basham can each put on the performances that they had against South Africa and New Zealand respectively yes. you could all of a sudden have a really explosive dynamic back row yeah. um, up against a hooperless a rare hooperless uh, yeah. um, Aussies Australia back row as well that's so. right yeah and uh, they've stuck with Thomas Williams um, dubiously enough and then they've gone with Dan Bigger at 10 um, Halaholo and Tompkins their best offensive yeah, centre partnership that's a better um, a better shout like, Tompkins yeah. deserves to keep his jersey purely because even when he's been beaten up he keeps on going he does and finds a play towards yes, the tail end of the game as he did last week he's a good for them he's yeah, a good, yeah. good avenue for them to find the outside and Halaholo is plenty physical mm-hmm. as well Like that. I think it's a good a good pairing and I hope they go well and uh, um, if, if you ask any Welshman what the Lions back three should have been it's uh, Josh Adams Louis rees Samet, and Liam Williams I think right. you'll find I that's a that's bloody what, good back it is three it a very good back, no, row, yeah. back three it's good to see Josh Adams back out there obviously yeah. uh, he had been named at 13 for last week and then had to pull out uh, yeah. just prior to kick off and, and obviously they could have done with him and, um, <laughs> Johnny McNichol back on their bench that's um, dead right yeah. he was dead wrong to be uh, out of there um, after that All Blacks game like, he was yeah. good in both the All Blacks game and the South Africa game and then he was inexplicable 
inexplicably out, but he's back in. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, so he's been he's been good for them, and that is good impact. It's a heck of a back three stocks they got yeah. going now. The Welsh, in terms, in, in in that sense, they should be more clinical. I want to see this Welsh offense. I want to see it come back. Yeah. And a big part of that has to do with them um, with the with the loose forwards. Yeah. Um, what they were doing so well um, in in the Six Nations was using their big forward carriers a little wider to find space for their fast guys in the edge. Yeah. Beard, and, get and out there. The, the, yeah, the, 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 the style of play that they've been doing in the in this November so far has been a little rudimentary. It's been almost Japanese in terms of they're just kind of flashing it wide mm-hmm. with no real deception and no inside option. Yeah. And hence teams like the All Blacks can read it on the outside. Yeah. The Wallabies will dial in something similar, an outside kind of blitz trying to pick up, trying to pick off a pass. Yeah. Wales need to have those inside options. And I think the balance of having Halaholo and Tompkins in there should definitely give them that because both of those guys are a threat. Yes, they can um, tuck and run if it's on. And yeah, they have and a good running game. Step you if you, yeah. if you if you don't commit. So I definitely love the balance of this back line and I want to see this yeah. Welsh off. Depends, get like, back to the, doing the, what it the does two best. halfbacks will need to be so, like night and day from last week because both of them were very very poor including yeah. bigger like bigger, bigger was a dialed out bigger which is a rare enough sight but it was his worst showing that I've seen in quite a while against Fiji so they're giving them giving them both a go again to make amends in this yeah, one well, it, was, it was Hardy um, wasn't it at nine last week and sorry it was a, a shocker Williams came yeah. in yeah um, but yeah bigger was the one who had a real shocker like his, his boot was off and it was askew mm-hmm. his passing game was off and then it just looked like his temperament was off they weren't yeah. reading the game well like when they were playing against 13 men they were going through two phases and then dropping it on the toe inexplicably and you're like what, what are you doing like um, it was just weird non-rugby sense going on from really sensible rugby players in that and you'd like to see their read coming and like if you were talking about being clinical it involves reading the game a bit more they were kind of I don't know what game they were looking at last week but it was a little bit off and yeah, so they need to was... kind of find their their mojo exactly um, and, and, and dial in some contact winning to set things up yeah. but Beard as a pivot Ellis Jenkins and the like as pivots um, guys who can sit down yeah. the defence so so important just to open up the space and all they need is, is little one on one matchups on the edge in enough space and you can see that they work that to such great effect in the Six Nations where be it off set piece or off two or three phase plays they worked it to the edge they had an inside threat and you could see it exemplified against Scotland you yeah. know Beard sitting down a couple of defenders and then all of a sudden getting the pass away and all they all they worked was five metres in the tram line for Louis Reece Samet and that was a try Yeah, and that's the joy of it and we saw him do that last week Josh Adams can do that Liam Williams can do that they have elite talent out there and in, even in Tompkins and Halaholo they've got wonderful offensive talent so just putting enough little systems in place and just having enough of a threat on the inside that the Wallabies can't over commit on the edge that you can then find that those seams in that room can turn the offence around yeah. and then the other thing the other part of it that, that that's vitally important is on the defensive end they should be excited about about what has been a mess of an Aussie offense. Yes, indeed, they um, don't have to face this resurgent Aussie offense with your Quade Coopers and Karevis and Corabetis. No. They actually have yeah, the kind of the kind of beach beach version. You know, the <laughs> ones that rock up kind of in their togs, ready to just play a bit of yeah, you know, some touch rugby on the beach is fine. Yeah, um, yeah, Curtly Beal has definitely looked in that form, and it's like it's just. It's unfortunate for, for Oz, but it is a chance for Wales to kind of apply some pressure and, and force them into disjointed errors and force them into kicks and drops, which we saw plenty of over this autumn uh, so far. And, and we saw we um, saw Wales, probably their best strength, uh, you look at Basham and Jenkins, has been just those kind of strip plays in the contact. Yeah, so their best hit, plays have yeah. been turnover plays that they've generated, and obviously that's another great opportunity to get your fast attackers into the game. Dead right. Um, yeah, yeah. And the Wallabies, if they're playing a little loose, if they're carrying poorly, yeah. um, that's where uh, that's where uh, Wales could go to work and I'd love to see a big performance from Basham and, and Jenkins yeah. to, to dominate that contact area definitely true they need to be much better in the collisions than they've been all, all uh, autumn long they need yep. to kind of dial that in all of those back rowers but then similarly actually Wynne Jones is the one I'm looking at because uh, last week we were denied denied the great Wallaby tight heads that have, they have found over the last couple of years because they were both out in the, for the Twickenham test and it was a bit of a dead rubber in the scrum a lot of the time although Slipper did well Slipper is captain from Loosehead and he'll have to yeah. go well again on the switch but Tupo is back in at tight head crucially for them and yeah Wynne Jones is the man who will be opposite him and that is a big test for the Lion uh, because Tupo is fairly monstrous and uh, 
that scrum behind him as well. Like Arnold and Rodda have been pretty loose in the in, in the loose, but they are big units and they mm. are a big engine room. Yeah, and, and then it's a e- mighty scrum. E- every single one of those back uh, rowers, Leota, Samu, and Valatini, have been routinely winning contacts in yeah. the carry. You look at Valatini. They're actually they're a bigger they're a bigger back row unit now that with Hooper out because it's just in terms yeah, of mass it's a, as well. It's a, it's a huge um, pack. It's a much bigger pack than Wales have yeah. uh, in in terms of explosivity in the carry, and it's a big job for the Welsh team to stand up and make tackles a bit yeah. like they did against South Africa yeah. to not be miserly and. To front up to the challenge yeah, um, that's that's massively important and I'll be curious to see if they can do that on the defensive end manage the set piece and then just win it with offence because yeah. the Wallaby offence has hasn't been, been great MO. Like go Wales. back to that go yeah. flash back to that Six Nations that you won not too long ago lads yeah. um, and o- overload Icky Tau get the yeah. better of him find yeah. your boy Zamoth and your boy Adams in a bit of space with a Liam one Williams on one in there with either Daugunu or Callaway whoever yeah. like it's a good matchup if, with, for the player with the ball yeah. in those circumstances so uh, yeah to try and be the, the wide team try and get guys like Liam Williams as involved as he can be to try and unlock those uh, those uh, those wider channels for them, and yeah, it'd be nice to see them play with a bit of a plum and a bit of tempo, a bit of verve to finish what has been and still a positive year. Given that they won the Six Nations, they're never going to win the Six Nations and have it be a bad year. But they're flirting with that with their yeah, recent they're form. coming as close as he can go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, been- it's been, been a weird game of two a year of two halves for them really yeah. and it would be nice if they could sign it off with a home win for their fans against a top level side against a team that you, they do tend to struggle with but it's like they should probably fancy just having the edge there in that back line and being true to what was very good about PVAC style both with Scarlets and in the Six Nations with Wales this getting year. hungry about attacking yeah. and yeah folding into your shape quickly on the inside being dynamic to open up the outside yeah. and bringing those inside wingers in trying to get an edge up on JOC yeah. same as stuff. if you can do even yeah. parts of that the crowd will be yeah. way on side because that crowd is so loud and wonderful yeah. in, in the Principality and it's like they're certainly the most tuneful crowd in, in world rugby to my mind as well just in terms of the anthems but it doesn't take much for them to get right behind Wales here so if they can make it scrappy and competitive in the contact area first which they do just have to tidy up just be there for some of the contacts because like they weren't for the, the yeah. first half of the Fiji game it was only Liam Williams was winning contacts none of them won any contacts yeah. so it's like win some contacts then get yeah. your get your good attacking players on the ball and run at them take on this hodgepodge wallaby side that they've rocked up to Europe with and make them pay for it yeah. and Cardiff should be an absolute kind of sm- very very tough cauldron of a place to come and, uh, except they, for the fact that they're getting so used to losing indeed yeah. this is it they need to rediscover that back to back wins to end their year would be a good kind of way to kind of remove some of that uh, that kind of negative things yes you lost to three of the rugby championship teams let's not make it a, a, a clean sweep the yeah. the inverse grand slam that would not be a good way to sign <laughs> Indeed. off and uh, from a Wallaby point of view it's a similar scenario yeah. where they came into this European tour with a five game win streak a very rare thing for a team that has to play the teams that they play every year and mm-hmm. um, and now they're staring down the barrel of rocking up to the UK and losing, bam, Scotland, England, Wales. That, if I don't care who you are, that is a sore one. It is. For a former colonial team as well, like the Aussies, they don't like the Brits at the best of times. Yep, that is true. a sore one to take for for a team that thinks of themselves as a rug, as a powerhouse. Well, they regardless up, they of up circumstance. third in the world. Yeah, They exactly. won't be there anymore. If no. they, like, they might be able to nick their way right back up there with a winning card, if that's always a good win. I'm not sure. If I don't will. think they will be able. Yeah, maybe not. Maybe. Maybe if Ireland lose to if Ireland lose to Oz and England lose to South Africa, maybe I don't know. Yeah. I don't. I haven't done the maths on that, but um, I think that they they for pride's sake need a performance. And looking at the matchup up front, that's where it's going to be. They need to they need yeah, to make own it, this game up front. Show. Yeah. yeah, and, and the Valentini play, play, show. Play a bit of Georgia ball themselves and yeah. try and make it a, a, a tight contest and win the collisions. They've yeah. been good in the collisions. Let's try and make it about that. Um, that's definitely not, not play loose beach no, ball. No, I and mean, um, they've gone with Nick White and, and James O'Connor, and the offense has looked stop, start, and stuttery. I still don't like that selection. No, I don't I either. Gone but with Tate I, but like Nick, Nick, mm-hmm. McCar- Nick White is a good kicker of a ball. So try and just kick your pack into the right areas and bully Wales in the contact. And yeah. then if they can force loose drops out of them drops are great because if they're going to try and attack you and you can snag the ball and make it loose, that's great. Then you tee up Tupo for a scrum. Yeah. That's what it's got to be about. Is like. Like Wales are disjointed. Both of these sides are coming in a bit disjointed and a bit out of form. 
yeah, the Wallabies need to make it about set piece, make it about particularly scrum. Yeah, and, and they have an excellent line out maul themselves. They do. Um, on the yeah. on the be- on the best of occasions, they do need to fix the line out. I mean, they do. They've yeah. got Tolulatu in this week for Fyangata. They've just been rotating musical hookers <laughs> with these guys. Like they haven't really had anyone yeah. grab the jersey because it looked like it was going to be Fyangata yeah. until last week. Yeah. And then Indeed. whenever yeah. someone has a vein, a run <laughs> yeah. of games in it, they end up having one game where they just botch every line out yeah. and throw seven pointers away yeah. a lot of the time. Um, um, indeed, so they need to be more cautious in that set piece. But you're right, uh, Wales were, were bullied by the Fijian pack uh, last week. 14 Fijian men owned every contact against them. This Wallaby side is big and strong and tough and managed and a little to, disjointed. Managed to yeah. bully the Springboks uh, yeah. earlier in the year if they can dial some of that in. You're right, there's no Corabetti, there's no Karevi, there's no Quaid. It's not the same team. Yeah. But there is a Tupo yes, back, exactly. back, back Tupo again. Trump card. And Try Valentini and has been yeah, one yeah. of the players of the year. You know, they yeah. need to be relentlessly physical, keep it narrow, but mind the pill. And if they do that, just knocking Adam Beard back in the contact, knocking yeah. Ryan Elias back in the contact, getting around the corner, making the offense somewhat rudimentary, but also quick. And then that opens up the space where all of a sudden JOC might have a little more time to do his little dance in and oh Callaway's on my inside shoulder yeah. and he scored and lovely. all that kind of yeah, lovely yeah. wallaby rugby that follows from their pack being all over them Indeed. on the inside yeah yeah like um, that's that's what it be it's a very simple kind of rugby near, nearly 10 man rugby until it kind of gets the, the chance to go thing but they should be the ones that are trying to keep it tight to Wales as uh, Wales is loose and try and be sharp where, where, where yeah, they haven't if, been if you're going to play that um, game and you're going to kick from the middle third you've got to kick um, accurately and, and you've, you've got, got to chase accurately yeah. cohesively because like, that line has been disjointed at yeah. the best times Iki Tau by Sammy they all need to be in the same line you need to be on the same page yeah. as as Beal and as uh, everyone else they need yeah. to try and co- coalesce at least on the defensive end because that's yeah. the more important and it's a um, dangerous game to play against Wales because true. you're, you're going to get very very little in terms of inroads of your own because yeah. Liam Williams is going to defuse every bomb true. you throw his way true. and then on the inverse end you've got Liam Williams and Dan Bigger who are two of the best in the business at, at countering you in that so if you yes. want to take part in kick chase ball you've got to be prepared prepared for the fact that the team that might break it up by recovering their own kick is likely Wales true. so it's a dangerous game to it play you true. probably have to kick a little smarter you, you probably do. have to kick for 50-22s or deep grass balls yeah. to set up set pieces to set up moles to set up contact winnings to eventually get your wingers involved when Wales are broken and set back down exactly yeah no that's it's a patient game that you're advertising for them but it's yeah. one that's not beyond them even this, this, this squad that they've picked that is exactly how they should be approaching it um, I don't know how I expect it to go because like they are both been very very poor to be honest in this yeah. sort of thing they've both been on that end of season struggle bus you know and I don't know who's going to be getting off on the last stop but like <laughs> Wales um, are tempted by the idea of, of losing all of their matches and then going into the Six Nations as total underdogs and champions yes and so winning it again bizarre thing that they only <laughs> they could manage yeah. Yeah, there is that thought but I think both of them will likely be desperate to sign off 2021 with a year yeah, I would think with, so. with a win yeah, I should yeah. say like they're both even with this this scruffy tail end they're both still pretty positive campaigns for both like in terms of yeah for from oh, Wales' no point of view, they've won the Six Nations. They are champs, as you say. Yeah, and from they the went into the season of, nowhere. Exactly, yeah. yeah. From the Wallabies' point of view, they won that series against France at the beginning in a, in a tight two-and-fro one, but they managed to get the win and got good minutes into the guys like Lolasio and stuff. Then they beat the, the Springboks twice after their... their Bledisloe, admittedly, did not go well, but they beat the Springboks twice, finished second in the Rugby Championship, went five on the bounce. Like, there's a lot of good to this uh, season for both in, uh, in this camp, but... Whoever's, who's going to rally for the one last show? I don't know. Um, like on paper, I kind of suspect that forwards win matchups and the Wallaby pack is, is superior, and that's where if my head... Ball. If, if they're, they're not in the ball. This yeah. is the other thing is the Cardiff factor. If, like, if the Wallabies are just the, the performances we've seen over the last couple of weeks which have not been encouraging, then with two stuttering sides I think the home advantage probably could see Wales drag themselves home yeah and just the um, odd curtly drop clanger yeah, curtly clanger, drop yeah, um, yeah. to and invite give, them in yeah, yeah and then all of a sudden it's a re summit try and, or yeah. you know the, the other one that could likely happen based on this year's precedent is that Tupo gets caught for a high tackle and goes off yeah and I mean I did, let's the other see thing how Wales is, play against 14 the, Australians the, the, the other thing is he took um, an absolute rock a couple of weeks ago too but I'm kind of surprised to see him back this early it's like it's, he, he was well like it was like an MMA fighter getting Not TKO'd good. yes it's he true. took an absolute shot from Sam Johnson a couple of weeks back can he be 100% after that I don't know no but I think um, probably 70% Tupo might still be too much for Win Jones like Win yeah. Jones is a lion and, and I hope like Win Jones gets some wily plays on yeah. which he is one to do but he struggled against the All Blacks the last we saw him indeed and the power that Tupo is bringing with 
guys like Rada and uh, and is it, it's Rada well, Rada, Rada and uh, uh, and uh, Rory Arnold Rory with, Arnold uh, Skelton, with Skelton, Skelton is who yeah. I'm thinking like because yeah. Tupo probably if he's up for it will be playing close to most of the match as well he's although been, they have an Alatoa to bring on do, actually so, yeah. Yeah. so I would like to see Skelton on first so you can get a bit of second half Skelton and Tupo into your game I don't know. What? Who do you see edging this one? Yeah, that's a curious question. Um, yeah, is it going to be about the back, the back three of Wales, or the uh, or the forward pack of, the front of Oz? Five of Oz. Yeah, um, which not necessarily what you would have been saying historically, but um, yeah, I think Wales you takes think Wales. the kicking game, and to I'm just not sure about the Wallaby offense at the moment. Yeah. And as much as you can win battles up front, making a count on the scoreboard is another question. And if Wales can dial in enough. Of those wily goal line turnovers and all of yeah, that, just yeah. just be miserly when that when they get into your t- twenty two, and then be clinical when you get into their twenty two, and it could play out like one of those Six Nations games where yes, you're dominated up front, but it doesn't matter because you went and won the game uh, by being more clinical. So yeah. that's what I'll say. I'll say Wales do it with with the help of Cardiff and all that. Yeah, behind and them. some Liam Williams goodness. Okay, well then for colour, I will say that the Wallabies edge it uh, yeah. in a in a tight contest that they managed to sneak with a few threes and perhaps one good try. I'm hoping from Daugunu. He hasn't been on in a while. I yeah. kind of hope that. He gets on the big, board, big sort of um, basketball yeah, one hand, yeah, jump finish. over yeah, yeah. the guy. Um, yeah. yeah, I would like. I, it's it's a toss up in my head. They have both been pretty poor this campaign, and but they are better teams than they've shown this campaign as well. So I just don't know which team is going to be more motivated on the day. But I'd imagine the one that is is the one that will win because I don't yeah. think there's too much between them. But it is a very good game. Um, no question. Uh, let us know how you think this one's going to go down below in the comments. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to this one on Saturday evening. But for now, we're going to move on. Next up, we do have a doozy of a game. France versus New Zealand. One of the the great historic matchups, one of the great rivalries in, in sport. Cross hemispheres, they, they both have the utmost respect for for one another. And it's going to be going down again at the Stade de France in Paris. Uh, kickoff, 8 o'clock in the evening, 9pm local time. It's Saturday again, 20th of November. So the, the, the tail end, the pinnacle of... Uh, Super Saturday, although maybe maybe England's Green Box might outmatch it. We, we, it remains to be seen, but it is a great box office oh, game to have a, a Saturday time night. show. All the same, yeah, hundred yeah. uh, percent. Wayne Barnes getting the getting the whistle for this one. He's going to be the man <laughs> in the middle. Very good ref. Good to yeah. see him. Get, get no, it. no, well, hopefully this will pass that event. You know, Wayne Barnes and this fixture in yes. the two thousand and seven quarter final. That's true. Yeah, and the forward pass. It was flat, lads. Get over it. It was flat. <laughs> flat ball for Mishlak. Yeah, it was a good pass and a good try. Flat out of the hands. Yeah. Flat out, maybe, of, the, flat maybe, out of the world. Maybe cup. forward yeah. with momentum. Yeah. But, uh, ah, listen, why could Why would you bring that up? I think people will bring Wayne Barnes that. is in charge yeah, of this I game. Know, I know. <laughs> uh, Luke Pierce and Carl Dixon uh, on this touchline with Stuart Terhage, uh, Terhige, even in the TMO, an all English um, refereeing team for this one. Um, uh, which is in all seriousness, that's 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 as good a pretty, team, pretty good team, team as you can have. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it should be no issue there. Um, yeah, it's it's a great great storied history that these two have. Um, they've been playing each other for over a century. Um, and as of the uh, as of twenty fifteen, they'd played fifty six times. They played a couple more since then. First encounter was uh, was during the nineteen oh five oh six All Blacks tour of Europe and North America. Um, New Zealand they New Zealand won that one at thirty. Eight, eight in their first meeting and it was not until their third meeting in 1954 that France got their first win um, France first toured New Zealand then in 1961 which is a while ago now as well and before any of the home nations though they were the first to uh, to go down that far the All Blacks won all three tests which is kind of not that uncommon France first defeated the All Blacks in New Zealand on Bastille Day in 1979 and um, they achieved a, they first achieved a series win in New Zealand in 1994 um, when they won both tests and since 2000 they both have contested the Dave Gallagher ch- uh, trophy which is another one of those yeah. made well, up perpetual trophies in, in motion um, um, yeah indeed and that, I think it was the 94 series when it really came to life because that's one of the records they still hold now yeah. it's one of the re- the France have this aura in New Zealand rugby and they'll always respect them and it's because of what happened first and foremost in in, in, in the World Cups yeah. um, but also that 1994 last team to win at Eden Park nobody's won there since since 1994 yeah. nearly 30 years now mm-hmm. but France are the last team to do it that's always in the background yeah. it's always a stat they that have. pops up two World Cup finals they met in and then more importantly that trifecta of games I would say 1999 dumping them out of the tournament 2007 dumping them out of the yeah. tournament and 2011 
all but beating them yeah, in the final oh, yeah, of the geez. World Cup when they absolutely terrified them. Yeah. And ter- scared the life out of them in that final and played probably, played all the rugby. and deserved yeah, yeah. to win. Um, yeah, um, was a bit of scooby doo stuff yeah. going on. Yeah, more man of the whistle with the whistle stuff in that one. But yeah, storied history, obviously, as you were saying. They've, they've met a, c- a few times and taken each other's scalp in the World Cup. Um, the largest winning margin between them in a test was a 61-10 victory by the All Blacks in 07. Um, and yeah, like the overall record, I think they, they, New Zealand do hold the edge. But uh, Fra- overall, they've yeah forty eight tests. Um, they is what New Zealand have won to France's twelve with one match drawn. Um, but twelve wins is the by far the best record of any Northern Hemisphere team against New Zealand as well. They hold the yeah. best one for uh, for that, and, and for that they do have the respect of yeah. them. Although, yeah. and I think it's important to note that uh, this is a rivalry which has been living off its reputation for the last True decade enough. plus. True enough. I mean, truly, the All Blacks put to bed this uh, this rivalry in twenty fifteen when, when that great team put sixty on them, them and yeah, yeah could have like they just absolutely from minute one annihilated them. Yeah, and that that was the French at their also been a three match series uh, that they lost in, in a yeah. sweeping fashion as well since subsequent to that um, yeah France have been a bit nowhere in the mid aughts and stuff and it's yeah. only now with this young France team that there's a bit more June, buzz and a bit more yeah. excitement June um, 2009 was the last time that uh, that France won and I would say that they'd like yeah, this uh, bro- broadly speaking about this French team um, they have like they they have a lot of hype around them they have yet to prove that they can lace the shoes of the team from that era the team from 06 and 07 that won six nations that made that world cup final in 2011 despite having no coach but your 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 josians your rougeries your vincent Vincent clerks yeah um like that was a do do satoire obviously that was a special special french team and as special as some of these players have been they haven't uh, they haven't been a patch on that team Harry yet Harry um, and all of those yeah, great yeah. players Yashvili yeah. oh. like Dupont's great Yashvili was great too no um, yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They, they're, like, they're, this French team have been a, a, a brilliant in moments but rarely if ever have they put together a complete performance yeah. um, we were talking before the show like what, what was their best performance uh, in this Galtier kind of era I was probably the one against against Ireland in Paris um, in lockdown last year towards yeah. the tail end of that 2026 Nations when they opened us up um, and they were good that day Ireland kind of played into their hands but to me, that that tells me that if they want to win this game, they're going to have to play their best their, performance. Their best this ever. has to be better yeah. than anything we've seen from them so far. Yeah, they have yeah. yet to put in an eighty minute show. Really, uh, yeah, for 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 their fans, really, they've they've been kind of in beautiful and irresistible at times but also infuriating at other times and it's it's tough to know which France you're going to get but uh, the jury's still out on them and the only uh, as far as this matchup then we will look at both sides and how they're looking to establish their their winning conditions for it and um, France do have the home advantage as you were saying you'll have a boisterous crowd the only real recipes we've seen in terms of how to uh, beat this all black side has in terms of this year we've seen the box do it we've seen Ireland do it um, and both times it was by dominating possession, dominating territory, having most of the ball and just denying them opportunities to play. Um, and generally this French team has been abysmal in the territory department and the possession retention department and would tend to kind of grab tries themselves with 30 or 40% possession and look good in moments but soak a lot of pressure to do so. And Sean Edwards' defence has been good at doing that but like if they tee up a shootout in Paris here can they really hope to win against this all black side it's a curious um, question I mean I, Galtier did say after the Ireland game that they don't they're, they're going to try and beat the all blacks their way yeah. and that's always been what the French have been about they're not going to replicate an Ireland performance or a no. Springbok performance against the all blacks they're not going to get that much advantage up front yeah. and they back themselves as being perhaps the only team in the world that maybe could win a shootout you know if you, if you yeah. marry the buck the, the uh, Edwards defence with the, stint, the, the somewhat issues that the All Blacks have been having a multi-phase this year you can shut down at least enough of their plays and, and, and limit their options and then strike with your own uh, offensive elegance that you can bring sometimes then maybe that's their own special recipe and they have they have picked their team they have charged uh, 15 and 23 men with, with, with getting it done yeah. um, Cyril Bai Pietro Movaca and Winnie Antonio is a very good scrummaging awesome. unit yeah. lovely to see Antonio having like I, 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 Mohamed Uas was like decent but constant cards Antonio yeah. for me brilliant I, yeah, yeah, much, much yeah, better yeah. guy to have in there from the start um, and Cyril Bai last week destructive at the scrum True. they've gone with Wokey interestingly huge vote of confidence in him in the yeah. second row with Willemse and then they've got Francois Cross, Anthony Gélange and Greg Aldrit who needs a big game from yeah. number 8 um, and in the back line they have abandoned 
the Entomac Jalibert yeah. Axis. They've given Entomac the nod at 10 with Dupont, the two loose combo. Brought in Dante into the midfield with yeah. Gail Fiku, who's shifted st- still out there in the 13 uh, jersey. And they've got Villiers back in there with Peno and Jaminet keeping that 15 jersey yeah, as well. I think it might be their best play. Like, obviously, we were saying like they took a complete, almost completely different side down to Australia and had some good success down there. And found, certainly in, Jam- in uh, Jaminet, they found a great asset that's going to be serving them very well as far as exiting and just their kicking game. But they were coupling those findings by trying out something new in that 10-12 axis that didn't work and didn't offer yeah. them anything. Whereas what they were doing very well in the Six Nations and in the years prior was being dynamic in the centres. Like, obviously, they're missing Vakatawa, and that is a big hole in them. But Fiku's been brilliant. Yeah. And he was just... He was kind of frozen out with those two tens operating and there was no yeah. real game line yeah it, it, it was Dante funny you have a bit he... more of a traditional hard man running that line trying to sit down those those well he's opposite Quint Pye in this instance but like there's a bit more balance to this yeah. back line already on paper than yeah. even the ones that they were rocking up to the Six Nations with because they couldn't exit in the Six Nations yeah no um, question and it was funny that uh, it, you know off, off for the Penno try against the Georgians off the scrum there were two tens on the pitch it was Fiku who was the link man yeah, who picks the inside ball yeah, he yeah, was yeah. the guy who was playing distributor and it'll, it's definitely interesting to see him operate from the 13 jersey it kind of changes the offence a little bit like you could have gone Dante on the outside and Fico on the inside and kept you know, it going they want it, you um, don't want like Dante is big and physical mm-hmm. but he's opposite Rico like the speed think, is what they're, they're they probably, want to go to, they want to get to the edge I think I think yeah, it's an offensive that, decision all, as think, much as a defensive one I think one. it is as much because you t- like their their best defender is Fico by far mm-hmm. in the open space and their best reader and the 13 channel against the old Blacks is where yeah. you want to have your guy you shut them down um, yeah. and he will have a job to do that he'll have Dante inside him so he can kind of try and Lathaniel on that and try and yeah. force any traffic back into Dante and Dante will smash and he'll get a turnover steal as well if, it, if yeah. it's going but yeah the read is definitely Fiku and they're right to give him that job because he's the best at it he's a yeah. really good rugby player uh, no question and the other thing that they, that's interesting about this French team is that they do have a 6-2 split with yes. some explosive forwards True. on the bench they've got the, the underrated barrel chested Barlow covering yes, Hooker he's awesome. they don't have Marchand but this guy is an absolute he is unit. a tour de force when he comes <laughs> yeah. in when you've seen him yeah um, could, like, and this is against a, 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 an all black team that will be playing you know the last 20-30 minutes of their season yeah. so it, there are definitely some big boys to be bringing on John Baptiste Gros we know how good he can be at the scrum Demba Bamba both of those guys will be looking to rebound from a bad shift off the bench last true, week true. but Roman Taufi Fanua Thibaut Flamont who was great last week yeah. and Dylan Cretan like, it's a big, lot of heft to bring it on it is the, um, the dubious question is is why start Wokey when you have Taufi Fanua and Flamont uh, on the bench yeah. like I would think Wokey off the bench makes a bit more sense and like certainly attack the all black line yeah, must be your yeah. answer I guess yeah but yeah. what about the scrum you know like you have like, sure but I yeah. mean it, the way Ireland took some of those line outs off New Zealand it definitely unnerves them it they were does, the only teams to take the line out off them were Ireland and South Africa that's true and that um, is a good in and Wokey yeah. is good at that skill but yeah. like surely the scrum is a better in for them just based on Cyril Bai's form mm. and like just what they did to Georgia who are a more scrum more scrum oriented team than, than the All Blacks like it feels like it could come up a little bit light yeah, but it's still got villains in there and that's true it's, it's, yeah. it's, not, it's, it's not definitely totally it's close to their most balanced team that I think they've named in the Galtier era but I, I still kind of think with that lock thing it's a little bit like mm. I think there's still jigging around that needs to happen before ultimately they're going to try and make a run for their home World Cup which is where both of these sides are eyeballing ultimately it is the tail end of a long year that is the middle year in the gap in terms of the gap of the World Cup so it's it's very much developing offences and defences and just two developing sides but it is also just a class matchup and uh, yeah I think the French should be the ones motivated to try and make a game of it they should be encouraged by what Ireland did last week and uh, yeah, I'd love to yeah, see they, them take, they, they take them on up front might, and get some inroads. Yeah, they might yeah. think if their pack steps up to the challenge and uh, doesn't get blown away by a, by a, a hurt all black team who like to go back to that physicality after a loss. True. Usually speaking, and they'll have they still have Retallick and Sam Whitelock licking their wounds coming out along with some other fresh uh, guys as well. Like if if they don't get blown away in that contact area on the inside, they will think that their offense matches up decently, perhaps a little better than what Wales were doing against the All Blacks and even like Ireland's was, was very you know it's Ireland's is a lot more regimented and it's very much you know there's pods of, there's lots lots of pod work lots, lots of interplay of yeah. lots of sexton calling plays France is a little more joué joué but what it does have is the, is the offensive chops and speed and uh, ability of Antoine Dupont who's yeah. got that X factor in an area where the All Blacks do struggle around that yeah, rook, around the rook. Um, just to it's put it's got to start off yeah. him off nine just bring those big runners bring Wokey around the court 
corner yeah. bring these guys around the corner go yourself if it's mm. there Dupont because like that is a gap that's there resourcing just the edge of the rook that should be where they're looking if they're naive they go wide too soon but yeah forcing them back on the inside back on their heels force them to make tackles it's a good recipe and then yeah, get some offloads going and then oh, they do have to mind the pill it's a huge like depriving the All Blacks of their precious turnover ball is always a factor if you're going to be playing rugby against them Ireland did a great job of it last week huge job for the tight five to replicate that but they should be bullish about taking them on their game is offense their game is speed their game is catching the All Blacks and listen they are as good a side as any in the world at turning line breaks into tries they it's run true. great tracking runs it's they true. rarely screw up their passes yeah. they've had some fabulous tries this year and they'll be looking to add to they that have guys like um, Noah are in great form Villiers in great form they yeah. will take a try if it's there all day long as much as the guys in Black will as well like it's two really good offensively in, instinctive teams and France are that as well but with like the Sean Edwards D is a massive challenge for them as well it hasn't been as stellar as it had been in the previous couple of years it will need to be here yeah. like they will need to like obviously limiting their the amount of ball they have is first quarter call limiting the territory but you will have to defend from time to time and the All Blacks multi-phase isn't all that and um, if they can be cohesive with this new Dante and Fiku combination and shut up and shut out the outside and yeah maybe you can force the All Blacks into a stuttering arrhythmic game where the breaking ball lands in Pinot's hands and that can be the difference yeah um, that's what France will be trying to orchestrate is a bit of a scrap that ends up with a loose ball landing their way getting a nice Parisian bounce uh, in the cl- in the tail end of the game would, would see them home That's I think regardless of it if they, they need to play bloody brilliantly their pack need to step up and be brilliant all of those 6-2 split needs to work and it needs to kind of pay dividends in the yeah. second and half they just, they and need to even make then plays. it's tight yeah. yeah they need to make plays you need to see like a, a, a long I remember the Boutier against England yeah. Boutier is gone now but maybe Jaminet can find a little bit of that the yeah. long arching kick deep that bounces into touch and gets the crowd involved, yeah. forcing the, the, the All Blacks back, playing with that sort of almost undefinable energy that they bring to their best performances yeah. where they the teams are rattled or on their heels and discouraging the All Blacks because the All Black confidence, while supreme at times, can be brittle and if things go against them if if the French are dominating the ball if their defence isn't able to get if things they're off contacts. And if, yeah, if they're yeah. winning contacts but also just getting offloads keeping the speed up not allowing the All Blacks to get settled and then putting the ball in behind them and forcing them to exit constantly as, as they were in Dublin yeah. not able to attack which is all they really want to do yeah. um, just limited in terms of the opportunities they have to attack the game that would be massive and then conversely if you play them in if you drop balls in the midfield yeah, if you is, kick kick loosely to them if, yeah, if, if you kick tomorrow. at 22 and just get charged down and hand 7 points to them yeah um, then, you know. then, then you'll play them in then they'll be confident then they can run up a score and that's yeah. always going to be the danger and it's a challenge it's a challenge for DuPont who's the general absolutely of that team yeah, but also Entomac who's yeah. been given the, the go at 10 and Jaminet who's a huge boot to try and control the game and strike with and the boot guys, when they need like to guys like Aldrit who have been captain before um need to like just keep dialed in because like you, you get you switch off for a moment against New Zealand they punish you and yeah. like, France just have a terrible habit of switching off for moments yeah. in games and they do um, and they will be punished here like they, they did it they coughed up what could have been a famous series win in a similarly crazy buffoonish moment at the tail end of test one in Australia like they need to be sharp and be physical throughout and committed to doing an 80 minute showing committing like not only are is that their fitness has improved it used to be a, a thing that you could kind of make make France uh, kind of get tired and you still ca- somewhat can but they have improved in that area the standard of the top couture's has gone up the ball in play time is higher all of these guys generally fitter guys like Flamont coming in from the Toulouse pack brilliant player like and he's yeah. adding a lot in that and it's as you say tail end very long season for the All Blacks try and make that count if you can yeah. try and exert some pressure and be in the game or edge a lead with some scoreboard freeze pressure them freeze them out get the crowd involved yeah. get raucous you might be able to just yeah, use some of that juju that they definitely have. You, they, they respect you regardless of what this young generation has had to show for it, but they respect the badge of France. Yeah. And you can try and make that to their detriment uh, if you can play a smart game and a consistent game for 80, yeah. which remains to be seen. The jury's out whether they can do it or not. No, I think indeed. they're close to their right team. Mm-hmm. I think in the Six Nations, they were wrong in some areas. Full, they couldn't exit and stuff. And they found a few good things in Australia, although they did leave a lot of their main charges at home. They were wrong to be experimenting with the dual playmaking thing. It made no sense. They have two decent tens. They can rotate them on and off the bench. Yeah, and also your nine is your playmaker anyway. So yeah, exactly. what are you doing? Yeah, exactly. All of that. <laughs> yeah. All, and Fiku's out there. Who's effectively <laughs> yeah, a, a, a better playmaker than yeah, any so of your guys. It yeah. just was imbalanced. Whereas this is closer to balanced. I'm um, suspicious about the Wokey decision, but I think you can correct it with Taufi Fanua if it's not going well. You can obviously mm. change it. 
I, I want to see a close to an 80 minute show from this French yeah, team and just the, the, the defense of Ed, the Edwards defense massive but also Jaminet in the, in the Hugo Keenan role as it were because the All Blacks yeah, mopping up the, the All Blacks were kicking a lot last week and they might go back to it if they're not winning contacts or not finding edges on the multi-phase yeah. um, and then all of a sudden if you can force them to do that and Jaminet can deal with it you'll leave them in a place where only your own buffoonery could play them back in and while that does happen yes. you'll hope that it doesn't you don't want to like kick yourself to a good 15-10 lead with 30 minutes to go and then drop the restart and yeah. give up a scrum or charge down an exit kick or one of those French things that yes. they sometimes are, are want to do yeah. they're going to have to play a sharper ball to game Will Jordan that. for no good reason at all <laughs> like, or yeah. kick it to him the yeah. same, same no difference no tip on past well Jordan <laughs> yeah. what are you doing <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, um, and listen from the all black point of view yeah. I had to look at the other side of the coin um, it feels like a big game. Oh, um, it is. Yeah, it's, I think, it's, like, not, it's not quite do or die. Like they, 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 they are very quick to pull the uh, doom and gloom uh, thing, and uh, they have and a high bar for success. They do have a high bar for success, um, and they've lost two games this year, well, which is probably limboing under that high bar for success already. Yeah, but 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 the the thing is, they have played all back all black rugby this year. Yeah, and um, they've got back to it. And um, like, yes, there are some shortcomings. There's some imbalances in their team in terms of their multi-phase, in terms of their capacity to generate turnovers. I don't think the back rows worked. It's good to see Sam Kane back in because mm. obviously he was named captain. He is a bit of a ferret in terms of going into that breakdown and trying to hustle for it. That is more his mo as a game, and they they probably need more of that. They need to kind of replicate what McCall and guys like Kaina were bringing to that back row in that great team of 2015 to get the balance a bit more right but uh, but generally they should like <laughs> back to back losses are something they don't tolerate mm. but to be fair they don't tend to do them very often if at all no. like I can't remember the last time they did back to back L's to be honest um, this all black team I don't even know this um, no jeez I, I you'd have to go you. a ways back um, to yeah. find one and to be fair like they were they were humbled last week in Dublin and they were humble in response to it they were they were no excuses they were saying they were outplayed and they were accurate in their assessment of it but very often when they dust themselves down, like they like mm. they lost to the Springboks and then poor poor USA had to deal with their wrath yeah. in the next game and, and France they will be looking to exert their superiority. Yeah, they'll be looking at this. They'll be looking at a French team going, going like, hmm. they they they're, they're kind of nice. They play a little bit like us, but we're better. Yeah, and um, they're vulnerable yeah. and they can be got at. Yeah, and that's definitely what they'll be thinking. They'll also fancy dialing in the physicality as they always do the week after a loss. True, um, but more to the point, like. A successful season under Foster when they started the season, they have got back to playing all black rugby. But uh, the benchmark is very much win Bledisloe, win the rugby championship, and then that like that's priority one, priority two. Yeah. Then go and beaten in November, and then take the one spot back off the box. Those yes. were the those were the challenges. And last week's loss has coughed up the one spot back to the box. It's also chalked off any unbeaten November notions, and. A, a win this week it's conceivable if England can turn over the box that they could get their number one spot back Yes. Um, but as you say the, 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 the two defeats in November three on the season and all of a sudden despite winning every trophy they were playing for and like they are um, two tries away from their hundred tries in a yeah. season which they will likely uh, get in this game <laughs> oh yeah I would think so um, yeah, um, yeah it, it, won't, it won't go down as a success but it's not it, it, it's important to note that it's like it's, it might not be total success but it's also not failure Foster's job isn't under pressure yeah. they're not a side going nowhere necessarily as yeah. much as some Kiwi pundits will grumble after a loss yeah. There's, they still have plenty of nuggets or the of guys who keep commenting Scott Robinson in every Kiwi <laughs> Scott video. Robinson yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Razor, get him in now. Get him in yesterday. Uh, yeah. Like Fozzie's already discovered or rediscovered what they are meant to be about, but it is about tidying up uh, um, in terms of in, over the next couple of years. They will they will play this game, and then they will have to reassess and they will go away. And they have a big series now that that is all the bigger uh, courtesy of last week's result with Ireland when they resume their their uh, their play next year. So it's a building process for them, but it's still been very positive. And for this week, then, yeah, yeah they're going to try and but like no need for motivation when they're stung. They tend to come out firing to the pitch of the battle yeah. and they've named a very good side as well yeah. different side Aaron Smith is back that's good to see yeah. Yeah. yeah, he was saw a few clips of him training his passing still looking oh so sharp because yeah. he is the best in the world um, and yet they're like this is it Northern Hemisphere commentators will be saying like oh Anton Dupont best, best nine in the world Mm. very no. often it's been Aaron Smith oh, to be been, honest and I think he is the one the who is more proven uh, like Dupont is great and is like to be fair he was very impressive in the Argentina game because he was dealing with messy messy ball and he was getting it out of there and getting it out of there quick by being tough and yeah. he's good at that he's got good clutch good heart good running game he's, he's all skills he is one of the top scrum halves in the world but the tippity top 
is Aaron Smith Still, because yeah. what is the main job of a scrum half is just clearing those rooks and setting that tempo and, and the All Blacks passing. inexplicably yeah. just aren't quite as sharp when he's not there but when he's there it's the service is flawless yeah. it's like you don't know well, it's, it's that it's extra second flawless. it's that extra yeah. second and it's that extra step on your uh, on, on your run yeah. We've, even just a forward hit up becomes so much more dangerous because he's putting out a flat quick pass he doesn't need to take a step before he does it like to be fair TJ as good as he is sometimes takes a step before passing it his passes just take that extra second to yeah. get there as well whereas Smith fires these bullets out in front of you on the money just inviting you onto the line a little quicker yeah. gives the defence no time to set yeah. and then just ends up uh, generating a, a, a real dangerous tempo for a defence to try and cope with Indeed. you definitely want that to be part of the template but you also want to see some of these guys step up um, Akira Ioani getting a shout in the six jersey he needs to be big and physical in there he, is, he has been good off the bench but he definitely needs to show up here yeah. that he's got to start same with Sam Kane um, S- some guys who had tough gate who had tough days were, were moved out of this team um, yeah. Ethan Blackadder had a tough get, a tough day gone um, Sever Reese had a really poor game last week gone and yeah. they do like to drop the hammer down on guys who don't meet the standard yeah. sometimes however Dalton um, Papali'i feels more like a rest because he was to my mind their best performer last week and he's yeah. also gone and 28 um, tackles 28 mm-hmm. tackles against a bullish yeah. rampaging Ireland in Dublin maybe that's why you get the rest in plus Sam yeah. Kane back in is something they probably wanted some to do add some balance yeah it um, looks a more balanced back row on paper courtesy of Sam Kane being there it's like someone to go and foraging um, like they don't necessarily want to uh, commit to just tackling indefinitely and hoping for a mistake although it could work against France it's more likely to work against France than it was against Ireland last week Mm. in the mood that they were in but in general going forward they will need guys who are more willing to go into the fire and get that ball because like they were sniffing around breakdowns last week but not really wholeheartedly and they weren't able to get anything off I do want to see the return of that violent blitz as well that defensive blitz I want to see them specifically pressure Entomac yes because to be honest which Entomac is the kind of guy who is going to kick a terrible little dinky little thing in behind sooner than it'll take a mean contact from probably, someone shooting on him probably true. he's the kind of guy who might just panic and dink it to nowhere and Aaron Smith's covering and that's the turnover ball you so desperately want yes. they really need to bring that outside to win blitz blitz but in particular blitz Entomac yeah, I would uh, France are going to be looking to give Entomac like an easy ride like we're winning on the inside Dupont's the threat then when we're going to the outside Entomac gets it and he's got space and you're you're flat footed and then he can pick his passes and do his thing yeah. but the All Blacks want to be proactive and every time they see the ball going out to him they want to be in his yeah, face shoot shooting down Queen the outside Tupaya or whomever probably yeah. Sam Kane as well getting his face but yeah. uh, but Tupai is a good one he's physical as and well Rico just get Rico yeah. getting up in that passing lane and being like I dare you Roman yeah. I, do you think you're Finn Russell and probably he doesn't and then all of a sudden what's he do yeah. that's the kind of thing that they like just painting those terrible pictures can be enough to get a French team to do something very silly it's true um, it's so true. just fly, yeah, flying and up and showing what they the will outside. be encouraged with is their defence was mighty last week against, against has been mighty all their year. sternest test though as they were willing to they were admitted because yeah. the, the box beat them in a different fashion but uh, the, in terms of the offensive acumen of Ireland last week yeah. that was the toughest test that, the, that this defence faced all year and it came up really really well like conceding yeah. 29 points considering the possession stats the territory stats the contact collision zone stats in general they, yeah, and they, 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 the, the defense they didn't couldn't... concede twenty nine either. The no. def- like there, some of those were jackal penalties yeah, towards the tail end of the game. The defense conceded three tries, mm-hmm. two in quick succession, and one at the at the start of the game, and that yes. was for giving like a million entrances. Yes, um, indeed. So like against this French team, which are admittedly an attacking threat, but with their speed advantage in terms of Rico, uh, yeah, out of thirteen, like it's it just feels like they should have it in them to bottle up this French side and then capitalize on the inevitable forced mistakes. Yeah, that for, like, force them to kick France. And aren't badly badly. patient enough to go through the 20 phases or so that it'll take to kind of wear them down and get an inroad they will likely drop it on the toe after three or four that go awry and that's where you can pounce on turnover and stuff if if it's an open game at all they'll fancy their chances of transitioning and punishing France Um, and then they're right to as well Um, just I suppose running through the team it's much the same team uh, in in the type five are the same isn't it Moody Coles oh sorry Dane Coles comes in Gets the gets the start, um, yeah. and actually Toki Aho as well as is in there as well. Cody so Taylor, Cody Taylor out, yeah. um, as well, and then the back line as we were alluding to Quint Pye and Rico Ioani in the midfield. George Bridge gets a run out on the one one wing with Will Jordan on the other, and Jordy Barrett uh, retains his jersey at fullback. But crucially, I think they've improved their bench. 
in terms of the back line they have Brad Weber Damian McKenzie and David Havili Damian, Mc, Damian McKenzie was someone they could have desperately used last week and he's a good eye to introduce in the second half against a French team that could be very open at that uh, he stage win, he wins one on one battles yeah. all the time yeah. um, he's got electric footwork and a really good passing game and can just make things happen it's true um, yeah. love DMAC definitely always should be involved for the All Blacks if they want to stay true to themselves and play yeah. their best game and they've also got George Bauer back in on the bench with Ofatu and Afasi which will definitely give them some heft to match the uh, the Springbok uh, or not the Springbok the the um, six two split of the French yes and uh, Tupovai and Shannon Frizzell do need to be used this week yes indeed um, uh, and little Brad Weber although I suppose I don't know if they'll want to take Aaron Smith see, off. depends how how the game is going of course yeah. but um, they'll definitely fancy just yeah w- winning it pro- probably predominantly through the defensive game forcing some mistakes and then countering and winning the kicking duel through Jordy Barrett yeah. as well and then countering off chaos yeah. ball try and be the um, more disciplined more calm team in the yeah. chaos and um, that should edge and capitalise on the mistakes and yeah. when the French are a little disjointed they're, they're probably off, off set piece and multi-phase they'll be tough to break down they are that Sean Edwards coach team and the All Blacks will likely have to be a bit patient they might have to kick the ball down deep win some territory battles trust that Jordy Barry will edge them through Jordy Barrett will edge them through the kicking game until the French dial out in a moment yes. on a chaos ball at which point you strike yes and it would be nice to see the likes of Dane Coles getting himself out in the wide channels and doing some damage as well and just getting that offence kind of purring a bit more and I think it will already with the injection of Aaron Smith to help Moanga out and it's a big game for Moanga to have it to try and dictate and control because he was pretty poor off the bench in, in that Ireland showing as well and he's he's obviously up against it because Bowden Barrett is the guy fighting him for the jersey and it's like the best yeah, and he's losing around. the battle again yep. like it, the Moanga Mo seasons are going on a terrible trajectory of like starting really really high with the Crusaders looking imperious best 10 in the world behind that supreme pack yeah brilliant 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 july series excellent again maintaining those levels Bledisloe, you know, he's, he's kind of not quite as impactful somehow but still very good and has some big plays but he's going down a little bit and then slowly as the season goes on loses his jersey to Bowden Barrett becomes less impactful as the Springboks come and matches pack doesn't make the right reads in the game like it's probably a harsh criticism of me I still think he's a brilliant player true but just and on, in terms of the level that the season tends to start here with the Crusaders and just go a little down when, when it comes to Richie Monga and uh, I definitely think if he wants to take that 10 jersey he'll need to sign a, off the season yeah, with, a, with a, a nice stamp a of performance, we'll beat yeah. France and do it in style and with a plum in Paris that uh, that is definitely yeah, the plan size for up Entomac and step him yeah. that's always a way yeah, through Monga can beat special. guys one on one yeah he's got some great um, footwork he's got a great little chip on him as well or, or you can you know trust trust the back line use that service from Smith to try and find Rico to try and find Jordan and, you know, yeah if, it, if the French are in, in any yeah. way dialed out and if they can overload Fiku or fool Fiku in some way and get yeah, to the edge just then, get Jordan yeah. the ball 1v1 with Pano or whomever I think he, I'd back him in yeah, that circumstance well, Jordan is the hottest winger in town right now so absolutely yeah. he's a man although Pano is down, like I, I kind of give the edge to the person with the ball in that matchup yeah <laughs> like they're both good runners of the ball but they can maybe let him go and defend I think Jordan's probably the slightly superior defender but uh, yeah no in terms of how how do you think it's going to go um I, yeah, I, I think, kind of think the All Blacks are going to win. Yeah, I agree. Because I, I, I don't have it in me to predict back-to-back L's for New Zealand. I just don't think it, there's wisdom in it. And no. to be honest, I've yet to be wrong in that uh, in my predictions. Maybe one of these days I'll be wrong. One of these days mm. they will lose two in a row. But I don't think it's this and day. that third team is going to feel some heat. Oh, um, yeah, no, no I, think, I think the French will be victim to the backlash. And I think New Zealand are just a superior team to this France team. Like I'm excited by this young France side, and um, but you were right to point out like they still haven't reached that that O nine and mid aughts team, and not really even no, close. They have, they they have, have yet to prove to, it. They have they to prove it. It's it. been yeah. flashy. It's been too too fla- a little style, more flash than substance. Style over substance. A little, a little bit, bit. Yeah. somewhat. Um, just just. A but I do think it'll be a pretty. Uh, aesthetically pleasing game just really given fun. given the way both these sides play I hope it's um, not a blowout I hope that France gets some stuff off score some so wonderful I. tries that, it, that it's an absolute game yeah. um, I fear it could be a, a one sided game if the French don't don't rock up with everything they got yeah, because the Kiwis just rock up and do a camate and put 60 on them maybe yeah I don't know I don't think they're putting 60 on them but I think they could, they, they should have too much I think they'll camate rally. or capo Opango. I think camate this week camate yeah I think it might be Capo Opanga again. But no, I, th- I think I think they go back to Kamate after last week's excursion into Capo Opanga land. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, who you got in this one? It is a great, great game, as always. Like, France really All Blacks. Les Bleus versus the All Blacks is just box, box office. office. Yeah. It is It is one of the sexier fixtures in world rugby. And yeah, we're just looking forward to it. Saturday night, going to be going down in Paris. 
<laughs> Absolutely. We're going to move on now to Sunday. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Yes. We have finally reached the crescendo of the show. And we've come to the main event, apparently. <laughs> I don't know about Ireland that. hosting Argentina in what is set to be not perhaps the prettiest game of the weekend. Uh, this is taking place at Stade Viva in Dublin, uh, kicking off at quarter past two GMT. Matt Carley of A the RFU in charge with Christoph Ridley and Adam Leal on the sidelines and Tom Foley in the box. Yeah, TMOing. Um, and uh, yeah, this obviously Ireland Argentina, particularly in the context of World Cups, is a a, a game with much history Definitely to it, a rivalry, much rivalry right. to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think overall they met twenty three times. 14 wins to Ireland, 8 to Argentina, 1 drawn game. Um, and the, the, um, uh, obviously, you look at 1999, yeah, you had the Argentinians knocking Ireland out of the World Cup. You go back to 2003, you had Ireland knocking the Argentinians out of the World Cup. Yeah. You go to 2007, Argentinians again knock Ireland out of the World Cup. Fast forward to 2015, Argentinians knock Ireland out of the World Cup. I mean, yes. it is there have been so many consequential matchups between these two teams. Not many of them we've come out the better of, it's but true. we do have an imperious record against them in, in these November games in Dublin. Yes, they have yet to um, win in Dublin. Yeah. Um, they have yet to win in Irish soil, I should say, as well. Ireland have only won twice, I think, in, in Argentinian soil, although one of those games is one of the five games that actually are only fully capped matches for Argentina, rather than Ireland don't count them. I think there were yeah, games yeah. between 1950s and 70s but it's way back a ways back when um, their only draw actually came amongst them as well so they've yeah it's, it's a curious record with that one but uh, yeah the recent record is is more serious when there's money on it when the chips are down it's a great game and yeah, as you say like we've, we've given and taken we've probably taken a bit more than we've given on balance in those World Cups but Argentina in autumn tend to be a different animal um, compared to the certainly World Cup mode and we are two years away from a World Cup they have not been very impressive this year. There's no doubt about that. They have been more impressive in the last couple of weeks than they were in the Rugby Championship. There is something to be said for that. They've definitely kind of picked up their game. We know what they're about. It's about Ireland being consistent and being able to deliver uh, in a yeah, game that they won't be quite as as pitched or as, as emotionally charged. And certainly the, the crowd won't be anywhere near as mm. emotionally charged as they were last week for the All Blacks game. Yeah, I mean, um, it, it, it on paper, you know, if you're looking at this from the outside, you're thinking, ah, Ireland beat the All Blacks. You know, Argentina, no match compared to the All Blacks. Surely this is a routine win. But the reality is that um, this could become a sticky game for Ireland. Could, um, could very easily. The, the way that they played last week, certainly. Keep ball, hold ball. It's the game that Argentina want to play. They want to play defence. They want you to have the ball. This is going to be an Ireland team. They're going to find it a lot harder to win the game line than they did against the All Blacks. Um, the, the Pumas will be just so dialed in to not losing the game line. It is pretty much all they have. Yeah. Um, and not, not, not losing that game line. They also are going to be missing Gibson Park and Sexton, which has been the core of everything they've been doing on offence. Yes. As much as the ball playing forwards have worked so well, the speed from 9 and direction from 10 has been everything to how this offence is hummed and you've seen in moments when Carberry and Murray came in it yeah. stopped and it became yeah. more kicking oriented straight away right back to what it was beforehand I mean Murray just just kicks I mean he just resets and kicks from the middle third he doesn't do anything else yeah. and so the, the real challenge is can Ireland in the absence of winning the game line easily get moving on offence without Sexton without Gibson Park this is an interesting it's challenge, challenge and it's, it a, a it's challenge. very much up in the air as to whether they can actually get moving against true. a tough, tough defence. Yeah. Really tough. It's very true. Um, can, they, can they back up an historic win with a slightly more routine one, but with a changed side and with slightly changed tactics? Because you will have to change tactics. You'll have to kick a fair bit. You'll have to try and play territory against the side that like you certainly like you want to play keep the ball and go at them and get your offense going, but you do it on your terms in their territory where you aren't gonna run the risk of coughing up a cheap three which is one of their few avenues to scoring rather you like it sometimes you might get pinned for it for a ceiling or you might get they might get the better of you and be able to exit but if it's a midfield lineup they set line out they set up through a, an exit you can defend them for a couple of phases they'll probably kick it back to you and can reset that there's yeah, limited no risk in that regard so you should try and pay a, play a patient territory based game and try and put the squeeze on and in those moments back that you have more in the offensive end to get the result, which has kind of been the MO for all the tier one sides that have beaten them so far this year. Your South Africa. Yeah, it's just been winning enough moments. Win, win enough moments and it'll tell on the scoreboard because they will probably defend too much. And even the way they beat Italy last week was by kicking the leather off the ball and just capitalising on mistakes. So don't 
cough up yeah. mistakes you know be be solid under the high ball be give as good as you get in the kicking area in the kicking department and then ultimately have more in your locker as far as an offensive acumen is concerned that's yeah. that's going to be the MO well, the for set, them the set piece is huge the it set is. piece is absolutely massive in this game can Ireland get generate the ins against the Pumas from, from mall situations but from line out moves yeah. can they um, get one well just get solidity and a bit of and a bit of go for it at scrum time so that yeah. they can launch off that and can they play that smart footy that Paul O'Connell wants them to play using set piece to leverage their attack to get their very excellent for and dynamic footballing forward pack to unpick this Pumas defence. I mean, it's a great matchup on paper. It is. But the Pumas, they give up nothing to nobody so far yeah. this year. The Springboks uh, had to work really, really hard to get to the end of them, but yeah. ultimately out-muscled them. Do Ireland fancy playing that attritional a game against them? No. So then how do you move? How do you get around them? You saw Ty Furlong in that pivot position last week. You've got to really lean into that. You've got to make fools of them, really, because yeah. they come flying out of the line. They want to hit you. They give you very little options. So you have to pick sharp lines. You have to pick the right yeah. options off each other to, to unstick them and to win contacts against them. And then once you get around the corner, then they start giving up penalties. They, they get do. sloppy. And they shoot. Um, Sometimes if there's enough deception, you saw the All Blacks doing lovely things and the Bowen mm-hmm. Barrett doing sexy out the back side pa- sidearm passes after Kramer's flapping in. Yeah, yeah. Adam like Kramer is not impotent he's a very powerful man but he like there there are things bad habits like discipline in this Argentina t- side that that are still prevailing that that, that pack is a little meatheadish and sometimes a little uh, a little gung ho to just throw a shot in or be be a bit cheeky and a bit reckless and a bit nasty at times yeah. but that only gets brought out through pressure like you saw in Italy last week there was no issue Kramer scored mm. the first try they were great Matera was throwing skip passes off the left hand to capitalise on tries they're, they're good footballers themselves as well as well as being sometimes some somewhat headers it's on Ireland to try and turn that screw enough that you can then mm. be like because Ireland are quite a disciplined side that is one of the things that is definitely in our column over this Argentina side is that like Argentina are on one end of the spectrum of being pretty terribly disciplined for a tier one side Ireland are nearly the most disciplined you'll find in terms of when they are organised and are going through their process they don't give away as many penalties yeah. they're pretty technical about their work and it, that's got to be a point of difference you're at home yeah. just and make, the, the, the reveal the, their bad habits the offensive breakdown them. I mean last week against Italy it was comical how much joy the Pumas were getting on the defensive breakdown yes. and it was mostly Julian Montoya but we know that uh, Matera can do it as well yeah. we know that Kramer, Kramer has a steal yeah, yeah. We, we know it's these, not even a steal yeah. like they were roughing up poor Varney a lot of the time sure that is, yeah, but yeah. It just, just winning those breakdowns clearing those rooks that would be a picture that the Pumas haven't had before and that's a winning picture like we, we we boast about this this dynamic Ireland pack this is a really big test for them without Sexton without Gibson Park to win one-on-one matchups against a tough tough defense very tough, and to yeah. just like it, it, by through picking smart options winning the game line and then when Montoya goes in over the ball Blast your James Ryan clean outs blasting them out of it exactly Tight right furlong clear it's exactly the monstrous like, like removal yeah. of the of the jackler entirely from the and, breakdown exactly yeah. and then you want the game playing out a little like the Scotland one did um uh, this year um from an Ireland point of view only the Pumas offense isn't nearly as good as the Scots so they won't pad the score um, so, but basically you're just causing them out they're, they're a defence that loves to jackal so much and they can't jackal because the Irish are giving them an offensive breakdown picture that they just can't deal with yeah. they can't get in they have no sniff and then the Pumas will get frustrated if they yeah. can't get an in if they can't get their hands on the ball uh, b- breakdown then, after then breakdown then a high tackle might come yeah, yeah or no arms tackle yeah, yeah. or any of that stuff that's kind of what Ireland need to be doing but I definitely think it needs to be quick it needs oh, to yeah. be dynamic you need to see all of those all of those little interplays that you saw last week so yeah, important to unstick this smart, defense. Be smart. They're if you're, very good. If, you, if you're stupid or slow, or which like they're both one and the same in this, it's stupid to be slow against yeah. them because they're physical. You play yeah. them in. Like they, they, they get. They will be easily discouraged if you can be dynamic and kind of pick them apart in the early goings and build a score and build a bit of scoreboard pressure. It's tough for them to see their ins back into the mm. game with the stall that they're playing. So that's why it's kind of easy to play them in some regards. But there are trappings there. Like if you are complacent and if you are sluggish in it. You play them right in. You yeah. saw that in the game they won against the All Blacks. Like the All Blacks were a little bit dulled out in terms of their offense, and they were keeping on trying. And mm. same with the one that they drew with the Wallabies. They were like flinging the ball very gung ho that young Wallaby side uh, around yeah. the middle of third, and then suddenly, yep, poach, yeah. yep, 
oh, three oh, points up. You, and then overplaying in your half yeah. can be a mistake, especially when the Pumas will so obligingly just set up shop in their own half and play the whole game there yeah. when they're just no threat. Yeah. You know their offense isn't going to be threatening, so if you can just stop them from getting penalties at rooks and set pieces, you limit their method of getting up the field, and if you show enough on offense, you'll navigate yourself enough room to edge the kicking battle and then play the game down there until they wear and tear and give up penalties from which you can get threes and then eventually get yourself a try and edge into a, a, a the lead in a kind of a low scoring non-classic yes. is your Irish picture that is definitely the yeah. Irish picture we've seen it a few times before it, it, it's it, I'd like to see us con- exert control I'd like to see our barnstorming offence keep its momentum going and I'd like to be honest I'd love to see us side them open on phase one from a few set piece moves well sure that's <laughs> ideal scenario but yeah no I'd like managing the game well uh, it's a big challenge for who, for the halfbacks to try and dictate that but uh, but generally I think we are like with home advantage as well and just momentum and form I think we should be confident going into this fixture and it's, it's just about arriving to the pitch and being consistent it has been a buzzword in the camp they've been talking about it they are aware of the trappings of like high emotional come back in on a lower ebb so they're going to try and mitigate that as much as they can but playing their own game and playing it smart should no, be listen, enough they, they celebrated last week from beating the All Blacks but there was no inkling of getting carried away yeah. I mean we're officially not allowed to anymore yeah, well, literally it doesn't matter what happens we could go unbeaten from now until September 2023 it's not going to matter you cannot get carried we're not allowed Yeah, we've done it too many times before yeah, you're yeah. not allowed don't yeah. care you have to you're just building 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 adding blocks trying to improve that's uh, that's always the point for Ireland yeah. um, and uh, from the Pumas point of view in terms of winning this game it's a curious one um, obviously they have this this history with Ireland um, we know what this team is um, any thoughts of them developing offensive patterns really not not less not, so like they'll take a try if there's a 3v2 they can do yeah, that yeah. and their forward like, like, Matera has a lovely pass on them mm. and like they they have skills oh. and stuff and their offensive instincts are still there that yes. was what was encouraging about their showing in Italy last mm. week was they managed to with the kicking which is the primary yes, attack that's just good eventually say. you end up in a scenario against Italy where you have the ball back in their territory and there's numbers on this side mm. and then they can, they can execute they, they, in that they scenario the ball, yeah, yeah Moroni yeah. will find a good pass or he'll find it like they, they have good players out there but Ireland are, are kind of operating at a level where they're more used to more sophisticated mm. offences coming at them and they're, they're like their offense, their defence has not always been alert to them they still cough up a few cheap tries uh, when they're there and perhaps are, that it breaks such that Argentina just have to put it through the hands and find a try at one point but their MO is going to be kicking. They're going to try and challenge the air. They're going to try and defend. That is, they like, they're, yeah. they're, you're not going to see them do wholesale change in the last game of the year at all. What you will say for them is they actually have a better record north than they do in, did in the south. Obviously, they were winless sure. in the southern hemisphere, but this year they're actually 2 1 and 1 up in the uh, the northern hemisphere. Who are the they? two wins for? They beat Wales, they beat Romania, and, and they, they beat they Italy. Oh, sorry, they're 3 1 and yeah, 1. Yeah, yeah now, so, yeah, yeah, 3 1 and 1 which is actually pretty decent uh, showing up in north in the Northern Hemisphere from them. So they will try and carry a bit of that momentum into this. They know that they like they can match up okay against Ireland some of the times. They have good history there. Yeah. They, they will probably have a, be aware of the fact that they've never won in Dublin and it is a one to t- try and target. Um, yeah, I just don't know if I, I see, <laughs> see their avenues apart from defensive ones. I think they can yeah, defend well, this young Irish side very gamely for most of it. It's the, about whether they can win the kicking duel. Yeah, well, it, certainly in part that's true, and Buffelli is going to have a big a big role to play. But yeah. listen, the, the way, as I said in, in, the, in the context of the Ireland preview, the way that Ireland played last week against the All Blacks is exactly the way the Pumas want to play. Yeah. Like Ireland moved the ball a lot from the middle third. They attacked quite, they, they kept it in hand. They wanted to run through phases. And that is the primary battle of this game. Yeah. Ireland cleared the offensive breakdown tremendously against the All Blacks. They won every contact. They zipped over the game line. They maneuvered their way down, to the, fi- down the field smartly. Now all of a sudden, no uh, Gibson Park, no Sexton. Their, their offense is, is bound to be it will be more clunky yeah. and they might be encouraged by what they're doing and all of this Andy Farrell juju to go out and be, be themselves express themselves the Pumas need to get out of the line on the inside pressure 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 smash them give them nothing on the inside and then when they run that little when they run that little screen play to the 10 on the outside likely Carberry trying to run that same play that Sexton runs only it probably won't be as smart somebody in Carberry's face smashing him yes. forcing turnovers on the defensive end primarily in their territory yeah. generating penalties kicking threes 
that is absolutely the mantra to, uh, to, to discourage this Ireland side and just give them nothing up. It is a defensive performance that will win it for them, as well as a kicking one. I mean, Ireland probably, would, if, 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 they, if the Argentinians start dominating the defensive end, Ireland will go back to the kicking game. True. And then it's Buffelli up against Keenan, and that's like an elite aerial matchup that Buffelli will fancy after last yeah, week. He's, he's a very strong player. He's, quite, he's the taller yeah. of the two, and he's very, he was imperious last week, but then so was Keenan. It's a really good box office matchup because both of these sides fancy themselves a good kicking side. A good footballing side yeah. as well as anything as well as everything else so that will be one of the games that if, if Argentina are to be successful they'll have to edge that battle for sure generally just need to be better at exiting and, and setting up camp in op- in opponents 22s for a while we saw it like they were able to do it against Italy and and they, it yielded good dividends they ended up scoring some rather nice tries but against mm. tier one sides they, they generally haven't mm. been able to and even in the games against Wales that they won with their physicality they were still not great in that particular no, department. And I don't um, think they're going to blow Ireland away physically I don't like so. th- at all. Like, well, you talk about the three wins they've had up north. It was Wales minus Lions and injuries. Romania, the tier two side, and Italy, the tier two side. Yes. Ireland but, is out to yeah. step up from that. It is. And Ireland, um, not only that, but Ireland as a pack, as a, as a forward unit, have dominated all of their games this year. Um, yeah. They haven't always won them, to be gone, courtesy of the Baxter. In the, the first two games in the sixth, the, the forwards have won their matchups all year. Um, so it is a tough ask for this Argentina defence. It's as tough a, a pack just, as they'll face since the Springboks. Yeah. Um, and they didn't win that matchup in this, um, against the Springboks. And where are the points coming from? Yeah, the the points are probably primarily defensive. Um, yes, turnovers in the middle for third, the, resulting in a Buffelli yeah. 3, 6, 9, 12... 15, 18, yeah, 21. And then maybe um, a mole try if they can yeah. generate that, if they can get a penalty and move it to the corner on one occasion or two occasions. And then maybe, as you say, the kick chase tries. But a bit like the box, and actually worse than the box, let's be real, they have limited, limited the ways that they can score because their passing remains pretty damn clunky yeah. in the multi-phase and Car- the Irish blitz like Carberry interception um, is probably one of their ins for um, sure yeah 100% it is um, mm. and that's a worry of mine um, but uh, they are like they are a little rudimentary and you're right to cite that Ireland's pack has been mean and physical and it could play out a little like their game against the Springboks yeah. where they're trying to bring a forward oriented game to a team that's able to handle them and mm. they don't have much else yeah. and Ireland do have a bit more and Ireland see at home that's certainly how I hope it'll that go. That's how I hope it's, um, it's also kind of how I suspect it will. Um, yeah. I mean, five tries last week for the for the Argentinians. Can they score, Can they find some here? That's the first time in a while they've managed five. So there is a bit of momentum they carry in. Mm. But uh, but it is the last game of their long season as well. A fair bit of travel. A, a few of their guys have been talking about being away for quite a while. Looking forward to going home. Christmas in mind. Um, I sure, plenty of them have to have like they're all I know, European. A lot, of, a lot of them are based Christmas in and like, Christmas in the top no, of the yeah, is all yeah, they have to look forward yeah, no, to. But that's still less jet lagged than they are used to yeah, being yeah. in this regard. So no, it's a long season. I do suspect Ireland will win, and I hopeful that we win quite cleanly and comfortably. The, the fear is that we end up in a scrap, and if we end up in a scrap, we will lose some men because. Have they have Argentina failed to injure someone in any of these oh, games? They're pretty, so far? pretty. They are angular mean, and physical, pretty, yeah. and they, they do hit bloody hard both sides of the pill. Like even their even their offensive game, it, it, it is rudimentary. It needs a bit more, but they will bring big carriers around the corner, and you have to tackle them, and that's tough as well. But I do think Ireland are in a better ebb at the minute, and are a better team at the minute, and are at home. Um, my hope is we win pretty cleanly, and our offense kind of gets a chance to shine against a really good defense. My fear is that we end up in a in a dog in a, a proper scrap, and my real fear is that we lose that scrap. But I think my more realistic fear is we end up in a scrappy game that we ultimately win, but at a cost. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's probably my assessment as well. I'm yeah. I'm curious is what yeah. I am. I'm curious to see if the offense works without Sexton. Murray Kinsler had a piece, and I rarely disagree with him, the rugby analyst out here in Ireland. But he was saying like how Ireland's um, offence has, has blossomed moving away from its dependence on Sexton. Mm. Um, but yet what I'm seeing, like as much as Sexton doesn't have as much touches as he used to have, he's calling all the plays and every time he leaves the field, it becomes less good. Yeah, the try stop. Um, yeah. We scored three tries with Sexton yeah. on the field and no tries with Sexton off the field last Indeed. week. And um, that's, yeah. that's a constant theme. I mean, yeah. in, even in the Japan game the week prior, once Sexton went off, it, it, it got worse. And yeah. so this is going to be a game entirely without Sexton and for good measure without Gibson Park, as I've mentioned before. So I'm curious. Yeah. Can we do it? Can we get it moving? The, fourth, the pack is excellent, but how are we going to go back and play a scrappy game I think ultimately what I'm what I'm leaning on for my prediction is just that I'm more impressed with the Pumas approach I don't think that it generates enough points for them yeah. I think as mean as they are they'll just lose just about every game 
against the top tier sides because they don't score enough points. Yeah, I think you're um, probably right in boiling yeah. it down to that. I think that, that's basically where it'll be decided. Ireland have been managing to find some points uh, yeah. over the last year, and I think at home it will be our victory. But who do you got in this final game of the weekend? Let us know in the comments down below how the Sunday game will go. But uh, yeah, without any more ado, I think that wraps up our previews for this weekend. We will move on. Absolutely. Yeah, a couple of other things to touch on. We're going to touch on the Stellenbosch quadrangular series going on in Africa. Um, just to let you know what's going on elsewhere in lower level test rugby. But Namibia thumped Kenya, scored a bunch load of tries. It was a 26-24 to game at the start of the second half. It finished 60-24. to um, yeah. Namibia turned it on towards the tail end and ran in a bunch against the poor Kenyans. Zimbabwe, meanwhile, defeated Brazil egg on the South American 24, face. 24 22, a tight one. A yeah. nice dramatic one for that one. Brazil thinking they could travel to Africa. Bad, bad loss for them. And uh, now the winners, the final is going to be between Namibia and Zimbabwe. It's a good That's thing that they have weekend. that on Saturday as well, just because they couldn't have moved it to Sunday along with <laughs> like, Given that all the rugby is happening on Saturday, they well, also. It'll happens. be on YouTube, so watch it, it on will. demand. Yes, it's broadcast um, on World Rugby's YouTube, yeah. uh, so it is on demand yeah. as you want to watch yeah. it. Namibia, Zimbabwe final. And and Brazil um, uh, Kenya, yeah. Kenya runner up battle that's also going on to wrap up that series and we also want to touch on the women's game um, Ireland managed to generate a good win over the US last Indeed. week in the um, RDS it was encouraging signs found um, Bavin Parsons Bavin in Parsons space the moment um, of the match was that brilliant Bavin Parsons try and she yeah. is brilliant like and I like Flood as well at Tab 10 it was a good cross kick to find her but uh, yeah she is the danger give her the ball for so the love good. of God give her the ball so good <laughs> and uh, yeah Leah Lyons was excellent <coughs> as well and Ireland managed to chalk up a somewhat predictable win against like the fourth best side in the world yeah. while well, they're not in the World Cup it's yeah. it's kind of all too familiar yes um, but yeah. the, the off field issues still dominating the headlines in the Irish women's game true um, Zambia beat Namibia 75-5 in another game that was going on Wales without um Jazz Joyce did manage to beat the South Africans 29-19 France absolutely ran up a score against these Black Ferns who have been left behind in the they off have, season yeah. and England and France are certainly your 1-2 and two in the world they right look now it. They, are, um, they are it, it yeah. was the, the great unknown was how world champion Black Ferns would cope with this new new look England and France because France have been keeping France, we, yeah. we sing England's praises because they have been the ones that have won these contests but like they've been one score games France yeah. are mixing it with that England team I'm and hammering the, everyone else and they're the yeah. only ones that's it yeah. those two are fo- flying away from the competition and it has been a stern wake up call for the Black Ferns and they will have a year, in advance, a year yeah. in advance and they will have work-ons coming from this tour but um, yeah Northern News Canada that very impressive very decent Canada size went to the Twickenham Stoop and shipped 51 points to England scoring 12 of their own and um, just good. it is what it is um, and Scotland scored 36 against Japan's women who scored 12 so a good win in Edinburgh for Scotland's women as well and then this weekend we have some good fixtures as well um, interesting ones we have Ireland v Japan in the RDS, which will be interesting to see. Uh, obviously, Japan having to bounce back off a loss from uh, against Scotland, you would have Ireland firm favourites in that one. Um, France v New Zealand again. France v the Black Ferns. It's, it's, yeah, it's tough. The, the end of the Black Ferns d- dismal tour, and they'll yes, probably lose they'll it badly probably again. Lose it but again. then they'll have time to reflect and get better. They and they will. have their Super Rugby out there all next do. year, which will allow them to get a look at the depth of talent they have in the country yeah. and perhaps make some adjustments. And they'll as probably needed. all be doing off season kind of fitness work because it's not yeah. like it, like it. It used to be the dynamic that it's like they're perhaps more physical but the black ferns are more skillful but it's been it's been pretty total the outmatch like oh, they've yeah. been less skillful less sharp on the set piece less fast le- like they haven't oh. they've been outmatched in every department which is a concern a massive concern for them yeah. so they'll be going off to the grindstone as soon as this tour is over no question um, no question um, the game of the weekend is definitely Wales-Canada it's probably yeah. probably an interesting one I'm not sure if Canada or Wales are favourites Wales obviously with a couple of home wins but Canada ranked well ahead of them yeah um, interesting should interesting be a fun dynamic one. in the Cardiff Arms Park that's on and, uh, Sunday as well the USA women are lambs to the slaughter this week oh, for the England USA, this time in like, Leicester they, they struggled in the RDS against a very game Irish team in, in, particularly up front they were actually struggling in the pack and yeah the, the prospect of going to face England in six ways this time out in Worcester um, but yeah they, that's going to be a proper pumping and fair play to the, the England women they have rotated very well they've used a load of uh, different like six ways this week they've had one in uh, up near Exeter they've had one in Northampton they are moving moving the uh, the team around and putting a show on for them and they are just bloody good to watch they are playing this game as well as it has ever been played the women's game of rugby it's it's 
really encouraging the red the roses are kind of flying that flag and yeah the the, the one i'm interested to see is is if there's a defiant black ferns kind of few tries or if they can manage 20 points or something because they haven't done that yet against france but uh yeah it's england france those are the ones like we were curious going into this series how it would match up it was looked a tough challenge for the black ferns to be going back to back against england back to back against france and it looks like they're going to lose all of those games and it is just a tough wake-up call that has been the narrative for me out of this one yeah um, um, there's also been some as you say off the off the field stuff that has dominated the women's game over here mm. um, which is unfortunate given that uh, there's actually a fair bit of good footy going on on the field as well yeah no question it's been a good uh, November series in the w- women's game too and we're looking forward to the games this weekend um, but with that we're going to move on to our final segment of the show yeah. the rugby news of the week and we have a bit of who's all right to get to and we're going to start obviously with the the headline grabber of the weekend uh, or of the week that was um we're also uh, Razi Erasmus uh, World Rugby has confirmed that his comments towards match officials um constituted misconduct and to that end he's been suspended from all match day activities until September 30th of next year and from all rugby activities for a period of two months and now that is a not a correct uh, that's the headline that was going around Razzie ban for two months not two months it's two test months uh, which means it's the whole July tour and the whole rugby championship of next year so essentially it's banned from a year from what they call rugby activities which I think I saw somewhere defined as like coaching and a couple of other things but like he's obviously the director of rugby in yeah. South Africa um, and he's not a world but like, rugby ha- employee how do they well, like, I don't know. Like they, they, they operate under rug- the remit of world rugby, guess, so but... they, they, they do have judicial power in that sense. But like, it, what happens if he makes a phone call and chats about rugby to Ninab, or Is that breaking the rules? I assume it must be then. Yeah, and weird, it, though, it, it, like, how do you even enforce that? I don't know. Um, well, <laughs> like, obviously, he can't show up to Matt's days or, or like do anything official like that. But he'd I'd... be in the mascot. Who's that new South African mascot? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's the, Razzie. The bus driver. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. think he tweeted something out to that effect. Yeah, so yeah. Something him hiding out in the bushes. He's always got a cheeky tweet or two. He does. Um, I mean, yeah. It's obviously I'm, I'm kind of between minds on this. Um, they he let's just run through the charges that he had. Um, so basically, he uh, they their world rugby is saying that he's guilty of threatening a match official. That unless the a requested meeting took place, he'd gonna he was gonna publish footage to the um to the world and the media critic uh, containing clips which criticized the match official's performance and then making good on that threat. Um, published uh, or permitted to be published the uh, the Erasmus video containing numerous comments that were either abusive, assu- insulting, and or offensive to match officials, um, attacked, disparaged, and or denigrated the game and the match officials, uh, did not accept or observe the authority and decisions of the match officials, published or caused to be published criticism of the manner in which a match official handled a match. Uh, engaged in conduct or activity that may impair public confidence in the integrity and good character of match officials and brought the game into disrepute when he published or caused to be published the Erasmus video. Uh, and one, the one thing I will say uh, about this as well is that Razzie's defence was really stupid. It was. Um, I, this, this idea that like, oh, I didn't publish the video, I just you know just sent the video did. to some guys but Joe they Schmidt must have moved it on or like I, it was just nonsense. You, you threatened to publish the video then you, you know they they did they didn't make the meeting for you or give you your review on time and then you didn't publish the video like yeah. that's what happened like yeah. everyone knows this it was a terrible defense and they just came to the reasonable they like the, I did like the way that they kind of just breezed over that and went I don't care if we can't technically prove it and it's super uh, circumstantial we all know you published the video we're satisfied you published the video yeah. and that that kind of that I much I agree with that kind of hampered his defense yeah. um and I will read you as well just for some context um what uh, Nick Berry himself had to say yes um, because he had some strong words question, yeah, he's, yeah he's the ref in question exactly who was the subject of the of the video so he was saying needless to say that the situation the whole situation has been extremely uh, difficult for his family and himself he was saying his he understands that his performances will be heavily scrutinised especially in such a prestigious tournament but the public attack on his integrity and character is not something that should be tolerated in any workplace um, he was saying he considered officiating an alliance tour comparable with the World Cup. He was an honour to have achieved the appointment, but now due to the actions of Mr. Erasmus, his family and him have um, endured a significant amount of distress and will only have me- negative memories from the whole experience. He says, I feel that Mr. Erasmus engaged in a character assassination of me on social media. I've spent many years building my reputation as an international referee and in the course of his video, which was posted online, he has caused it immeasurable damage. 
though a small proportion of the rugby community will follow the outcome of the, that matter and in the process obtain an accurate account of what really occurred, the wider community will only be aware of me in the context of this incident and I feel that regardless of the outcome and any, any sanctions imposed, my reputation as a referee will be forever tarnished. Hmm. Um, strong comments from him. Um, Very much so. And um, I don't doubt, you know, uh, speaking from his his uh, uh, position, honest ones, and, and certainly I, I imagine it's been a bit of an ordeal for himself. True enough. Um, and yeah, he was saying it, that he, the video brought into question his professionalism and integrity and sort of it goes on in that vein. Yes. Um, they also, uh, the other thing they demanded was that Erasmus make an apology which is a part of the sentence to, to the well. refs, uh, to the refs uh, which I think question. is more reasonable than an apology to World Rugby yes. which he just flat out he wouldn't won't do, do yes. um, um, but he, he might apologise to Nick Berry because in some sense he was wrong or maybe the, the tone of what he did was, was wrong I know it was like it was wrong yeah. for him to post the video it was it was kind of stupid it was petty um, but I will say that like some of what's being said about him in the context of this is a little OTT. It is. I mean, it's like, did character assassin, assassination, denigration, disparagement, and like, this was a, uh, like this was criticism, yes. wasn't it? Like, it was criticism. The yes. video. He was criticizing the decisions. Yes. Like, and and that was one of the charges, and apparently that's illegal. But like, let's not pretend that it was something that was more than that. Like, Razi didn't say in the video, "Nick Berry's an awful man, yeah. and I hate him, and I I hate his guts, and I think he's a cheat." Yeah. Yeah. Like he said, he got all these decisions wrong against the Springboks. That's yes. that's what he said. Yeah. Let's be clear about that. Now, I don't know if he was insinuating something more than that. You'd have to ask him. But I don't, I honestly don't think that you can extrapolate well, from just that that he thinks that that Nick and Ted, that Nick Berry was cheating or was being like. No. Uh, I, I certainly don't think that. Like I think I think he was like they they acknowledged he was right in whatever twenty three of his twenty six complaints that you listen Nick Berry didn't do a great job in that game no, he and. Didn't. and Okay, like chalked off a couple of buck tries that shouldn't have been chalked off and was pretty harsh to them in the breakdown area and as you kind of rightly point out had that Aussie mentality yeah. where he was just trying to let the game flow and didn't like the way the box were approaching it and then hence consciously or unconsciously started siding against them Yes, but it wasn't like I don't think that the video necessarily called his character into question it just criticised his performance and I think like the conflation of like abuse and criticism in yeah. the context of referees is a little much for me. Yeah, and offence was the other word yeah, that yeah. chuck in there, which yeah. as Stephen Fry would say, like it's nothing more than a whine. Offence. <laughs> it doesn't give you any rights if you're offended. Yeah. Like it doesn't matter. Um so yeah, no, there's definitely there's a lot of a lot of stuff to unpack with this. Like partly I'm on Razi's side because oh, like, but I certainly I, understand I, his frustration. I, I understand his frustration. Yeah. He's not wrong in that <clears throat> the box tend not to get a fair shake from the refs but I draw the distinction as I was saying earlier that I think it is a stylistic one I think a lot of refs just prefer open teams and will tacitly side with them over the course of an 80 minutes regardless it's not a premeditated stuff it's just what they're seeing unfold they'll reward some behaviours more than others that's something that the box know with the way that they play they face and they have done for years and that is just a fact but uh like the other factor here is the, the just the criticism of refs thing because there's definitely an imbalance and I'm torn in the sense that like yes referee's word is final this is sacrosanct this is something that you teach the under 10s respect the referee call him sir uh, if mm. the whistle goes you play the whistle don't get in the ref's face or whatever play whatever yeah, on the pitch on the pitch yeah. that is all fair and all fine but the idea that they're above scrutiny or that they're above mm. kind of criticism or that they are infallible which is like bringing bring disrepute and all this like they didn't mention the fact that he was right in like 23 out of, or 22 yeah. out of 23 of the counts like they were yes they were incorrect decisions that were made on the thing that ended up being against them like why is there no recourse for poor refereeing use mm. like the last time I can remember honestly remember someone in a referee feeling con like suffering consequences was Chris White uh, doing a, an absolute howler in a game Wales were, were losing to Italy where they had like I think they were four points down mm. with, with, no, with time left on the clock but they asked is there time if I kick it out is there time for a line out this was before the, uh, the change in the laws that said you could take a line out anyway it was like is there time yes there's time kicks it out blows the final whistle and yeah. it's just like ha there wasn't time after all and it's just like okay well you're not refing any more top games anymore because you're not allowed to do that in a Six Nations game yeah. and like that was that was good that was many years ago over a decade ago now and like we only watched a few weeks ago Roman Poit retire by his own volition I can't understand how he kept getting top level games and he he kept 
being poor in many of them the, the great Springboks All Blacks game rugby championship destroyed mm. by an erroneous red card decision and yet no recourse mm. for poor refereeing and I can understand Razzie's frustration because like we watch games there's all kinds of complaints about the refs through ELVs and through changes in the laws through also through COVID as well we've seen the bad habits of specific referees reveal themselves you've seen like yeah an Aussie domestic game that will ignore a forward pass just because the try was so pretty they just won't call it whereas you'll see a pro 14 game or a pro 12 game where it's like everything's crossing all of a sudden no no Aussie would ever give crossing but everything's crossing up here and and then you see a French ref reward a dominant scrum you'll see a Kiwi ref say use it even though a Georgian pack is monstering a scrum and it's like look at the front row look at the front row no no I see the ball at the back use it pick it up and it's like you just see all of these different habits that are disparate and you don't have a collection you don't have a universality to the laws and to how they're officiated so where is the the recourse for coaches and for fans who are frustrated by it mm-hmm. as well and confused by it as well why is there just this shroud of mystery around the refs yeah, and, and, and like from from to, to 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 that end i think what razi will say is that like it was it like if he was being honest which he hasn't been no. to be real in this he he released that video out of frustration because he, after that game where he felt his team were were very Shafted. harshly treated mm. he wasn't able to get through to nick berry and they didn't weren't able to get the review until i think monday evening and yeah. he wanted to do it on sunday because he had his team meeting on sunday and it was going to inform some of what he was doing yeah. for the second and test. they select the um, team very early and all of that yeah, yeah, yeah. so for, for, for that reason he was frustrated and then he just I think I think he's been frustrated with refs for a long time and this yeah. was kind of a, what he what he would say I think would be that this was kind of a breaking point for him <clears throat> listen I don't think it was right what he did I don't think it was right to post that video I think he was probably way too harsh I also think like you can talk about 23 of the 26 being some yeah, so a lot, of, a lot of them are more dubious there was about that. two yeah. really that were major errors yes. there was the two tries that I think were chopped yeah, but off he's, ta- he's talking about a few that are like yeah, oh yeah side, side entry, entry here, and... here on phase 6 of that set yeah, and it's like that's I mean, the kind of stuff that gets let go why, all the time yeah, why don't we look yeah. at the tackle height from the box on yeah. every tackle from that game and see if we can come up with a couple of cards I bet we could Yeah. Um. so I I mean you have to be you have to be a little understanding in that context but i do i do take your point i think the refereeing in the game there there's a stifling of discussion around it and it probably does need to be addressed i don't know what the answer is no but i don't think that it's it's like it's it's unmistakably a really really tough game to referee these Definitely. days and there's a lot that that is put on the one ref in the, the man in the middle with the whistle true and um, he has his aors and he has his tmo but it's quite a scant refereeing team when you consider the um the, the complexities of the laws and then yeah. there's also the balance of, of what do you want how do you want the game to be refereed do you want everything to be stingily and accurately assessed and got and do you want it to play out like NFL where there's flags thrown on the field and then refs have huddle up and then come yeah. up come up with a decision or do we have too much of that TMO stuff already I'm sure if you asked a Kiwi yeah, they'd come will. up with your answer no we don't need more stoppages yeah. so there's there's all of that context to add to it but what I will say is like this is what this is what uh, kind of threw me as well it's just like when he says when like I, I sympathize with Nick Berry in this I do like I don't think there was anything malicious in what he did nope. I think people who call him a cheat are totally divorced yeah, from reality way off base um, with that yeah, uh, yeah. To- like no just, he's, he's guilty um, of being an Australian he's, yeah, he's, <laughs> and he's, as such the game took an Australian yeah. ref and, shape and, um, and a levelling abuse at the guy is yeah. just disgusting yeah. but I do, I do think there has to be room for criticism as there is for players and as there is for teams yeah. so there needs to be for referees at least in some context and he says at, at, at the opening of his statement as a match official I understand that our performance will be heavily scrutinised and yet one of the things that Razzie was charged and convicted for um, was, was criticising, was criticising a, ref. a referee like you can't do that if you're involved in rugby in any way and you criticise a referee you're, you're instantly a plague upon your house and actually one of the uh, side notes to this was that Sia Khaleesi picked up a fine yeah, for saying that he felt is. disrespected by the referee Terrible. which is just like his honest assessment of how he felt I think you're, you you have to be allowed to say that yeah the like, captain is allowed to say yeah, that yeah. captain's allowed to talk to the referee <laughs> um, and if he feels disrespected like that, as you were saying as well will uh Will the Georgian get fined for it? Well, Sharikadze. Sharikadze. Yeah, like he said, he said, said exactly the same thing. The same yeah. thing. Uh, like, I didn't feel respected by the referee. Is he going to get a fine? Or is it just for Sia? Just for, d- yeah, like... I don't know. Maybe he might. I mean, the precedent's there now, so it's I don't true. know. But um, I'm not sure. I'm kind, I'm between minds in it. Razi was wrong, but I don't think... That, world world, could, that I don't think the world, world rugby, would be right no. at all. And I think yeah. they're pretty far removed from right. I and think, I think the punishment's a bit too harsh as well. I, I certainly, like, this is going to have a major impact on the Springboks. Yes. Razzie being gone for a year. Yes, I, I will. I wonder how involved he can well, they be. Have, they, have, sure. they, have, they do have a week to appeal. 
and they they're probably, not going to get anything no, from that appeal. No, but they probably will appeal, and it'll pro- prolong this storyline for a yeah, bit longer. But, but they're not um, going to. There's, there's no way not. the world rugby will relent to them on appeal. No, no probably way. not. Yeah. yeah, no, it's it's a weird standoff that's going on, and I don't necessarily love the status quo with where world rugby's at right now. Obviously, there's all kinds of calls about like, oh, Beaumont out there, it should have been P show, blah 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 blah. And like, maybe that's true, but like, there definitely needs to be a sea change in terms of just how the game is officiated from top down and just world rugby's outlook as well there's too much of it feels like you look at it on 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 the surface and it feels punitive and actually i suppose it's a, a decent pivot point into the nominees the world rugby nominees for player of the year which is another bone that the springboks have to pick <laughs> in a year that they are world champions they can turn out and win the lions tour can be very yeah, impressive yeah. can do beat the all blacks one of the only two teams to do it this year uh, yeah, no nominees. And yet the two Aussies who managed to beat those bastards. Fun, yes! World Rugby, yes! Karevi, yes! You are nominated for Player of the Year. You destroyed the box and we love you for it. And it does feel like that. If you're a Springbok ah, yeah. fan, well, I know. If you're, if you're, um, you're conspiratorially minded. I don't yeah. know if that's that's the reason it's for it. I think it's funny. It is. I do think it's funny that there's two Aussies nominated when their main achievement of the year was beating those box. Yes. Especially Karevi, because that was his season highlight. What a, yeah. what a show he put on. True. But the four nominees for Men's Player of the Year were announced as you rightly point out Antoine Dupont Michael Hooper Maro Toji and Samu Karevi listen first point report call four very very fine players yes Antoine Dupont had a great season with France their best player won the double with Toulouse that's yeah, very yeah. fine player Michael Hooper exceptional all year yeah. delighted to see him that's, nominated hope for, he wins for me that's, that's um, your winner right there yeah the teleporting man um, <laughs> yeah indeed just everywhere for yeah. Australia so much work uh, yeah, just special player underrated has never won it deserves to win one yeah, I would agree um, with that. coming to the tail end of his career might be his last chance to win one and yeah. I think 100% should be your winner Samu Karevi who obviously just exploded as a, you talk about a tour de force just comes into that Aussie team and makes it work yes. instantly yes. and exceptional the and Karevi factor yeah, it's, a, it's a good factor truly yeah. awesome an awesome component to that five game win streak they went on and a yeah, special player um, and Maro Toji who as we know exceptional operator yeah, himself yeah. lit it up in the championship this year <laughs> um, absolutely class well, in tier two yeah. rugby. Um, <laughs> I mean he did yeah. lose the Lions tour but fair play to him he was good in that test that, that we were talking about <laughs> um, the first yeah. test yeah, yeah first yeah. test of the Lions tour he had a very good game ultimately he was kind of matched. he's probably lucky to get nominated like he's going to be nominated most years because his bar is so high it's true he's such an awesome player it's, he's, it's but, a little scooby dubious well yeah there's there, to me there's four players they came fifth in the Six Nations yeah, and they rocked the championship <laughs> Well, so I, don't, hard. I, don't, I don't know what the voting process is but I mean I, I still think he, he still performs to a high level he really does yeah, yeah. but there's four players to me who are really unlucky not to be nominated all from the big two as you need to say um, Ardi Savea well actually there's five to be honest but Ardi Savea mm-hmm. Eben Etzebeth Lucanio Am Sia Khaleesi yeah. um, you know my player of the year is Am it yes always always is, every year just, he yeah. gives awesome again he's taken it to another level keeps defensively imperious um, and then um, Will Jordan as well yeah. and they did the cop out with Will Jordan as they Break, sometimes do breakthrough, breakthrough player, player of the year which is kind of fine I guess but yeah. um, he could easily be nominated for player of the year which yeah. the try scoring stocks have been this insane is true um, but uh, there was another another point on that because there are other categories as well like you're saying breakthrough player of the year there is coach of the year um, is the one where you can get your conspiracy hat on against world rugby it's as not well. conspiracy I no, just think not. they make a mistake with this they, they don't do. the, the mistake that they make is that they don't factor in the tier 2 sides they for me because all, yeah. like they've nominated Rennie and Foster who both did good jobs don't get me wrong they built nicely with their yeah, teams where's the Portugal coach uh, this year yeah, like, that's, he's done great stuff yeah. with that thing where's the, where's the Chile coach he's been yeah. brilliant they look really well coached like yeah. getting, getting the side to like take if you, it on if you look yeah. at these world rugby nominees despite them occasionally paying lip service to like growing the game or getting in a bigger bigger world cup or getting more tier two sides competitive or getting more matchups with tier two tier one sides despite all of that when it comes down to these kinds of kind of nominations which are just ceremonial like you'd be looking at they, they, they do matter, matter as well yeah. but it's like it's also like do, are you even watching do you know that there are games going on uh, like between these teams it's it's yeah, yeah sometimes it, it feels it, that it, way it definitely the coaching nominees are lacking for a nom- uh, imagination yeah. uh, that, that much is for sure there was also the, the men's sevens uh, nominees um, the set the sevens ones but uh, we have Balaka from Fiji Scott Curry from New Zealand Moneta who was awesome for the uh, Argentinians um, but then your winner surely is Wainakolo of Fiji awesome it's all about the uh, the Olympics really and yeah. he was awesome in that um, we had the uh, women's sevens nominees as well Siofani from France Hirini from New Zealand and uh, uh, 
Ulu, oh, sorry, Ulu Nisao from Fiji and uh, Nakosi from Fiji, and Nakosi was the special player yeah, who was enough. running the show yeah. and owned that uh, that tournament as well. So I would definitely be erring on the side of her. Although I will say, where's where the hell is Jazz where's Joyce? Jazz Joyce? Where the hell, what's yeah. going on? Wales is <laughs> where's awesome Jazz Joyce? Who was GB's best player? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Where's yeah. Jazz Joyce? At? Like that's that's a that's mistake. Dubious. Um, right. yeah, yeah. Women's fifteens. We've got uh, Bougeard and Sanzus from France, and Poppy Cleal and Zoe Aldcroft from England. Um, all four class players take your pick probably yeah. Zoe Aldcroft but I mean take your pick <laughs> really um, and then uh, the try of the year we had Lucanio Am on the Lions tour Colby's footwork yeah, to put Am in good the one South African nominee yes. um, we had P- Pierre-Louis Barassi which is totally your winner uh, in the July series against yeah. Oz the one that started with Kuyu to Teddy Thomas yeah, to the chip and chase to the regather yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely fabulous there's no mm. beating that mm. Luke Jacobson you referenced that try earlier Bowden yeah. Barrett out yeah, the, back the back against sexy, the Pumas sexy play um, yeah, yeah. and Damien Penault in the Six Nations as well um, wrapping that up, wrapping that one up. But for me, it's all about uh, Jean uh, Pierre Louis Barassi's yeah, um, that, that sexy, sexy Wales try. France uh, tour that produced that try. Oh, Aussie France, yeah, yeah. Aussie France. Even, yeah. Sorry, that uh, yeah, definitely. If, if it was like it was billed as just such a great offensive th- series, it produced a moment of magic in that try. I think that should be your winner for sure. Attacking rugby, let's yeah. go. Oh, and here's one more note just before we move on from the um, from the uh, um, uh, world rugby situation. Justice for props. Here's the here's the <laughs> list of nominees by position since this award was invented from in, from two thousand and one to two thousand and twenty one. Zero. Well, let's start here with the most. So we had twenty four flankers nominated. We've had eighteen fly halves nominated. We've had thirteen centers, ten scrum halves, ten number eights, nine wings, ten, locks, uh, ten well. locks, nine wings, six fullbacks, five hookers, and zero zero props. Where's Tanya Latupo? Where well, Tanya Latupo had some season. Oh, for all of the Aussie nominees, uh, Tupo couldn't get in. But granted, yeah. Karevi was awesome too. I mean, there's, there's, there really isn't room on these nominees. Where's Ty everybody. Furlong? Ty Furlong is awesome. I mean, yeah. yeah. I, how did he not get nominated in like 2018? That's a question. But I suppose Sexton won, so we can't complain. Yeah, but it's um, another out. I like, you know it's yeah. true. They're, they're, it's the same with Man of the Match awards. They'll put in a great 60 minutes, but then they'll be hauled off in yeah. 60 minutes. And people props like, matter, guys. Props try and win scrummage games. without them. Well, it's become a trend that tight head props are the biggest the most expensive player if you're talking yeah, about France not, there not one nominee yeah, no, not indeed. one nominee and yet they, in 20 like, the years. big French clubs and the big English clubs will shell out the big bucks for a very robust tight head because yeah, yeah. they know that it's vital to your chances of winning rugby games sure ask the Springboks about it they may not like, they may to wear never got a player of the year nomination no. not even nominated no oh. yeah what's that about Keen Healy too yeah, for Keen Healy yeah, for me. Yeah, uh, I would always have him up there. Yeah, but sure, listen and sure, look. We're going to yeah. move on from that. Uh, we've a couple of other bits to touch on. Um, just a, a good, a good looking report coming out of South Africa. Um, not not confirmed just yet, but it seems that uh, George's Black Lions, their Rugby Europe Super Cup team, are going to participate in the Curry Cup uh, as the, the, the second lower, division. Lower division. Yeah, um, cool. yeah and much like the Jaguars have before. It's a good little yeah, in for them. And, yeah. and the same report was actually also suggesting that there might be a, co- a collaboration between. The Curry Cup second division and Slar. Excellent. Yeah, Isn't that yeah. a cool idea? It is. So you yeah, want yeah. to get a Georgian team in with the Slar teams, in with those second tier division South African teams, and make a barnstorming that competition. That could be a good little comp. You know, yeah, I love, yeah, love yeah. a bit of that. Um, um, that's exactly exactly right there. Yeah, South Africa have been very open to kind of supporting all kinds of rugby like that, down to the things like the Stellenbosch series we were talking about. Yeah. Like they're a great force in, in world rugby if world rugby could only ever realise it <laughs> <laughs> you're getting very offended on behalf of the I am box. I need to do it yeah. Um, yeah. then um, we've got um, uh, uh, big news as well um, coming out of Italy that apparently they're scheduled to next July go on an away trip to Georgia and Romania excellent way past due Ooh, I love it yeah, that's yeah. definitely fun that is that's fun definitely that's one fun. we will get fun our teeth into and all preview. involved yeah. that's going to be great really looking forward to that one um, and a side story but I think a, f- a good one um, that uh, Japanese there's a Japanese ref uh, Takahito Namakawa is getting an opportunity to ref uh, in the Pro 2 uh, this weekend and what's interesting is that this guy Namakawa is currently playing for Toyota Verblitz he's a, he's a he's Japanese a, player and has been refereeing alongside playing and is now uh, taking the step up to the Pro 2 excellent uh, isn't yeah, that yeah. cool fair play to him yeah, you know, we need a few more Japanese refs as well yeah. about in the top level of the game and yeah good luck to him in both capacities because yeah. Toyota Verblitz are serious contenders as well they're a proper yeah. team so yeah fair play to him that is a cool story um, the other yeah a bit of things we were mentioning it earlier but uh, Fiji winger Aroni Sao has received
received a five week ban for his red card in Cardiff. Um, yeah, you can't can't go hitting people in the head when you've already tackled them. What are you doing? A yeah, bit of bit of mad erroneous bad erroneous so. It was good erroneous so, and then very bad erroneous so <laughs> in very quick succession. <laughs> no. And yeah, five weeks is probably probably about right for that kind of challenge. No question. Um, um, big news as well coming out of the Premiership as out half roulette continues. Yeah, indeed, Sale Sharks are going to replace their missing Aj McGinty, who's off to Bristol with George Ford of the Leicester Tigers. They poached him. Yeah, Tigers so, are a bit salty yeah, about it. And, I'd uh, say so. So does Sheedy, that mean Sheedy, Sheedy off to Leicester? I guess they lose the trade. No, I don't know. Uh, or Leicester look elsewhere for a ten. But uh, yeah, that's definitely an interesting one. Uh, leaving one of their starting tens and star players, of the Premiership leaving one of their uh, one of their top teams to go play for a rival. That's also a good team. That is true. They're also top of the Premiership as it stands, and Sale are struggling currently. So it's not it's not necessarily a step up at the minute. For, I'm for sure it's a step Ford. up financially for him though. Um, yeah, no, this is what normally what's uh, what's defining about it he'll rejoin yeah. the likes of uh, Manu anyway so he'll have some good units around him to try and direct but it is an yeah. interesting development um, we have to bring it down unfortunately because there was absolutely awful news yeah. uh, coming out of South Africa just that um, uh, Springbok tighthead Yanni Duplessis um, his uh, one year old son uh, drowned uh, the other day on, on his on Yanni's birthday itself actually just an yeah. unbelievably horribly horrible story yeah terrible accident and uh, yeah we just wanted to give Yanni the shout out he was always a favourite of, of ours and, and usually a very you know a, a, an easy guy to get on board with on the pitch and it just uh, yeah terrible it's nobody deserves awful. to experience no, such a indeed, terrible thing know, it was, so it was um, pretty heartbreaking to read uh, yeah, no, our, our thoughts, thoughts are with him absolutely yeah. with the Duplessis family and uh, hopefully they can kind of just get on you know, no, like know. there's no, there's no, there's no solace in that it's, it's just an awful it's thing just, and listen hopefully just wishing him all the best that's, that's all it. I can that's say, all I can um, say yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and uh, just to end on a, on a slightly more positive uh, note um, the wheelchair um, <coughs> the um, sorry what was I was going to say the Great Britain wheelchair rugby team uh, who claimed a gold medal in, in the Tokyo Olympics this summer they were awarded the hosting rights for the 2023 World Wheelchair Rugby Union Championship Division A tournament and that's going to be held at the Principality Stadium in Cardiff, which yeah, is pretty cool. That is pretty cool. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, wheelchair rugby, that's a tough sport. Oh, yeah. Geez, those, guys, those people are tough. The yeah. Paralympians, like, seriously oh, tough. Man. And um, to be able to do all of that with it, yeah, no, it's it's a, it's a proper tough sport. That's just, you got to be great, great. Team GB, very good in that. But, uh, yeah, good opportunity to get uh, get that into a big stadium. Like, Principality Stadium, great stuff for that. It's right in the centre of Cardiff as well, that, that stadium. So it's kind of good in terms of the Enverons are around. You can host a big tournament like that. I and mean, it makes perfect sense you're in a city and I hope that goes well yeah for sure good yeah. little spectacle for growing other aspects of our great game yeah, absolutely um, but listen the marathon has come to an end uh, we're going to wrap it up there um, thanks a million to all, the, all you guys for tuning in we have one more show uh, to wrap up the season um, and yeah. we're going to uh, take a look back on all of the November internationals next week take a look at everybody's seasons put a neat little bow on everything yeah. before the game goes the test game at least goes on ice through until the Six Nations and then we're actually going to take a break after that as well now that the November series is over we'll probably be back with a couple of other videos maybe a couple of different videos yeah. maybe some collaborations or something like that over the Christmas um, but we're not going to be doing the weekly shows from, from then we're going to be taking a little break and then we'll be back in time for the Six Nations and all the test rugby to come and that great Euro rugby Europe competition which I'm almost looking forward to as much as the, yeah, the Six Nations um, but we'll be back for one more show before then next week um, so remember uh, if you do want to catch that please subscribe to the channel be sure to like the videos um, leave comments down below we do love hearing you engage with that with anything that we're saying and if you have different opinions on some of the stuff we've said if some of the contentious stuff uh, that we've said you disagree with um, I point to you yes uh, but um, uh, yeah, by all means leave it down below in the comments and um, yeah be sure to share the video as well with all your rugby loving friends and who have four and a half hours to spare however long yeah, we've yeah. been at this yeah you um, may want to as well <laughs> ring that bell because as you said the uploads are going to become a little less frequent from next week we're going to do one show next week and then take a bit of a break but we will be dropping in with, with other kind of things so if you do ring that bell you'll be notified of whenever we drop a new video which which will there will be some in the interim but for the main part it'll be one more week of roundup and then I'm looking forward to the Six Nations already it rolls around very very quickly it does but, it sure uh, does in the meantime we're going to sign off on this one and say see you later later guys bye bye all right Let me get this one right
Yeah. That's it. Pings it. Success. All you have to do is dial it in. Yeah, exactly right. 